Go ahead. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today is Monday, February 22nd, 2021. Commissioner's Court is meeting in regular open session. Commissioner Olguin, would you like to introduce our student this morning? Yes, thank you. Um, so this morning we have Natalia Orozco with us, who is a ninth grade student at Tornillo High School, and she will be leading us in the pledge. Natalia, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome, Natalia. Thank you. Hi, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now for the Texas Pledge. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Natalia, and you have a, a great day. Thank you for Thank being you. with us. Thank, Thank you, Natalia. You. We will now receive an invocation from Father Miguel Briceño from the Isleta Mission. Good morning. Good morning. So we begin. Good and gracious God, we praise you and we thank you for all the many blessings you give us, especially this day in which you give us to truly continue to do your work here on earth. We ask that you fill the commissioners with your gift of wisdom and understanding as they make decisions to truly meet the needs of the people they serve. And at the conclusion, I would like to also end with this prayer written by St. Francis, a prayer that he also gave to the entire order. Almighty eternal, just, and merciful God. Give us miserable ones the grace to do for you alone what we know you want us to do, and always to desire what pleases you. Inwardly, inwardly cleansed, interiorly enlightened, and inflamed by the fire of the Holy Spirit, may we be able to follow in the footsteps of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And by your grace alone, may we make our way to you, most high, who live and rule, in perfect trinity and simple unity, in our glorified God Almighty, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. What a pleasure to have you You're here welcome. on Monday morning to start off our commissioner's meeting. Thank you so much. Thank You're you, welcome. Father. Many blessings on each and every one of you. Thank you. All right, Judge. Yes, sir. Go ahead, to Commissioner Robinson. Before we get started, uh, can uh, we'd like to uh, take a moment of silence for, in, in conjunction with uh, the, what's happening on the national level, the, all the personnel that and family members who are uh, deceased as, as a result of the uh, virus that we got going around, that we take a moment of silence in, in, in their honor. Absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson. Thank you. And of course, our extended uh, prayers and well wishes to all these uh, individuals fighting the weather and people that have died because of the weather and, you know, the lack of uh, energy in and, and their part of the world. And so uh, I know there's going through some very difficult times as we've, uh, I've spoken to the county judges in those areas and it is quite a, a dire situation. So uh, our very heartfelt uh, prayers and thoughts go out to them. Thank you. Caesar, go ahead. Thank you, sir. This morning, we're joined by ASL interpreters Selena Salum and Leslie Joseph. Item number four is the consent agenda, composed of items 4A through 4W. Are there any items that members of the court or the public would like to pull for individual discussion? Yes. Commissioners? Commissioner? Uh, like yes, uh, Commissioner Olguin, go ahead. Yes, Judge. I would like to pull item E and item F, please. E and F is in Frank. Yes. Are there any other? Thank you, Judge. I've got one. 
Uh, yes, sir, Commissioner Leon. I need. Uh, I would like to pull item G, as in George. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Move to approve the rest of them. Second. Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Leon. Aye. Commissioner Stout. Aye. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Betsy, you want to go ahead and uh, sort of rearrange? We, we talked a little, uh, getting uh, the arms presentation first. Uh, they were waiting uh, quite a, a long time uh, last uh, Thursday, and then uh, we were not able to address it. So if, if we could uh, tell us how you'd like to move forward. Um, whatever is the pleasure of the court, we have four resolutions. We have the arms presentation. And then we have, um, if you would be willing to do the, co the COVID update after those items, whether you'd like to do the arms presentation first, we have them available, or the resolutions. I'd like to do a real, I know it shouldn't take that long, according to Richard, what he had commented, uh, to take the arms, if, uh, if that pleases the court, is that uh, okay if we go that route? And then uh, we'll move into resolutions and sure. then the COVID item, so. I don't know, Judge. I don't know if we. I don't know if we've. Uh, we, we we made them wait long enough last week. Oh. I don't know. Oh, we should make, maybe we should make Richard wait a little bit longer. I don't know. What, what, what do you think, and, Richard? And I, you I want to weigh in on that one? for you, David. <laughs> okay. okay, Caesar. We'll we'll, we'll uh, oblige them. <laughs> yes, Go sir. ahead, uh, Caesar. I, read the uh, item. Item. Item number seven A presentations. Receive a presentation from the Alliance for Regional Military Support regarding its efforts to promote growth in the regional defense and aerospace industries. Thank you, Caesar. Thank you, Judge. Good morning, Judge, Commissioners. Uh, good morning, Betsy. I uh, hope all is well with you this morning. And I hope you had a nice birthday Thursday that you were able to recover from the uh, lengthy meeting, David. Um, without further ado, and for the record, I'm Richard Dayub, and I serve on the Executive Committee for the Alliance for Regional Military Support as its treasurer. And joining us this morning, they can wave their hands or speak uh, in no particular order, but we'll begin with our Chairman, Gus Rodriguez. Gus is not only the Chairman of our Executive Committee, but he also serves in a dual role, a demanding role, as the civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army here for our region, which is a critical role. And Tom Thomas, who uh, served for a number of years, 17 or 18 years, as the, uh, as the civilian aide, is now serving as the, we have a, uh, is serving as the Casa Emeritus. Uh, hold on one second. Are you all, are you all echoes or just Mr. 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 Thomas, I'm going to have to leave you muted until it's time for you to speak. I think there's some feedback on your feed. Thank you. Then we have John Bailey. John is vice chairman of the organization. Hey, John. Uh, and then and Lance Lear. Lance Lear serves as our secretary and our significant organizer of all of our documents. <laughs> uh, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and begin, but I would like to indicate that I may go through a few of these slides in a little more detail for the benefit of Representative Olguin, Commissioner Olguin, uh, since she is new to the court, and then we'll go ahead and proceed from there. Uh, next slide, please. So our mission, just to remind everyone, is to ensure that Fort Bliss White Sands Missile Range and Holloman Air Force Base, known as the Triad, remain as an integral part of America's national defense strategies. I apologize for the bird in the background. I can't silence him without going on mute. So I apologize for that. Um, uh, our mission and our vision to maintain the relevance and enhance the military value of our region and our joint mil regional military complex, support our defense workforce and sustain and strengthen our nation's defense technical 
an industrial base. And our strategies behind all that are to develop actionable initiatives to address goals and collaborate locally, regionally, and nationally to achieve those results. And if you'll go to the next slide, I believe our chairman, Gus Rodriguez, will take that first slide. Yes, uh, these are our uh, good morning members of the court, county judge. Thank you for having us and uh, thank you for your service to the people of El Paso County. Uh, these are the five areas of focus that our group is concentrating on. Each of us will give some detail as to some of the efforts that we've been doing since the last time we had the opportunity to brief you. So uh, next slide. In the area of assisting and coordinating with local economic development organizations to grow current and attract new defense and aerospace industries, we've been working with the county and with Horizon City to develop the Fabens at Airport. Uh, working very closely with Mr. Landeros and the effort uh, as re in regards to the FAST program on trying to do some things. There are some things in the work that we will be coming back and informing the court uh, in regards to that. It's some good effort, but for now, uh, we want to go ahead and just um, uh, keep, it, keep it to this brief. We've been working with the Army Test and Evaluation Command, ATEC, and White Sands Leadership to coordinate the FAA and regional states to allow ease of the air quarters for testing long-range missile and indirect fires. Um, and we're working lines of effort to secure new industry by meeting with four separate defense industry companies to show our ability to provide defense related growth. And, uh, and then we're also working on funding for upgrade to the Holloman high speed, uh, test track to keep the most, uh, precisely aligned and instrumental facility of its kind in the world capable, uh, capable for the future years. The reason we focus on, on, on the regional approach to the military is that they all work together as one unit in terms of testing and training our service members within the Department of Defense. So if something were to happen to Fort Bliss or White Sands or to Holloman, it would gravely impact the other installations. So we work very closely with all installations on this effort. Gus, you went to mute. Are we going to the second slide? Uh, yes, sir, that's you. Okay, thank you. So leveraging higher education partnerships to attract R&D projects, which is a critically important program. And I, I emphasize this because we, as a region, and this is one of the reasons ARMS was formed in the first place, which is to, to shore up the lack of opportunities for our graduates at our universities in the region, uh, New Mexico State, uh, UTEP, of course, uh, Western Tech, the community college, um, Doña Ana Community College, uh, Western New Mexico, as just some examples, those, those jobs that are not created here are ending up sending those bright young talent as they graduate on to other opportunities in other parts of the nation, other parts of the state. <clears throat> so we're losing out on those opportunities. So we're working very closely, particularly with UTEP and New Mexico State, uh, so that we can help develop curricula to assist with the opportunities that particularly exist within White Sands Missile Range and the test and evaluation programs that they're doing. It's estimated by uh, White Sands, as just one example, that if tomorrow everyone who is eligible for retirement at at White Sands were to choose to do so, they'd be something like 50% of their existing talent pool that would go away. And we're not having enough um, effort in order to backfill those positions to make sure that we have that talent for the years to come and to continue to grow those missions. So we're working with, with all of those universities uh, and uh, community colleges in that direction. Uh, next slide. I think that's you, Lance. Good morning, <clears throat> judge and commissioners. This focus area is very important to the continued economic and education domains in our region with the mission of attracting a military skilled workforce. We gain uh, not only the skills and specialties inherent to service members, um, we gain leadership skills and all those soft skills that are part of military uh, life. 
uh, that, uh, that those who have not served simply don't have. Uh, ARMS continues to work towards keeping more and more transitioning service members in the region. I won't read the slide, but you can be assured uh, we have a good understanding of what our veterans and transitioning soldiers need and will continue uh, to work towards this end state. We were glad to assist uh, with writing the FAVENS EDA grant and have been working to gather partners to assist in this effort. We're working with Soldier for Life and for large business partners to make this long-term project very successful. ARMS will, does and will continue partnering across the spectrum to make El Paso County better. And in the absence of any questions, we can go to the next slide. Good morning, Judge and County Commissioners. Uh, one of the things we're really focused on is improving our regional appeal for uh, future stationing. We want to make sure that we're on the top of mind at DOD for any type of thing they have coming out. So we're working very closely with uh, uh, three Corps Commander and First Armored Division to, to make sure that our activities are focused in the right way, that they, they want to make sure things are growing. One of the big things we're working on is the MFGI mission, which is the uh, Mobilization Force Generation Installation. There are two right now in the uh, U.S. Army. It's Fort Hood and Fort Bliss. Fort Bliss is the largest. So we're making sure that we're working very closely with Division West and the Army National Guard Reserve to upgrade any of our barracks or other issues we have. This is a big one we need to focus on, um, and, and we're doing a lot of work with it. We get probably 30,000 troops that come through Fort Bliss on an annualized basis that are sent downrange. And Fort Bliss is the last place they see before they go downrange. So it's a big one that we're focused on. We continue to meet with uh, DOD leadership on manning and how we can increase troop strength um, in missions. Again, we want to keep Fort Bliss and the region as a, a top, of, uh, top of mind. So we've got opportunities at uh, White Sands, Holloman, and Fort Bliss. One of the big things, too, we're continuing to uh, advocate for military construction and uh, sustainable readiness funding, SRM money. We need to do things to take care of uh, updates at Donna Anna, McGregor Range, some of the things on Fort Bliss, uh, what's considered old Fort Bliss, need to be, be taken care of. So we're working very closely with uh, Congress to try to make sure we have Fort Bliss and the region taken care of in Milcon. And then we're also taking uh, advantage of the regional appeal of Holloman Air Force Base. We're working with uh, the folks in Holloman and the Pentagon to uh, do a permanent location for their F-16 and make sure that they have the formalized training here and, and they've got the range to do it. And then we continue to speak with regional military leaders to advocate for new military missions here in the region. We want to make sure we're utilizing our land and our area for the best that we can with uh, the military. So pending any questions, next slide. So identify and influence infrastructure needs in the region. So we have been meeting uh, regularly with senior leaders within the Department of Defense to discuss the needs of the regional military complex. In particular, we've had various meetings with the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Installations, Energy and Environment. We understand that given the new administration, that's gonna be a main focus and uh, the needs of Fort Bliss fit perfect into the administration's desired uh, improvement for that type of uh, environment and energy infrastructure. Uh, we've been working closely with leaders within the Congress on both the, the House and the Senate side to assure continued uh, funding for military construction and, uh, as John mentioned, the SRM funding. And uh, we're working closely with, the, in, with the representatives from the Defense Health Agency in regards to the changing uh, the changes that we'll be taking in military medicine and its impact on our regional um, medical services outside the gates of Fort Bliss. Um, for the Fort Bliss uh, rail spur is the number one priority for Fort Bliss. And again, we continue to advocate for that. There's an important need for that. And we continue to support the efforts of Joint Task Force North uh, to ensure that service members that are coming into the area have the necessary um, building that they need to, to be able to uh, perform their duties along the border. And we also are working closely with the Non-Commissioned Officers Leadership Center of Excellence uh, for their uh, rebuild. And we know that in, that organization we know. Uh, to 
be known as USASA. I apologize for the dogs. Okay, following that, uh, just to go to the next slide, this will take uh, just a second or two, but I think it's important to note who our public partners are. And by the way, my compliments to the court because the county was the very first to make a commitment uh, to arms, recognizing the importance of the work that we're doing uh, for our future. And I personally want to thank Commissioner Robinson for being such a, a strong proponent of this effort. But as you can see on the screen, we now have partnerships in all the communities that represent the triad. We're working with Doniana County right now to present to their commissioners uh, in hopes that they will also sign on board as the city of Las Cruces has done. Next slide, please. And this is notable for a couple of reasons. We have a fairly strong support from the private sector in our community. But if you'll notice, absent from that list are our private sector partners from the cities of Las Cruces and Alamogordo. That's because we wanted to wait until we had the public entities secured in partnership with us so we could then work with those public sector organization leaders, such as Mayor Miyagashima and the uh, county uh, judge for Doniana County and their team to help us encourage private sector partners, but particularly defense uh, industry partners and those two other communities to be a part of our efforts. Next slide, please. So these are some of the, the notable accomplishments that we've achieved uh, during these last few weeks and these few months. And uh, again, we've been working closely with the County Economic Development Department to assist them in the uh, grant effort at the Fabens Airport. We're working very closely with Army Futures Command uh, to engage them with our um, with our local business leaders and for and uh, educational uh, organizations, you know, to take a look at opportunities for the El Paso area. Working also with Army Futures Command to coordinate uh, some efforts between Congresswoman Escobar and Harold uh, and Congressman Gonzalez to be able to support the efforts. Uh, we briefed uh, Senator Cruz and Senator Harold staff and Senator uh, Lujan in reference to uh, the work that, that we're doing. Next slide, please. We can we continue to work with the Army uh, Medical Command and Defense Health Agency. As I mentioned earlier, we are working on uh, we are working very closely with the Medical Center of the Americas to develop a Desert Medicine Center of Excellence to support White Sands. Uh, excuse me, William Bowman Army Medical Center. And we conducted town hall meetings between uh, the commander of uh, White Sands Missile Range and Army Test Command. In addition, uh, we also got a, a briefing to the community by the Deputy Commanding General for Army Futures Command. And recently, we just hosted a briefing uh, by the Fort Bliss Garrison to discuss the economic impact of the missions of Fort Bliss on the region. And we will be hosting, within the next uh, two, three weeks, an, another opportunity with White Sands Missile Range. Next slide, please. So these are some of the things that we're really focused on for the way forward um, as, we, as we continue to move forward the region here, continue to focus on the Fort Bliss modernization, fourth generation installation, the MFGI that we talked about, uh, proactively pursue uh, continuous improvement in the regional military medical. That's a big thing that Gus just talked about with uh, MCA and, and really working with them to develop the Desert Center of um, Excellence. Stay engaged with Futures Command and Army uh, Futures Command or Army's uh, um, folk or Air Force uh, folks with that. We're really advocating too for White Sands missile range capabilities, making sure that people understand what White Sands has. If people come into White Sands, they've got to come through El Paso to do that. So it's good for the whole region along with that. I uh, will continue to advocate for Joint Modernization Command, which is one of the subordinate commands on Fort Bliss, along with 32nd. Air and um, Army Air Missile Defense Command and JTF, headquartered at Bliss. And this is the big one we're really focused on too. We're working with the area school districts to focus curriculum on STEM, um, AI, automation, and data mining. Those are the big things that the Army is going to need and the Air Force coming up in the future. Uh, sustain improvement of the defense workforce by building a pipeline of veterans. Sustain uh, safe, desirable, affordable off-post housing. 
we need to make sure that we continue to have the ability to house our soldiers and their families here in, in El Paso and make sure that the things are taken care of there. Uh, one of the big things, we need to prevent encroachment on any of our training lanes. Right now, one of the things that makes our region so uh, big is, or so good for the uh, Army and the Air Force is that we don't have any encroachment. We don't have any sound issues. Every other military installation deals with encroachment, deals with noise pollution and various things like that. Because of the size, we don't. So we're really working to prevent any type of encroachment. We want to continue to advocate and improve air service at El Paso International Airport. Really need to focus on a El Paso to DC nonstop and various things like that, because this is the, the hub for everything that comes into Holloman, White Sands, or Fort Bliss. Uh, we want to engage and encourage our political leaders to advocate uh, for Fort Bliss, Wismer, and Holloman. Uh, we work white papers, we work uh, various things to make sure when you're talking to our congressional re uh, representatives that we're all on the same page. And we develop talking points for community leaders regarding our military complex. That way we're all in the same process, we know what we're all advocating for, and we have a consistent message. Next slide, please. Any questions? <clears throat> None whatsoever. Not at this time. Uh, just if I could comment, are you guys, uh, Richard, are you done with the presentation so I can comment, or do you need any? Yes, sir. Uh, we're, we've completed the presentation, and we're open to questions, judge, comments. Okay, well, thank you. And I just, just want to say that, uh, you know, I've been, I've had that relationship, uh, a lot of the relationships that I have with, with Fort Bliss and the military and, and been able to travel and go to Washington uh, has been thanks to the relationship I have with each one of you. And so it's been extremely valuable. I also know that there was a concern about the county engaging some time back uh, about the county being more engaged. And I think that we've uh, we've done a lot as you've seen the commissioners and, and everyone uh, really engaging. Uh, we're also called uh, that we're, you know, we need to be a little bit more available when we have uh, some of the top leadership come into the military. And if I don't get to hear who, who that is, it's, it usually comes from your organization. But just want to say that, you know, there's so many, um, so many touch points uh, that, uh, that you bring forth. I mean, one of them, obviously, we're going to have a resolution in a little while about the uh, uh, you know, uh, engineers talking about keeping uh, our young people here, and obviously you're touching tremendously on that. Uh, the regional, I think it's very, I'd like to even tap in either, even further because you guys have reached out to Alamogordo and the, the other side of the, of the mountain kind of thing where we forget uh, that we have touch points that are in different ends, you know, that we're very connected to. If Alamogordo does well, we do well and vice versa. So I think that's a a really important part, the economic development component. Uh, we need all the help we can get, especially in the Favens project and, you know, just with your contacts. And, and so that to me is extremely, um, you know, very valuable. And um, uh, of course, just the, um, the, the engagement of veterans uh, is also close to our heart. If you think about everything the county does to, to be engaged with veterans and, and so, I just want to thank you, Gus, and everybody, Tom, John, everybody else here, Lance, uh, that's in the in the presentation, uh, because it is something very important to us. Uh, you know, our military, uh, it's as much as we would love to, to see it as something that self-sustains and that, you know, it's so big and, and powerful that, you know, we really don't have to pay attention to it. But, oh, my goodness, uh, uh, you know, that is something that we don't even want. I know Commissioner Robinson has always stressed that, uh, we can never do enough to make sure that we have a great relationship with our military, with Fort Bliss and, and all the individuals. So once again, uh, more than anything, to thank you for uh, not only that, because I know you guys, each one of you does other things in the community and are very engaged uh, in, in, in getting our community to be better. So just uh, wanted to make those opening statements that are uh, very appreciative of the relationship, you know, I go to have, I'm in your arms uh, committee as, as Jose is and, and Nicole and uh, very much appreciative of that relationship. So just wanted to, to make that comment and I don't know if there are any other uh, commissioners, any comments or questions that you might have? Yes, sir, Judge. Uh, is Commissioner Stout? 
I think or heard someone. Uh, it sorry. was Commissioner Leon, I believe. That's, that's oh, okay, Commissioner yes. Leon. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Leon. Yes, sir. Uh, great presentation. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. My computer cut out for a little while, but I didn't hear anything about Biggs Field. Uh, was it in the mix also, and I just didn't hear it? We don't specifically, and I'm going to Chris defer that, to, to Lance Gus, as the expert sorry, Gus, on this, go ahead and, I think, but, and Gus, but I will tell you that uh, we didn't mention Bigsfield by name, but Lance, if you'd like to touch on all the work and improvements that have been done out there. Absolutely, uh, mm -hmm. Commissioner, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, we just finished um, uh, a huge resurfacing project at Bigsfield, so um, if, uh, if you were not tracking, uh, for those new to the court, um, this runway is 14,000 feet long and can handle anything. And it's a huge, it is an absolute bonus to have the ability to bring in anything to the region. Uh, and uh, that was something, you know, that, that Fort Bliss needed and was able to get uh, aside uh, from the MILCON and SRM that we consistently push for. So there is a one to end list uh, at Fort Bliss for needs uh, to support uh, both the post and off post, and we'll be happy to share those with you. Uh, Biggs is one is one part of that, Commissioner. Did that answer the question? You know, yes, it did. You know, with the, one of the largest runways in the country, if not the lo uh, the longest. Uh, why, why are we not partnering up with uh, uh, private concerns also that might be able to partner up with uh, El Paso, the feds? Uh, if you look at companies like SpaceX and those new privately owned uh, exploration companies that are so close to El Paso that uh, I think this runway would serve uh, many needs. Uh, Commissioner, you are absolutely correct. There are multiple agencies that already use that, uh, Border Patrol, uh, as well as NASA, and um, we are working uh, through our contacts uh, up north uh, to, uh, to facilitate that. I think everybody's kind of uh, stuck on the spaceport at this point. Uh, however, with that runway being equal to the longest in the country, you're absolutely correct. That is something that uh, we need to work through as we continue to work with the uh, uh, major defense companies uh, and uh, Blue Origin and SpaceX. And, and one thing that you mentioned also, I, I don't want to keep you all here longer than, than I should, uh, the, a direct flight from either New York or, or D.C. And I think some years back, Betsy, we had already uh, either committed or talked about committing as much as a million dollars uh, to that program, but it sort of uh, just uh, fell apart. I don't know where we're at on that, but I know we spoke about it some years back. Betsy, go ahead. Yes, sir. So that was working with Borderplex Alliance. We were working to see if it would be possible to expand the flights in and out of El Paso, the direct flights. Um, they were looking for other partners to help join that. I do not believe they were able to do that, but let me get a more complete update for the court. And if I may Thank add, you, Commissioner, um, the part of that was the uh, lockdowns of all the areas in, in D.C. So the only thing we could find uh, when we talked about that, and I see Mr. Landeros is on, so he knows all about this, that that Dulles was really the only choice because each, each location has a certain number of spots, and those are very expensive. Mr. Landeros, would you? Yes, no, thank you, and, and good morning, Jose Landeros, Interim Director for Economic Development. Just wanted to add to, or, or to respond to, Commissioner, your question. Uh, this was an initiative that was done in, in partnership with, with Borderplex. We were looking, Borderplex Alliance, looking at incentivizing a number of one-way or direct flights from the East Coast to El Paso. <clears throat> Obviously, with the slowdown of, of general aviation traffic because of the pandemic, some of that has taken a little bit of a back seat, but we can definitely work with Borderplex Alliance to request an update um, on where that is. And now that we're seeing increasing numbers of vaccines rolling out, and you know, as Dr. Fauci alluded to this past week, hopefully a sense of normal by the fall, uh, there's definitely value in 
reinitiating and reengaging with the partners on on the status of that project and seeing if it's something that we start to work toward once again. And if I may add to that, uh, just one thought. I'd suggested this quite some time ago in the previous sitting administration and the previous airport management, and I'm trying to encourage them to consider this again. So if Betsy agrees with the concept, I'll mention to you, I'd be happy to help in any way I can. But we have a partnership potentially with the city of Albuquerque and their Sunport. They are facing the same challenges we are with direct service to the eastern eastern coast, particularly Washington, D.C. And for the same reasons, they have a, an enormous number of travelers who are defense-related, who are military-related, who are government-related, that can't get direct service to D.C. And what I had suggested was that perhaps our two airport management could collaborate and look for a way to produce a one-stop flight for us, it would be a one stop, and for Albuquerque, it would be a non stop going to Washington, D.C., and same in return. That would enable us to have direct service, and together with our two communities and the number of travelers we have to have to go to D.C., would meet the criteria that the airlines have to have in order to justify any, adding any service. Because if it's first line is profitability, if it's not profitable, it makes no sense to them. <clears throat> so hopefully that helped you. Commissioner Leon with, excuse me, <clears throat> with answering that question. Uh, yeah, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, anybody else? Any other commissioner? Any Commissioner, comments? commissioner Robinson, Judge. Oh, good. Uh, I was just about to ask for you to speak, uh, Commissioner Robinson, because I know you're passionate about this topic. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Richard, Lance, John, uh, all the crew, uh, Gus, I, I look forward to uh, uh, rejoining you guys as soon as possible uh, with, with everything you guys do in, in regards to the arms. But uh, one thing, that the question was actually about Big Phil. Uh, Lance, you can comment on this in regards to the, the C-5 aircraft that are able to land at, at, at Big Phil. Uh, Commissioner, uh, good, to, good to hear you. Um, I, I, I don't want to lie and tell you that I know the answer to that question. I would have to dig into it. Um, I cannot see why not we have 747 long bodies landing there. Uh, so I, I would guess yes, but I owe you an answer to that, Commissioner Robinson, and I will get back to you today. Well, well I basically my, my comment, my, my question in regards to in, in the past, we've had, in fact, when we had the, uh, the, the military displays out there at, at Big Field years ago, uh, we, we've had C-5s out there all, all, as part of the display. In the, and if you can describe, uh, I know you can describe the, the capability of a C-5 as far as uh, their, their, their capacity to take equipment uh, from Fort Bliss to anywhere in the world. Absolutely, uh, Commissioner. Yeah, I, we've uh, transitioned to mainly C-17s, which uh, which are incredibly powerful and can carry uh, up to four helicopters from point A to point B. They can carry a 70-ton M1 Abrams tank from uh, long range. They are huge, uh, and they are the prime mover. Uh, the C-5s, I believe, are in the reserve, so obviously that still flies, and it has nearly the same capabilities, but the C-17 has actually a shorter takeoff uh, and landing capability. So I'm nearly positive. I just don't know for sure that they can land uh, uh, at Fort Bliss because I haven't checked into that. I, too, have seen C-17s on the runway, which is the largest aircraft we own. So it, the answer is 99.9% .9 correct. I just didn't want to give you an answer without researching it. Yes, sir. Thank uh, you, Lance. Uh, J J J uh, Richard, uh, I know in the, in the past, Gus, uh, we had the, uh, uh, the Department of Defense and Department of the Army listening sessions here in El Paso. Do we anticipate having any of those sessions anytime soon? Gus, you want to take that? Yeah, um, Gus, please. Mr. Robinson, uh, our, our plan is uh, there's a major exercise that will be taking place at Fort Bliss 
sometime in October. Uh, I've already reached out to Army leadership and asked them if when, because all this service um, uh, chiefs will be participating in that exercise, they will be here for that exercise. So I've asked if we could do a VIP day where we can engage our elected officials to visit with those folks. So I will keep you all uh, informed as to how that goes. And uh, uh, definitely um, we, will, we will need your assistance to communicate to our, the senior leaders the value uh, you know, to the region, to, uh, to the uh, Department of Defense. So we will, we will keep you all informed of that. Well, Thank you. You know, guys, you know that, uh, that I'm on board with anything you guys do, particularly when you talk about the military. Uh, one thing, uh, if, if, going back to the listening session, uh, could G Gus, could you explain the purpose of the listening session, uh, uh, the purpose and the focus of the listening session in regards to uh, the, the, the benefit to El Paso? Uh, these listening sessions that take place give us an opportunity to engage with senior leaders who are coming into our region. Normally, we have to be going out to Washington to visit with them, so it's it's uh it's in our best interest to make sure that when when these individuals come in for whatever purpose or for whatever reason that we have an opportunity to talk to them so uh, again we owe you some updated information in, in regards to data points that you can use when you visit with these individuals i know some of you have done that the county the county judge was involved in a visit with uh, general funk when he came in and some of you have participated in some of our other events so these are key uh, opportunities for us to showcase what we have within our area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Any other one, questions? One yes, sir. One, Go one, ahead, Commissioner one Robinson. Thing, uh, yeah, Go yeah, ahead. One last thing. Sure. Uh, uh, Lance, you, you, you can comment on this and tell, let everybody know that Fort Bliss is the largest military installation in the world. Uh, well, Commissioner, absolutely. Uh, we can send you, uh, we can send all members of uh, the court uh, data on this. It's absolutely amazing. We can fit uh, Rhode Island in there, Connecticut in there, uh, but the absolute value uh, of the triad uh, comes from its, not only just its huge size, but its capabilities. So, you have 1.2 million acres of, of, uh, uh, of training area, but everything is controlled from, the, from sub, sub ground to space. So when the Air Force wants to fly in White Sands in this giant uh, swath of Texas and New Mexico, they have to ask because it's all connected. It's also uh, the, the spectrum is connected here. So all of the things that you talk about when it comes to, to these advanced capabilities, those are all perfectly suited to be tested, worked, tried, shot from the pistol all the way to the missile in our area. Thank you, Lance. Uh, any more comments, questions from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Stout, please. Just real quickly, Judge, gentlemen, thank you all very much for, for the presentation and for your patience with us. Um, I, have, I have a couple of questions when it comes to uh, your, your infrastructure priorities. Can you, can you give me a little more information on, on the one that you, that you have listed as your major priority, the spur, where, can, can just so the public understands it so we can understand a little bit more about, about that rail spur? Uh, yes, thank you, Commissioner, for that question. The rail spur is key to the training activities that take place at Fort Bliss, and the fact that at the same time that we are training thousands of soldiers, I believe that the number uh, was um, somewhere in the area of above close to 50,000. Uh, Mr. Lair can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but we have them training, so you have them coming in, bringing heavy equipment, bringing all of the things that they need for those training exercises, and then taking them out when the training completes. At the same time, we have soldiers that are stationed at Fort Bliss that are deploying uh, out of Fort Bliss or returning from deployment and utilizing that same spur. We have installations much smaller than Fort Bliss that have more than one railhead. Uh, so that's critical to Fort Bliss uh, to make sure that we're able to accomplish the training mission and 
you know, and the deployments that we need to do to be able to, uh, you know, to do the work that the Department of Defense does. So that is why that is uh, so so key. The the challenge that we have is is uh, that the Department of Defense has so many needs, and to be honest with you, uh, even though this is critical and they acknowledge it's critical. It's not one of the, the top priorities. So as a region, we can need to continue to focus on that. And uh, as I say, pound the drum to make sure that Army leaders uh, understand the, the importance of that railhead. That's why some of these uh, key engagements that Commissioner Robinson was talking about are so critical that when they come in, they're hearing that, this message from all of our leaders within the community. I don't know if that answers your question, well, Commissioner. Go ahead, Commissioner yeah. Scott. And um, what, 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 what would be the location for the spur? Commissioner, it is on, it is on Fort Bliss land. Uh, that's why it's a bit more difficult to be able to partner with someone. Uh, like some of the uh, regional uh, rail companies that we have here in El Paso that service El Paso. But I will, get, I will make sure that you have and that the other members of the court have uh, detailed information as to its location and the proposed uh, railhead so that we all understand that. Great, thank you. And, and then my last question is, um, if and, 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 and where um, the proposed Northeast Borderland Expressway may fit into to any of y'all's work or priorities? May I take that? Or Tom, actually, Tom go Thomas, ahead. Go ahead, Richard. you've been involved Tom. in this. Go ahead, Tom. Do you want to take it, Tom? Tom, go ahead. You're on mute, Tom. OK, um, we're talking about the Northeast Border Expressway, right? Yes. Um, yes we're, um, we, we have regular meetings uh, on uh, about the expressway, and we're getting very close uh, to being able to start construction um, on, uh, I can send you information. Uh, there's a timeline uh, that's been uh, devised uh, so that you'll know when the actual construction takes place. But it, part of this uh, expressway goes through Fort Bliss, uh, but we already have approval on that. We don't have any as as I understand it, currently we don't have any uh, approvals open. New Mexico is on board, uh, the Fort Bliss is on board, and uh, TxDOT is on board. So uh, it's a matter, um, as I understand it now, it's a matter of money, and uh, you know that that will continue to be a problem. But hopefully, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you, Thanks, Tom. Tom. Any other questions Thank from you. anyone? If not hearing none, I'd like to make a move to uh, accept their request. I second that motion. Thank you, Commissioner. The the item as it's written, Judge, is not set up for action. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Kelly. We're we're for direction. Uh, apologize. It was more a presentation of. Thank you. Got a little well, ahead of myself. That said, here, but may I ask? It was the excitement. Uh, I guess the judge, <laughs> as well as Betsy, uh, would you like to uh, get us on the agenda sometime in the next few weeks so that we're in compliance with open meetings uh, to take an action on this? Absolutely. I'll have Betsy. Uh, Betsy will help out with connecting with them. Great. Yes, thank well, you. thank you, G gentlemen. Thank you very much, not only for the request, obviously, and I know it's important, but I think the educational component and uh, when, when you're on board, when you gentlemen are on board and each one brings up all these uh, different things that uh, that we need to know about and it's almost an educational component to us as commissioners as to what's, what's happening. I can tell you one of my most difficult meetings was with Colonel Murphy uh, thinking I knew a lot about Fort Bliss. Oh my goodness, uh, there was so much I didn't know. It was a little embarrassing, born and raised and the relationship we have with Ford Bliss. And so I encourage everyone that's listening to really understand the, the impact and the billions of dollar impact that, uh, that our military has here in our community. So once again, thank you for promoting that and all the other items that I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, gentlemen, thank you. Sorry for the delay, but I uh, hope it was worth the wait. Thank you. It was judge commissioners. Thank you on behalf of the whole team. We appreciate your undying support 
it's important to us. It's critical, actually. And, and we thank you again for giving us this opportunity. I'll work with Betsy to get us on your calendars quarterly so we can give you an abbreviated presentation on what's happened since the last presentation so that you're always well informed. Thank you. I, I would recommend that it would be on our special session. We we tend to have a little bit more time and a little bit more opportunity to to address it than, than our regular meeting. So it's just a recommendation. So thank you, Betsy. It's a good idea. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. See. Thank you. Okay. You guys be safe. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Caesar. Continuing on with item number five, resolutions. Item number 5A, approve and adopt a resolution calling upon the federal government to work with local communities to ensure the policies and resources are in place for ethical, humane treatment of migrant refugees. Commissioner Stout. Thank you, Judge. Um, thank you, Court. Let me pull up the resolution here. Um, so uh, this is a joint resolution that, that we are proposing uh, um, the, the judge's office and, and, and my office. So I want to thank the judge's office for their help with this, as well as um, a number of the, the local uh, advocacy organizations, especially the, the Hope Border Institute. Um, so uh, whereas 40 years ago, the Refugee Act of 1980 became law in the United States of America, and created the framework for refugee resettlement in the United States, cementing our commitment to human decency and enhancing a cornerstone of the American dream, the ability to find refuge in a land of opportunity where we recognize that all people are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And whereas the United States has an extensive history of welcoming refugees and has previously led the world in the, number of, in the number of refugees welcomed and resettled in our country, having resettled three million of more than four million refugees resettled worldwide. And whereas the last number of years have proved challenging with nativist and anti-American values dominating our immigration system and federal bureaucracy, leading to, a slash, leading to a slashing of the number of refugees welcomed into our country from an average of 95,000 annually to 18,000. And whereas the Biden administration reaffirms our global commitment to helping those who are forced to flee their home countries due to war, violence, and our persecution, the administration should consider the success of the Refugee Act of 1980 and build upon it as we meet the challenges of this age and what leads an individual to become a refugee. And whereas post-settlement, the inclusion of refugees in America has led to greater diversity and social wealth at the community level and at the national economic level as well. In 2015 alone, more than 151,000 refugee and entrepreneurs generated $44.6 billion in business income. And whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has compounded the difficulties of people on the move, and we now face mounting pressures locally to ensure we prepare with the resources needed to ensure our brothers and sisters from afar are safe and healthy, as they make their way to loved ones and friends already in the United States through El Paso. And whereas the Biden administration and the federal government must not only reverse previously implemented policy and work to ensure policies and resources are in place for ethical and humane treatment of migrant refugees, they must also assist non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and local government entities as we support the federal government through this process. And whereas a letter addressing testing and care of migrants was sent to the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, the Honorable Alejandro Mayorkas, on behalf of the community leaders calling upon the federal government to address the urgent need to provide testing and care to migrants who may be released into our community in the near future. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Paso County Judge and Commissioner's Court that we forward this resolution to and call upon our own federal delegation to help us adequately collaborate and serve while ensuring the health and safety of all our constituents, as well as that of our brothers and sisters seeking refuge in this land of opportunity in which they will undoubtedly contribute socially, culturally, and economically to the beautiful tapestry that are these United States of America. Signed this 22nd day of February, 2021. Second.
Judge, would you like to take any speakers before you take this vote? Uh, yes. Uh, who do we have, uh, Miguel? Or, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Susan? I believe we have, I believe we have uh, uh, Marisa Limon from Border, from Border Hope. Oh, hi, Marisa. Thank you for joining us. So go ahead, Marisa. Good morning. Thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to speak um, in support of this resolution. And I really want to sing the praises of El Paso County and the efforts that have been made to date to do a safe, orderly, and humane welcome of migrants and asylum seekers into our community. I think we've made a mark nationally and across the borderlands as a community that does you know, live up to our stated values. And so we do speak in support of this resolution. We have the honor and privilege of being co-facilitators along with the Office of New Americans within the county on the Frontera Welcome Coalition. This is a coalition made up of city, county, NGOs, and faith-based groups who've all raised their hands to say we want to be part of this welcome preparedness effort. And these groups are not only from El Paso, but also from New Mexico and include representatives from Juarez. And so this regional preparedness effort allows us to really think critically and build upon the lessons learned from 2018 and 2019 when it comes to welcoming migrants, as well as the best practices when it comes to COVID mitigation and prevention in congregate settings, like we already know from the Delta Center, the Welcome Haven, as well as the Hotel Filtro in Ciudad Juarez. And so we're taking all of this data together and building a plan to support Annunciation House and Ruben Garcia, who's, who's our, been our fearless leader for over 40 years in the community, to match this with, with real care. And so we've been very pleased to see how our community has come together to do this. We know that in San Diego, they started their welcome last Friday and 25 people were paroled in through the Remain in Mexico program that is officially over and now actively winding down. And here in our community, we will receive 25 people this coming Friday. And so it's been an honor and a privilege to be a fronteriza who's connected to the White House and to the UN agencies that are supporting these efforts and to make sure the needs of our community are uplifted, including the resources so clearly outlined in the letter to Secretary Mayorkas. So we stand in support of this resolution. We stand in support of the work of the county at many different levels, and we look forward to further participation to make our stated values a reality. Marisa, thank you so much. Uh, you've done an amazing job of sort of your the connectivity uh, with a lot of different uh, organizations and, and, of course, with uh, your relationship with Commissioner Stout and, and his office. And so uh, we're very thankful. Uh, a lot of work. Uh, but I think one of the things we've been known for a lot is that we prepare before, and I think this is going on for some time now, uh, whereas other uh, counties sort of get uh, surprised and a little bit more of a reactive uh, and I appreciate the proactive efforts uh, that you and and our office have done and, and that you've uh, collaborated with uh, with us in, in, in those uh, areas so thank you very much for that I think that's our, our only pleasure. speaker so we could now Caesar we could continue on the vote please <clears throat> yes sir Commissioner Olguin aye Commissioner Leon aye Commissioner Stout. Of course, I and, and I and I also just want to echo the thanks. Um, thank you, Judge, for your leadership and and you know setting up these meetings that we've been having uh, with with the the immigration authorities over the last number of, of months. You know, and and as a result of what we're dealing with with COVID and um, you know the the work that is being done right now re regarding this issue is you know the the collaboration and the communication is is really um is really outstanding and especially in comparison with with some of the things that we've seen in the past and so i really want to um thank our our uh, Lore at our office of uh, for new americans and, and for helping coordinate um these efforts as well as uh, marisa and, and dylan and and uh, the bishop uh, uh, that have been working working very 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 hard to to uh, really um, take care of these folks once they're once they're going to be coming back through El Paso and so um, you know I, I don't know if Judge uh, I, I don't know if you wanted to read the letter or not if you have that on hand but I do have it 
Yeah, maybe. I do have it, and maybe that'll support the, uh, the the resolution as well. So I, I think that would be, be great. Uh, something that would be really good for us. So uh, I'll go ahead and have uh, this letter is written to Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, on that letter, uh, we have copies to Acting Commissioner Troy Miller, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, uh, Chief uh, Rodney S. Scott, U.S. Border Patrol. We also have a very supportive person that has been very involved and very uh, gracious with her time is Chief Patrol Agent Gloria Chavez, uh, U.S. Border Patrol, El uh, Paso sector. Uh, so this is in reference to COVID-19 testing and migrant releases into border communities. Secretary Mayorkas, we congratulate you on your recent appointment and confirmation as Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, DHS. As a border community, we are sensitive to the complexities and challenges of balancing the fair application of our nation's immigration laws and efforts to ensure public safety, particularly in this time of a pandemic. We have a number of outstanding questions related to administration's plans for sheltering, transporting, and processing migrants in our region, Ch uh, chief among which are concerns regarding COVID-19. And I stress that, COVID-19. We understand that there may be a, a potential for release, uh, release of migrant apprehended at the border into local communities, not those migrants uh, processed under the Migrant Protection Protocol. Our local communities have significant experience in offering hospitality to migrants uh, paroled by, patrolled by U.S. Uh, Border Patrol and U.S. Immigrant and Customs Enforcement. We have long benefited from strong collaboration and communication between federal and local governments, local immigration enforcement agencies, and our community NGOs, as well as our strong binational relationships. We're concerned that in this time of a pandemic, the release of migrants apprehended without adequate testing and care protocols may pose a public health challenge. While we do not advocate for the holding and processing of migrants beyond the time during which they can be uh, safely and, and humanely processed, we also recognize the urgency of providing COVID-19 testing to migrants apprehended in order to mitigate the possibility of community spread. A COVID-19 response plan for migrants released under these circumstances is beyond the capacity of the combined efforts of our local governments and NGO community. Therefore, we urgently ask you to address the need to provide testing and care to migrants who may be released into our communities in the near future. We know that the collaboration and assistance of the federal government, we will be able to meet the challenges of receiving migrants and asylum seekers at the border with dignity and in a way that guarantees the health and safety of everyone. We thank you for your attention and look forward to working with you on this urgent matter. It's, this letter is signed by the Honorable Veronica Escobar, by myself, Honorable Oscar Leeser, Mayor of the City of El Paso, and Honorable Bianca Ortiz Wortham, Secretary, Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, State of New Mexico. And also, Most Reverend uh, Mark uh, Seitz, Bishop of El Paso, Mr. Ruben Garcia, Executive Director of Annunciation House, Mrs. Marisa Limon Garza, Co-Chair of Frontera Welcome Coalition, Mr. Dylan Colbert, Executive Director of Hope Border Institute, and Mr. Kenneth Ferroni, Executive Director, Catholic Charities of Southern New Mexico. Once again, obviously, we, we thank all of these partners that we have and that we're anticipating uh, this situation um, that uh, could put us in a very vulnerable situation and also the dignity and the respect that we have always shown uh, during you know our past uh, relationships with migration. Uh, we've always shown a tremendous amount of kindness and generosity, and I think this will continue. And I think finally, and the Commissioner Stout has said this before, and that is that, you know, we are very well positioned. We're, we're not a community that you're testing, you're trying to figure out. We, you know, we've done this before. We've done it in a great way. We have great partners and great collaboration starting from way back. Our meetings that uh, include Commissioner Stout on with the uh, immigration agencies uh, has been going for over two years. So this is not something or collaborations that we're trying to create at the last minute, but ongoing partnerships have gone for quite a long time. Uh, once again, uh, thank you for 
you know, your your support commissioner and hopefully our, our office as well to, to support such a great uh, enterprise. Thank you. Okay, so I, I think I said I vote aye. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Moving on to item number 5B. Approve and authorize a resolution declaring February 28, 2021 as Desert Storm Veterans Day in El Paso County, Texas. Go ahead, Commissioner. Thank you, Judge. Um, and this was a resolution that was brought forth to my office by our very, very own Veterans Advisory Board. And so I'd like to thank them for all of their hard work in preparing and working on this resolution. And we actually have um, the appointee for Precinct 3 who is on the line with us, Aldina Hajer. And I have asked her if she could please read the resolution into the record. Oh, okay. Thank you. Go ahead. All right, how are you everybody? My name is Aldina um, and I'll go ahead and read today's resolution. El Paso County State of Texas resolution. Whereas on August 2nd, 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait sovereignty and freedom with 100,000 Iraq troops. And whereas on August 7th, 1990, the United States and its allied forces were ordered to the theater by President Bush launching Operation Desert Shield, known also as the line drawn in the sand. And whereas on November 29, 1990, United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 678, setting a deadline for Iraq to withdraw from Kuwait no later than January 15, 1991, or face military action. And whereas over 600,000 troops you, some of which were called up, called up guard and reserve members, including many from El Paso County, were called to action. And whereas on January 12, 1991, the U.S. Congress passed a joint resolution authorizing use of military force to drive Iraq out of Kuwait. And whereas on February 24, 1991, the U.S. ground forces led a ground attack against Iraq forces in Iraq and Kuwait. And whereas on February 28, 1991, President Bush proclaimed a ceasefire of Operation Desert Storm and announced that U.S. and Allied forces had accomplished all stated objectives in about 100 hours of ground combat. Whereas Desert Storm veterans will never be forgotten for their commitment to protect and freedom. And therefore, be it resolved by the El Paso County Judge and Commissioner Court that February 28th, 2021, be known as Desert Storm Veterans Day, signed this day, 22nd day of February 2021. Thank you. Second. And I believe we have Carl Dwyer on the line as well, Judge, who would like to okay. speak. I'm not sure if you'd like to hear from him first. Oh, before that's we fine. Go. Yeah. yeah, that would be great. Carl, welcome. Hey, good morning, uh, Judge and Commissioners. Good morning. Can you hear me? We sure can. Okay. Uh, as uh, Commissioner Hogan stated, I uh, want to thank the Veteran Advisory Board for bringing this resolution forward. It is also timely as uh, this year, 2021, we celebrate the 30th anniversary, 30 year anniversary of uh, Operation Desert Shield and Operation Desert Storm. And as a veteran that uh, was in uniform on active duty at the time of this uh, operation, uh, I'd like to offer my heartfelt thanks on behalf of veterans to the court for considering and recognizing and proposing this resolution. Um, Mrs. Hatcher, noted that the guard and the reserve are uh, were also a big huge component of the number of troops that were called so it goes to it shows to speak that all compos of the army the guard and 
the reserve were used and called upon. So there's no such thing as a part-time soldier. So once again, on behalf of all veterans and the county, uh, we'd like to thank you for taking up this resolution. And this Sunday, February 28th, you know, take some time out and there, there'll be multiple links and videos to commemorate uh, the 28th of February and uh, just spread that word throughout the community so we, that we don't forget this generation of veteran also, a lot of whom of which are now approaching retirement age and transition age and uh, are here within our community. So thank you very much, Judge and Commissioners. Well, no, you, uh, Carl, thank you so much and uh, for your insights. And uh, I, I think what a, what a great balance. I, I know we were starting, took us a long time to do a good job about uh, Vietnam. And, and I think it's overdue that we have the same balance for, for, for our new veterans that uh, were in, in a different situation. And so I think that you've done a great job of maintaining that balance. I think our wall try to do that, uh, you know, wall of honor, try to do that sort of balance of different missions and so forth. But uh, uh, thank you since you've co come in, Carl. It's, uh, it's, it's been just a pleasure of how you've uh, connected us even closer to the county and, and, and the commissioners as to what's happening in, in the world of, of veterans. So thank you for that. And uh, um, and Judge, I don't know if Aldina had any uh, remarks that she wanted to make on behalf of the Veterans Advisory Board. Excellent. Aldina? Yes. Um, well, I just wanted to, like, I, like Mr. Carl Dwyer said, I wanted to say thank you so much for putting this out into public and, and giving a, our community an opportunity to see what what our veterans have done for our country. And it, it's not just today, it's not just the last 20 years, it's 30 years, 50 years, 100 years and on. And I, I really truly appreciate it on behalf of everyone, every single veteran who has served, not just during Desert Storm, but OIF, OEF and all other uh, missions that we've had throughout, you know, decades for, for recognizing us and for giving us a chance to be appreciated, even if it's just for one day. Well, thank you. And thank you for your service and everything that you're doing and uh, on the board. And, uh, and hopefully you said it perfectly, uh, not just for one day, but uh, just going forward and hopefully throughout the entire month and, and, and whatever you could do, um, uh, Carl, to let us know what's what's happening and uh, how as commissioners, I know they're always very excited about participating. So whatever we could do to participate in any way, enhance uh, your your activities, uh, of, you know, going forth until the 28th. So thank you. Uh, Commissioner Robinson, any further comments? Yeah, my, my phone was muted. Uh, I, I recognize all of the and applaud all the veterans who have served in uh, in, in uh, Afghanistan, Iraq uh, during during the the last thirty years of, of service uh, in, in in deployment. Many of the soldiers have have, have had multiple deployments. Uh, I remember a young man that lived next door to me. Uh, he had uh, he was E five trying to make E six. Uh, he got out of the service because he had, in in a short period of time of two years, he had had six deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, it's very devastating to the the member, but as well as a family for those soldiers. So it's, it's many many sacrifices that the soldiers have to endure. Uh, I myself is a Vietnam veteran, um, served uh, two consecutive tours. Uh, in in uh, in Vietnam, but uh, we want to recognize all the soldiers, uh, particularly those who does the storm, does the shield, uh, and welcome home. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate that. Back to you, uh, Commissioner Olguin. Any closing um. comments? No, again, I just wanted to thank our Veterans Advisory Board for all of their efforts and for bringing forth this resolution. Thank you, and thank you for bringing this resolution. Uh, go ahead, uh, Caesar. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Olguin, that was your motion. Uh, we did have somebody else reading it. I just wanted to confirm. Yes. Thank you. 
Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Leon. Aye. Commissioner Stout. Aye. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Item number 5C, approve and adopt a resolution providing support for rural broadband expansion in El Paso County. Excellent, Commissioner Olguin. Yes, um, this is a very, very important issue that the uh, county judge's office and my own have been working closely with the superintendents of the rural school district, specifically with the superintendent of Fabens, uh, uh, um, Tornillo and San Elisario ISD. Um, this is an issue that I think now more than ever um, has has uh, we we're realizing just how important it is to make sure that every single student and every single part of our county has access uh, to broadband services. Um, so as we work closely with our Congresswoman Veronica Escobar and with our state delegation and of course the superintendents of the school districts um, on this issue, uh, I wanted to thank them for making sure that this issue was in the forefront. Um, and uh, by virtue of this resolution, we just wanna make sure that everyone knows that the County of El Paso believes that this is an incredibly important issue and something that we're gonna continue to work on. Um, I do wanna thank our State Board of Education uh, representative, Georgina Perez, for helping with the um, drafting of this resolution. Um, so I'll go ahead and read it now. Uh, whereas our commitment to facilitating the best instruction possible to every student in every school district within the County of El Paso is one of our most compelling responsibilities. And whereas students and faculty of every school district within the County of El Paso, especially the rural districts in the outlying areas of the county, will certainly benefit from the expansion of broadband connectivity. And whereas the need to provide high speed internet accessibility to every student within El Paso County is of paramount importance, most especially with the growing demand caused by the ongoing pandemic and various other potential natural calamities. And whereas the absence of a reliable internet infrastructure impedes both virtual and distance learning at a time when 21st century instruction is replete with technological advancements. And whereas it is incumbent upon our leaders and decision makers to act conscientiously and put our students at the top of their priorities. Mm -hmm. And whereas internet accessibility and connectivity throughout El Paso County will not only benefit our students, but the entire community as well by increasing access to financial institutions that offer online banking and other services, effective access to healthcare providers offering telemedicine services and access to expanded employment and training opportunities. And whereas with full transparency of the process from start to finish, any broadband expansion project can only be accomplished with teamwork and cooperation amongst all stakeholders. And now therefore be it resolved that the El Paso County Commissioner's Court offers unequivocally its steadfast and unwavering support for the expansion of internet connectivity throughout El Paso County. In official recognition whereof, the commissioners of the court hereby affix their signatures this 22nd day of February, 2021 in El Paso, Texas. And I'm not sure if we have speakers on this item. I believe our state board of education representative, Georgina Perez is on the line, as well as perhaps some of our rural uh, ISD superintendents. Excellent, uh, Mrs. Perez, are you on the line? Yes, sir, I'm here. Oh, well, welcome and what an honor. Thank you for, for being here today. Uh, go ahead. Um, I, I'm very happy to see that uh, Commissioner's Court is taking up this resolution as, as I am happy to see the other resolutions that were mentioned um, prior to this one. Um, staying in my lane, however, it is of the utmost importance um, that our students and their families out here have access to the internet. You know uh, very well that being out not only on a border, in a border community, but on the outskirts of the municipalities, it's, it's increasingly difficult for our students and their families to access not only education, 
for our primary and secondary grades, but also continuing education for their parents and grandparents, telemedicine, um, online banking et cetera, which are all the uh, tools that our communities need to escape the cycle of poverty. Primarily, however, literacy. And when our students cannot log in because of the lack of infrastructure, the lack of broadband, then it is, is nearly impossible for them to participate in their constitutionally um, give, provided rights of effective education. And so, again, I'm very happy to see that the county is making this a priority and taking up this resolution. And thank you for the invitation to to speak on, on something that is not only incredibly important, but near and dear to my heart, as I am speaking to you all right now, on a satellite, again, because there is no broadband out here where I live. <laughs> thank you for making your case as well. Thank you. appreciate that. But thank you for being here today and, and supporting <laughs> such a great initiative. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Miguel, do we have other speakers? Um, I am not sure, Judge. Is there anyone else here for this item? If you can unmute yourself and uh, present your name and uh, address the court. Don't believe we have anybody, Judge. Nobody. Okay, so uh, I just just want to comment that uh, we were really sort of getting this thing going, struggling a little bit. But I want to thank uh, when Commissioner Olguin gets involved, uh, things things started moving a little faster. And thank you for bringing uh, pumping in some more oxygen into this Im important. But I think the the to to me as, as you focus on the schools, and, and you said it, Ms. Pettis, is that. It, the, the collateral impact of telemedicine and uh, you know to me that is really painful to know that some of them are most vulnerable that aren't able to travel don't have transportation this would be such an important thing for them to be able to connect to a to a doctor a lot of times they'll go to the office not for an injection or not but they go for consultation and this is a really trying experience for them. So when I learned about all the collateral impact, and we've all seen it, I don't care, we're trying to do funding. <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't get to the right people and small businesses or, or that we're not able to develop. And some of the things that the superintendents brought up is that a lot of companies aren't willing to move into the area or businesses opening up businesses because they don't have broadband. So why would I you know, establish my business there? So it really creates... Uh, this economic development impact uh, that it would just be amazing. Um, I, I am working, as I've said before, close with um, to see if that fund that was given, the impact fund that was given to the city, uh, would be used. Uh, you know, a large earmarked for this kind of for broadband and, and for what the things that we need. Uh, have reached out to uh, members of the electric company as well to give us the support, even though that's no longer there. Uh, their say, I still think they have some uh, abilities, uh, and and they they gain right. The electric company gains because more business, more more electricity, and and so all of these other collateral things happen. So uh, once again, I think it's an amazing. I, I can't think of anything that we could do. It's a, it's that one thing that has such an impact on so many areas and so many dimensions of what we talk about, from reaching people for COVID to vaccines to educating people to all of these things. So really looking forward to that we do get some traction and support on this. So so I send it back to you, Commissioner Olguin. Thank you, Judge, and thank you for all of your help. Um, and as I mentioned before, we continue to work with our Congresswoman Veronica Escobar and our state delegation. Of course, we know funding is always going to be a challenge, but I'm really, really hopeful that we can, working together, find a permanent solution that will benefit not only our students in our rural school districts, but the entire community as well. Thank you. Thank you. And the superintendents, my goodness, I've never seen a <laughs> relentless, uh, more passionate uh, it's such a pleasure to work with them. And, and I say with them, you either work with them or get out of the way because uh, <laughs> they're going to move. And so I want to thank the superintendents for, for all their, their work. So once again, have a, a, a great day, uh, Ms. Pettis, and, and thank you for everything you do. Judge, I, I, I don't know if I don't know if Cesar heard me, but I said I would second the motion to to pass the resolution. Oh, okay, <laughs> great, great. Did you get that, Caesar? <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, Commissioner Olguin. 
Aye. Commissioner Leon. Aye. Commissioner Stout. I and, and I just want to thank uh, Commissioner Aldean so much for for this resolution. I, I think that it's so important to make sure that that our, you know that that we we make our values known and and I and I think you we, you know we're we're a county that 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 talks to talk. I mean that doesn't just talk to talk; it walks a walk. You know, I mean we have um, constantly uh, been we put our money where our mouth is as well, right? Last year we. I want to remind the public that that um, you know we, we commissioned a study. We started the commissioning of a study that that would allow us to tap into uh, the you know further funding, uh, changing our status or our, our, our classification in the eyes of the federal government when it comes to uh, being able to to possibly tap into different grants. And then we also um, took a, a, a large chunk of our CARES Act funding. And and we're able to help a lot of the rural rural uh, ISDs uh, tap into uh, a, a put up a match for a lot of infrastructure that they needed. And so, um, you know, I'm I'm very proud of of, of uh, the continued work, and 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 I'm and I'm so happy that you're bringing this resolution forth. Thank you very much. Hi. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Item number 5D. Approve and adopt a resolution recognizing February 21st through the 27th, 2021 as National Engineers Week in El Paso County, Texas. Thank you, Caesar, and also very close to my heart, and that is uh, we talked a little bit about the importance of keeping our, our young talent and uh, individuals uh, that, that work here in our community uh, so incredibly well-versed and, you know, bilingual, and, and so I think this is uh, an addition to that, so I'm very honored to read this uh, resolution. Whereas February 21st to the 27th, 2021 is recognized as National Engineers Week to honor the nation's engineers in all fields who use their knowledge and skills in innovative ways to fulfill our society's needs and ensure a diverse and well-educated future engineering workforce by increasing understanding and of the interest in engineers and technology careers. Whereas El Paso Electric, the Texas Department of Transportation El Paso District, the University of Texas at El Paso, are partnering to celebrate their engineering engineers who are each working to make a difference in our region and are collaborating to grow a future workforce of successful engineers. And whereas El Paso Electric has 114 engineers dedicated to assuring safe, clean, and efficient sources of energy and building infrastructure for the technological challenges of our time. They are a critical component of regional electric utility that provides generation, transmission, and distribution service to more than 441,800 retail and wholesale customers in a 10,000 square mile area of the Rio Grande Valley in West Texas and Southern New Mexico. And whereas more than three dozen professional engineers in TxDOT, El Paso District, are integrated in each, in each aspect of the agency's work from design planning traffic, maintenance, and construction. They are part of 1,200 across TxDOT statewide working tirelessly every day to provide a safe, reliable, and integrated transportation system that enables a movement of people and goods. And whereas UTEP produces great engineers, many that are Hispanic and first generation, and many that graduate and place in, placed in Fortune 500 companies across the globe, there's also a larger regional and national impact as the College of Engineering is a significant contributor to research expenditures for the university, therefore assisting in elevating the university to a tier one status. And whereas engineers serve as role models and sources of inspiration to our students and community to realize the power of their knowledge and National Engineers Week works to further promote a diverse and well-educated future engineering workforce. The group's engineers will lead various activities of students and be recognized with the, the lightning of the star on the mountain 
the interstate uh, turbines and downtown El Paso bridge arches. Now, therefore, be it, be it resolved by the El Paso County Judge and Commissioner's Court that February 21st to the 27th, 2021, shall be known as National Engineers Week for Engineers in El Paso Electric, TxDOT, El Paso District, and UTEP. Signed this 22nd day of February 2021. A second. Do we have, uh, I believe we do have some individuals that will be speaking today. Mr. Trevino, go ahead. Thank you, Judge, and thank you all of Commissioner's Court uh, for your recognition. Uh, we appreciate it. And on behalf of the 1,200 plus engineers that work for the Texas Department of Transportation, uh, we accept we accept your, your recognition. Uh, we are happy to be partnering this year with UTEP's College of Engineering, uh, El Paso Electric, and Mija, yes, you can, to sponsor this year's events. Uh, it's important to inspire the next generation of engineers and to recognize the engineers that work every day to make a difference. Engineers Week is a time to celebrate their important work and engage the next generation of, of engineers and innovators. Uh, even with the social distancing limitations we have, we can still make a difference. Uh, this, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, you know, the, one of the presentations earlier talked about the importance of having a skilled technical workforce and uh, we're happy to make a difference in that respect. Now I'm going to turn it over to Leslie with El Paso Electric to say a few words. Thank you all. Thank you, Tomas. Um, a great job, but uh, thank you for what you do with TxDOT and, you know, really appreciate, uh, uh, you know, what you've done in a short period of time and the relationship you have with everybody in our community. Thank you. And uh, thank you, go ahead. Uh, Okay, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Leslie Shagnon. I'm the Senior Director of Distribution Design, Construction and Maintenance at El Paso Electric. And I would like to take a moment to thank each one of you on this call for your continued um, leadership for our community. And on behalf of El Paso Electric, I would like to thank you for your recognition of our company and for our 114 engineers that do work on a daily basis uh, to provide safe, clean and efficient energy to our communities and are also working to transform our energy landscape as we move forward. Um, so thank you very much for having us and now I'd like to turn over to Interim Dean of the UTEP College of Engineering, Patricia Nava. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Appreciate it. I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak. I'd like to thank you very much for consideration of this, uh, this resolution that will allow us to focus attention on the engineering profession. And in the first part, to show gratitude to all the practicing engineers from TxDOT, El Paso Electric, and all the surrounding areas that contribute to this great city. Um, and moreover, it'll uh, give us the opportunity to engage and inform potential future engineers that are currently either in uh, our UTEP College of Engineering or perhaps, uh, you know, in the uh, school system, you know. So thank you very much. We appreciate your consideration. Oh, very nice of you. And thank you. Uh, what, what a great partnership. I know since uh, our new CEO of the electric company came in and have had so many opportunities and engaged uh, also with our uh, a president at the the university, and um, we have just some great partnerships, and uh, you know, uh, working with uh, Dr. Shadari. I mean, that uh, if you want to understand engineering, and that's uh, that's one person that's so passionate about about engineering, and and some of the comments that he's made to me that really have motivated me is that um, you know he's at the, those levels. I think all of our partners are at the level they could be somewhere else. And uh, what he was saying is uh, his excitement is when someone that's from Tornillo uh, gets to become a, a you know, a, get a, a doctorate or a master's that probably wouldn't. Uh, if he were at any other university, it would probably be those individuals that would have gone anyway. And so he's extremely engaged uh, uh, in working with us. And so once again, uh, great partners. Uh, we really thank you for, for everything that you do. And, and uh, I know the, uh, I think it's 3,000 by 2030. If we could get those 3,000 engineers um, uh, in our community, I, I don't know of anything that would be so powerful other than to keeping, uh, you know, this individuals. I mean, we, we ship them out uh, extremely excited, very passionate, bilingual, trained, 
and we ship them out to other parts of the of the world and country. And so uh, uh, we're we're willing to share some, but not all. Okay, and I think at this point we're sharing too many of them. Uh, so we're a sharing community, but uh, we'd rather keep them uh, as much as we'd like to be charitable. So uh, once again, uh, you know, thank uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, thank you for your presentations and taking time out. And and we wish you the best on engineer month and if there's anything that we could do uh you know please let us know and allow us to participate in this uh, great initiative this month so thank you thank you all thank you thank you i heard a second from commissioner leon was that correct sir that's correct uh-huh yes commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Leon. Aye. Commissioner Stout. Aye. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Item number six is public comment. At this time, we have nobody signed up for comment. Uh, Mr. Mendes, is that still the case? That is correct. So, so nobody has uh, requested public comment. Thank you. We'll take no action on item number six. Judge, would you like to go on to the COVID update? I sure would, um, uh, uh, Betsy. Uh, are we okay? Uh, are we in uh, any anyone in any urgent uh, situation at this time? Or, um, Judge, we do have after the COVID update, we do have UMC on the line as well. So, do, if you want to do those two, I don't know if you want to try to get through both of them before lunch, or if you would like Absolutely. to um, go ahead, sir. No, no, I was saying that uh, we, we could do the, the COVID, uh, the initial that we do, the, the first part, sort of my introduction to it, uh, and then we, we move on forward. Is, uh, is that works for everybody? Sure. Yes, okay, sir. go ahead, Bits. Item number 11 from County Administration. Discuss and take appropriate action regarding El Paso County's preparation and response for COVID-19. Okay, well, thank you. Well, I'll start off. Uh, I've got a, a little bit more than I typically do, but I think there's a lot of things at this time. I think we're in a very pivotal point, and, and for some reason, every uh, the community feels that we're in a lull at this time, and, and, and we really aren't. A lot of things are developing, so uh, I just wanted to express some of the things that have been happening. Uh, I have the uh, pleasure of meeting with Imelda Garcia, Associate Commissioner of Laboratory and Infectious Disease. She is in charge of the rollout of the vaccine and I had a very, uh, very productive meeting with her this Saturday. Uh, some of the things that came up is the excitement about Johnson & Johnson uh, coming on board and uh, the testing or the approval will start this week. Uh, she's looking extremely optimistic that this will happen at the, the uh, first week of March. Uh, it's a great possibility because the Johnson and Johnson being one, one you know one shot instead of two allows us when you reach to certain individuals that you might not be able to get back with a second shot makes that extremely attractive. This could be in congregate settings, uh, for example, in, in jails or you know individuals that are not going to be there. Uh, you've got uh, very difficult to reach uh, individuals that sometimes it's hard to get back to them. So Johnson & Johnson poses some of, uh, of an opportunity uh, to, to be able to not worry about that second shot. And as you, as you know, that second shot has not been easy. As you're trying to give your first shot and it dovetails with your second shot, it, it is a complex situation. So taking that out of the formula would be extremely helpful. Uh, we also know that uh, one of the things that was very promising in our discussion is that we can now be more intentional. That was one of the things that was uh, very difficult for us is that we couldn't target certain populations that we knew, as I've said throughout, you know, when you look at the profile of those who died, 
it should be incumbent in, in all of us to make sure that no one in that population or that profile would end up in a hospital with a probability, a very high probability uh, that they would go in a ventilator and possibly die. And so that was very important to us. And, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about the fact that we could move in that direction. Uh, Associate Commissioner Garcia will be meeting with state level officials this week on their approach and strategy with respect to immigration movement. Uh, that also helped a lot. That was very encouraging. Uh, some of the things in the comments that we've made uh, before about making sure that we do welcome our, our new migrant migration coming into to El Paso, uh, but that the part of the testing and the part of the vaccine also be something that they take into consideration. I've also convened a meeting with Dr. Rachel Sony uh, tomorrow. She's the director of Region 9 and 10 and the rural mayor. So uh, we had a discussion last week with her. Um, uh, very fortunate that one of the mayors had really, uh, uh, you know, try to get some attention to Socorro. And then we were able to say that we need to look at it from a county perspective and a rural perspective. So uh, we'll be meeting uh, with her and the rural mayors uh, tomorrow. Uh, one of the real exciting things, and, and she posed to me, was the, um, you know, that we submit a proposal. And the proposal would be, we have uh, had a discussion with her about my discussions with UMC, uh, the clinics, the mobile units, and of course, uh, the great partnership that we're developing with Desert Imaging uh, mobile units. And uh, she was very excited about that situation and encouraged that if we submitted a proposal, they're very interested, the Biden administration is very interested in focusing on rural areas. And therefore, if we could submit a proposal, she would like to see and, and is very encouraged that we would get over and above vaccine, which is always extremely helpful to focus directly on the hard to reach and the rural and the vulnerable population. Uh, so I've been, uh, I'll be working with uh, Jacob Sintron uh, and U UMC representatives uh, to put together a proposal that allows us to show what would we do if we were able to use our mobile unit, uh, utilize the, uh, you know, the, the three to four that are going to be uh, provided to us by Desert Imaging, uh, and then have the clinics as one component and be able to ask for more vaccines. And one of the things that was very clear is that they're not going to send them to any community that is not prepared and cannot show capacity. And as, as you well know, uh, I think we've done a great job about uh, showing that we are capable of showing capacity that we could handle uh, even up to 50,000 a week if we're allowed and given that opportunity. Uh, also very encouraging is that we'll be working with ESD number two. Uh, they're going to have also, uh, they registered for the vaccine and they're going to be a possible, you know, a distributor of the vaccine as well. And obviously in coordination with UMC. So if you look at the our possibilities of the clinics, the mobile units, having uh, ESD two work with us, uh, I think we're really in a good position. And I think the community uh, we'll feel very good about the fact that uh, we are able to take more of the vaccine, that it's really an issue of supply and demand, uh, but that I think that we've shown our capacity to do so. I, I want to show just very quickly, and I'll try to do this uh, periodically, but I, I did a SWOT, SWOT analysis, which is, you know, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of what's happening in, in our situation right now. So I'd like to start off with strength. Uh, we are leading the state in shots in the arm. Very encouraging about that. Uh, one of the things that was also very encouraging is that we're also leading the state in appropriations, which means that Commissioner Garcia has really taken to heart this challenge that if you could show capacity, we'll send you more. And there is strong evidence that we are getting more vaccine than, than, than other communities based on our population. So, uh, you know, that's... Uh, uh, you know, kudos out to to everyone from Chief Rodriguez and Chief Diagostino, public health and and everyone else. Uh, uh, you know, we do have a capacity. One of the strengths, as I said, we do have a capacity, as of my understanding from working with the mayor, uh, with UMC, that we would be and the clinics and the mobile units that we would have a potential of as much as 50,000 uh, vaccines per week. 
Um, our collaboration, also a strength, our collaboration with NGOs, public health, emergency management team, city, county, state, and federal government has been recognized uh, quite a bit as, as that we are working together. And as I said earlier, it's not something we started, you know, a few, a few weeks ago, but, you know, years ago. I think the commissioner's court uh, started and g gave me the foundation to move forward and continue some collaborations that don't exist in, in other parts of, of Texas and throughout the county. And, and you'll hear about these fragmented approaches that don't work. And, and in our case, uh, you know, even having the relationship with Mexico that we have uh, that I think is going to be um, and you'll see as we're going forth, it's going to be very critical that our binational approach with Juarez uh, is taking traction. And, and I feel extremely good about that. Uh, weaknesses, uh, not having a centralized appointment system between all registered agents. I think we all recognize that it would be better for us to be able to register everybody and understand where the weaknesses are and where you know, what we need to do, and also where the availability of vaccines and, and not try to figure out or have them tell us that they have extra vaccines, but they were able to understand who has them and where can we go. Uh, also, you know, weakness is we, we're not getting ahead of the Brazilian and African strains as others uh, uh, with the vaccine distribution. You know, we're not, uh, we're not way ahead of that. And that's one of the things that Dr. Fauci and everybody else has said that we have to get ahead of that, uh, you know, of that uh, strain coming in. Uh, we're seeing the strain coming in very quickly, and uh, yet uh, their vaccine has not come at the same speed to, to get ahead. And I'll speak as to why that is important. We also don't have, we have, I believe, inadequate data to develop a solid strategy to target the difficult to reach, the most vulnerable in an alignment uh, of our demographics. Uh, we know. Uh, we, she was. She gave me. Uh, Commissioner Garcia's gave me a stat that we know is not possible, uh, but it showed that very few Hispanics uh, were taking the compared to our population uh, demographics, and we know that's not the case because if when I go to the either the to any one of the centers where they're distributing the vaccine, that's not the case. Uh, for some reason, at the beginning, we didn't capture a lot of the data from the ethnicity data to, to show us, you know, who's getting it. And so we need to work uh, quite a bit on that. And of course, the other one is the supply and demand uh, conundrum that we're in. Uh, we're ready to, to, to supply. We have the demand, obviously. Uh, we're a, a community that have, we have not had any difficulty in convincing them to take the uh, uh, to take the, the shot and, and, and take the vaccine. And unfortunately, uh, we're not able to get them to them. Uh, Biden administration focused on rural communities. I think that's going to be an extremely important thing. Our binational approach getting some traction. I, I believe that uh, more and more we're understanding the importance of uh, of not having a relationship with Mexico in a way that will help us, um, you know, be able to both on both sides of the border address it, um, you know, a little bit more, uh, you know, a, a little bit more balanced and, and aligned with each other. Um, uh, best practices between counties to accelerate the logistical approach toward fighting the virus and getting more shots in the arm. Uh, I've been pushing really hard to show that uh, we're not using best practices. For example, what we did with a coliseum of combining uh, logistics experts uh, such as uh, Brian Kennedy and his team, and then combining that with the expertise of UMC and Jacob's team. Uh, really did some amazing things. Uh, we were able to do up to 3,000 in one day, which is unheard of, even in, in large stadiums throughout the, the, the uh, country. And so uh, we're not sharing uh, enough of these uh, best practices. I think that's going to be extremely important. Um, and, and also, you know, uh, develop a communication system. Uh, we really need to to be able to be better at getting information now to everyone, everyone in the, in the community, uh, we're still having quite a challenge with that. Uh, and then finally, threats. Uh, you, the mutation of the virus and the, the virus dodging the present vaccine so far is, is you know, it's, it's, we're very vulnerable at this time. Uh, so far, the mutations have not been as significant and are still within the, the, uh, the, 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 the potency of the vaccine. Uh, but we know for a fact that that cannot last as they mutate further. 
it's more, more and more difficult for us to use that same virus. So at this time, we do have that. So encouraging everybody, we could take the, uh, the vaccine. That's going to be probably the best thing that, that we could do. Um, you know, one of the threats is that our community seems to be dropping their guard a little bit, thinking that the vaccine, or especially when you hear people have taken the two vaccines, uh, talking about now can I take off my mask or I can integrate more, I can travel more, I'm a little, you know, I'm protected. Um, and that is to some extent that uh, someone that's taken the vaccine would not, can be, uh, catch COVID, obviously. Uh, but uh, they're not going to be in a severe crisis or going to the hospital, the likelihood. And as far as I know, uh, there have not been any cases of someone taking the vaccine uh, twice, the shot, and, 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 and dying uh, because of COVID. So extremely excited about that. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you won't pass it to others who, who have not taken the vaccine. And so that's, to me, a, a, a huge threat for people to believe that we're out of the woods. I want to remind you that this week, and um, it's I know it comes from two, three months prior, but we had 164 deaths reported over the past week. 164 deaths reported over the past week. Uh, it, it, I don't think we should ever, ever take that as we're getting into the 2,000 uh, individuals who have died. We cannot forget that. We can never forget that because that is what's going to drive us to do the right things going forward. If we don't forget that, that's why we're going to keep our mask on. That's why we're going to have social distancing and washing our hands and doing everything that we need and all the protocols. Please keep that in mind. It's not that we're getting better and plateauing. We have to remember that we don't want to get into this situation uh, ever, ever again. Uh, we also, our threat is the amount of vulnerable population not being reached, uh, working extremely hard. I know each one of the commissioners, uh, when they have their discussions, they're all working very, very hard at trying to make sure that we reach these, uh, uh, these individuals. Uh, the other one I, I think we, have, uh, we need to look at, and I just mentioned that, is a continued saturation of the fertilities management system. Uh, extremely, extremely important that we realize that any peak, any if we uh, have any spike, uh, the first one that's going to be back into a really difficult situation is a fertilities management system that we have. As it's getting better, we're still, even to this day, to this day, we're still struggling. And so we need to make sure that we understand uh, you know, if we do have a spike, uh, that's going to be a continued threat for us. Uh, obviously, the possible spike with resources diminishing, uh, we're having, uh, if we had a spike, uh, we've let go of external healthcare workers, we've let go of tents, we've demobilized the convention uh, center hospital, and it's something that you have to do as you plateau, you have to do those things because you can maintain pain and, 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 and the expenses that go with waiting to see if there's a spike or not. So it's a sort of a, a catch-22 situation as we're releasing the resources. If we were to have a spike at the same time, you, you're, we're going to have quite a challenge. Uh, the healthcare workers, one of the other threats that I see that it's extremely important is that a lot of the healthcare workers um, and I want to remind you that um, at, at, one, at one time, uh, we became, uh, the Commissioner's Court and hopefully myself, uh, we became very, very strong advocates of healthcare workers, but they went through such a difficult time that they begin to think about other careers, uh, their vulnerability of going in back to their homes, uh, you know, didn't have all the full support and understanding of the community as to what they were going through. Uh, what we don't want is our healthcare workers uh, looking for other careers uh, because of, of, of how difficult it was for them during the pandemic. Uh, so very concerned about that. I do work with the um, with the healthcare associ of the nurses association. Uh, it's a great group. Uh, and I'm very fortunate that I continue to work with them and continue to be their advocate to make sure that we find ways and and, and resources to keep them motivated. Uh, keep them wanting. It's a beautiful career. I know they love their careers, uh, but I, I still want to make sure that um, that we understand that uh, that's a vulnerable situation for us at this point in time. Not having 
uh, external healthcare workers and our, you know, our healthcare workers choosing other careers uh, in the future uh, could be detrimental uh, to to us. Uh, and then finally, uh, just as a uh, humanitarian support on the weather, uh, we did, did have a, a, the Texas Division of Emergency Management uh, has notified us that there's a large shipment of, you know, of, of, of meals and water that would be coming our way. I actually reached out to the uh, county judges because I thought uh, getting a shipment coming from uh, uh, Fort Worth over here, while well, there is such dire needs that we really needed to understand uh, what would be the best. But I believe at this time, um, they, they'd rather have that shipment come to El Paso. Um, I've reached out to to some of the um, uh, the board the, the board at the uh, at our food shelter, and and to Susan uh, through the board uh, as maybe a possibility of using. Of this particular shipment uh, to be earmarked for for uh, for our situation with the uh, homeless uh, situation with uh, our migration uh, challenges that we have and sort of earmark this large shipment uh, for that. Uh, but I'll be reaching out to the commissioners to to see what they feel is the best approach to this. So I want to thank you. I know it was lengthy, uh, but I think periodically we almost have to figure out where are we at. Uh, strategically and, and uh, like I said periodically I'll do a SWOT analysis from my perception from my vantage point um, and then uh, Betsy will continue to help me to look at what are some of the things that we do uh, with respect to our strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats so uh, once again uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to uh, to talk about these uh, very important um, uh, situations uh, Betsy Yes, sir. I yes, do sir. believe we have um, Chief Rodriguez and Dr. Ocaranza on the line. Thank you. Good morning, Judge Dr. Commissioner. Dr. Ocaranza? I'll share my screen so I can go through the dashboard. Uh, hopefully, people can see the dashboard. And uh, Thank you very much, Judge, for that insightful uh, summary of what is happening, why we need to be very concerned and, and still protect ourselves and, and each other by wearing the mask, by not forgetting about the distancing, because we're still uh, time away from reaching that point that we're able to do other activities or not wearing the mask. Even if people are immunized, we're still recommending people wearing the mask and, and especially if they want to wear double mask also, that is another recommendation that has been going out for people to be better protected. We have reached a milestone in which we can, we had a, over 120,000 positive cases. That means one in every seven uh, members of our community have been infected with the COVID-19. And as you mentioned, uh, people have more often been infected or we know somebody that has been in the hospital or unfortunately people have passed away from the COVID-19 and the complications. Uh, one thing that is extremely important and, and I congratulate uh, the court and the judge and all the leadership about the broadband accessibility because not only is going to be given critical infrastructure to those students but also to those people that cannot travel to get their health care needs and people that have put for later all those preventive uh, health care visits that are life-saving and that is very important and definitely I want to echo what the judge was saying in regards to that. The testing has also uh, decreased in the demand, although they still continue to do testing within the schools as another layer of protection to the students and the teachers. The hospitalization has seen a plateau, although we've seen a very slight downward trend on the hospitalizations in our trauma service area. It is currently at 16.87. On the positive cases, I want to mention that we're seeing a downward trend but that's, we still need to be very careful and not take it as the, we already won the, this battle against COVID-19. We still need to be out on the look for not uh, 
engage in those opportunities that can get us infected. There's still a lot of people that might be considered susceptible. So we don't want to give that chance to the virus to get to those people that are susceptible and that are considered to be at risk. On the case fatality rate also has remained stable and we continue to confirm uh, COVID related deaths even though it is a very lengthy and labor intense process. We will continue to process that as we see that we still have a large number of uh, deaths on the review. And the good thing is that on the population that are considered to be at risk, which are the congregate facilities, it's only 0.4% of the cases that are coming from those facilities, which is great. We continue to be very conservative in the way that we approach uh, those congregate settings because we know that there's a possibility that they can be large uh, clusters or large outbreaks in those facilities, which we don't want to have. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any, any questions. Thank you, Dr. Ocaranza. Appreciate your partnership. Very important. Chief. Thank you, Judge. Hi, thank you, Doc. Uh, good morning, Judge and Commissioners. Just a brief overview. So we continue on our emergency operations response. Uh, EOC is still activated, uh, responding to this pandemic. Uh, I'll, I'll just touch base very quickly on these other points. Our epidemiology contact tracing continues. Uh, we hit a, a benchmark, uh, like the, Dr. O mentioned, we hit 1 million tests uh, as a community collectively since we started testing back on March 23rd of last year. Last week, we averaged 35,000 tests uh, for the entire week with a 5,100 daily average uh, for last week as well. So uh, we still have plenty of plenty, uh, testing resources available for the community. So we urge them to continue to take advantage of that resource. Our compliance task force uh, continues to provide uh, compliance efforts out in the community. Uh, that is still an ongoing operation. Our isolation and quarantine hotel support as well for our first responders and general population and vulnerable populations continues. In respect to the COVID vaccine uh, distribution, uh, so at this point we have been allocated 194,000 uh, total doses have been allocated to El Paso County. For week 10, we received 31,425. Uh, of that, we had 12,925 that were first doses and a larger amount of second doses since uh, uh, those first doses that were done several weeks back are now due. So we received a larger allocation of second doses, which puts us at 18,500. Uh, we have uh, so far uh, had uh, 113,149 first doses that have been administered to the community uh, and, five, and 56,818 have been fully vaccinated. Our vaccination rate still can, continues to lead the state. We're at 99% uh, vaccination rate. We're also leading the state. And when you look at the larger jurisdictions throughout the uh, throughout Texas, we're at 8.88% at of uh, those that are 16 years of age and older that are fully vaccinated. So we continue to do a, a tremendous job. And just to echo your, your, your comments and, and your conversations with Commissioner Garcia, uh, you know, Paso really is uh, leading uh, in all our efforts and, and in part uh, through the collaborations between UMC and the city uh, with all of our vaccination hubs. So in, in respect to vaccination hubs, uh, we announced last week our convention center hub is, is operational. That came online last Wednesday. We did a soft opening. Uh, and this is, again, in preparation for larger vaccines that we, do, we hope we will get from the state. And that's going to help leverage uh, not only the George Perry location, but also uh, our West Side Super Senior drive through that we've also uh, set up and have been operating for the last two weeks. Uh, that, uh, specifically working with those super seniors that are 75 years of age and, and older. So we continue those efforts. And UMC, uh, again, uh, continues to do a great job uh, at their uh, County Coliseum. Uh, hub location. So I think between all these sites where we're, we're, we're going to continue to lead the state. Uh, in terms of our call center, uh, we've added additional staff, uh, with additional technology where we can queue callers. So right now we, we've had vast improvements. We're, we're seeing anywhere between a three to seven minute wait time uh, for individuals seeking 
assistance on, on uh, any questions regarding uh, COVID or vaccines. Uh, we also have uh, the ability to register individuals for their appointments. Uh, for second dose appointments, we are still uh, contacting uh, individuals uh, personally to, to ensure that they have their appointments set up. Uh, we had a delay in second dose uh, vaccines uh, a couple weeks back, so we're, we're working on catching up uh, to those individuals. So we ask the community to, to continue to be patient. For registration outreach, uh, we, we, we touched on this um, last week as well, but we have our senior center outreach uh, to help uh, continue to uh, work with those individuals that are 65 years of age and older to help with uh, registrations. We're doing the door-to-door single -door, uh, body inter intervention that continues. Uh, we're also working uh, through the county's meals program uh, to try to target homebound individuals to help them with their registrations as well. Uh, we are collaborating with the Promotora support uh, as well. Our, our we are also offering community presentations to community groups if they're willing to, if they want information on the vaccine and registration, we can offer that. And we're also uh, uh, touching base with all of our businesses. We have our education task force going out and, uh, and leaving flyers and, and just, uh, again, providing more visibility for the community uh, in the businesses that they visit. Our, uh, our, our Staten COVID clinic uh, continues to, to be in operation. That's a walk-in uh, clinic where people are individuals uh, in that community can, that, that gets a lot of foot traffic can go in and get, uh, and can sign in, get more information about the vaccine so they can, they, they can get that assistance there. So that continues. Our flu uh, preparedness vaccine is still ongoing, uh, even even with all of the coordination for the uh, for the COVID vaccine. Uh, at this point, we've done 38,200 uh, flu uh, vaccinations with, without the community, and we continue those efforts. Uh, on our hospital surge, we still have uh, a good amount of external staff still assigned to the hospitals. Uh, 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 like the judge mentioned, some of those are being demobilized slowly. Uh, as, as, as our hospitalization rate continues to go down. So uh, with that, I'll, I will I will turn it back and uh, we're, me and Dr. O are available for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief. And, and I'll be reaching out to you on uh, <clears throat> that proposal. Uh, you, you've been extremely helpful in understanding all the moving parts, uh, but I would like uh, your assistance on that proposal to work with uh, Maria and Jacob, myself, and and, and try to figure out, you know, um, like I said, uh, she says, if you could show uh, that you're targeting a certain group and that you have the capacity and uh, that uh, she would be really, would really push hard for us to get additional. So that, to me, that's uh, exciting yes, news, but uh, we will need Absolutely. your expertise. So thank you, Chief. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Betsy? Judge, did you want to continue this item, finish it up, and then, um, or did you want to move on and come back to it? Well, I know we have one uh, uh, that we discussed in our in my review this morning with legal. Uh, did we have something in in executive that needed to be seen in the morning versus the afternoon? The item you have an executive that you also have a regular agenda item on concerns UMC. Um, so I didn't know if you wanted to finish this item up and then go to UMC and go to executive as well. Yeah, I'd like to do that. If you, the commissioners don't mind, if you could wait on your presentations uh, when we get back, uh, so we could go through, um, you know, be able to you know, to look at these two items uh, quickly. Uh, I don't know, commissioners, any concerns with doing that? Sure, I'm okay with it. Okay, thank you. Okay, Betsy, go ahead and let's do it this as you proposed. Okay, so we're gonna close out this item and go, um, we'll come back to it and we will go to item number eight. That is correct, uh-huh. Item number eight from the regular agenda. Receive a quarterly report from Mar Jacob Sintron, President and Chief Executive Officer of the El Paso County Hospital District and take appropriate action. Thank you. Uh, and Chief and morning, Dr. Uh, sorry, we didn't apologize. Okay. I didn't uh, 
give you your farewell, but uh, thank you for joining us uh, uh, and, um, and and being available as you are. So thank you. Uh, Jacob? Jacob. This is uh, Jacob C. Thron, uh, president and CEO of the El Paso County Hospital District. We'll be reporting on our quarter ending through December, plus a couple of some brief highlights. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So this is one of the new programs that we started in, in partnership with the city and EMS. This is called the ET3 program. And really this is, uh, uh, stands for the Emergency Triage, Treat, and Transport that's uh, started as a federally funded program through CMS as a voluntary five-year payment model. And what it does is it provides greater flexibility for our ambulance care teams to address emergency health care needs of yeah. Medicare people service beneficiaries. It also allows uh, to continue to pay for the transport of Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries to a hospital emergency department uh, to the EMS department. But it also, in addition to that, allows us to uh, provide transport to an alternative destination partner, such as a primary care office, an urgent care clinic, or a community mental health center. Or, secondly, to initiate and facilitate treatment in place with a qualified health care partner either at the scene of the 911 emergency response or via telehealth. We have uh, dedicated five nurse practitioners that will be working with the uh, city EMS program to uh, continue this program as a, as a model. Going on to the next slide, we also uh, were recognized for the National Surgical Excellence uh, Award. Uh, this is a uh, a recognition as, as a meritoriously performing hospital. We're only one of uh, only 88 in the nation to receive this recognition. It's done through the American College of Surgeons National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, and it was announced in October of 2020 that UMC had meritoriously performed in the as an uh, American College of Surgeons uh, NISQIP hospital. We are the largest public hospital on the U.S.-Mexico border and the only such hospital along the border to receive this recognition. We received it in two areas, the all cases meritorious list and the high risk meritorious list. We go to the next slide. At Children's, uh, El Paso Children's uh, Hospital, we've had a, a couple of uh, things that we wanted to talk about. One is neurosurgery. Uh, the cranial and facial clinic at the El Paso Children's Hospital is a program that's uh, the first and only comprehensive uh, program in the region. It provides a dedicated multidisciplinary team of physicians skilled in correcting facial, jaw, and skull abnormalities. And the, it's the only cranial and facial team in the region to be region nationally recognized by the American Cleft Palate Craniofacial Association. Additionally, in May of 2019, we had the pleasure of welcoming a double, doubly boarded uh, certified pediatric and adult neurosurgeon to our team, and that's Dr. David Jimenez. He provides uh, pediatric neurosurgery services, the only one within a 350-mile radius. The neurosurgeries performed at El Paso Children's increased by 87% in the first year of uh, Dr. Jimenez's arrival. And with both programs, it is no longer necessary for families to bear the burden of traveling outside of the region to access this service. And the Children's Hospital team provides family-centered compassionate <clears throat> care that you would expect from a children's hospital. Additionally, in the next slide, uh, Children's Hospital received the reaccreditation of the Level 4 Neonatal Intensive Care Unit. It was reaccredited for three years. It's one of the highest levels of neonatal care in the region. And then uh, <clears throat> secondly, you know, it has, uh, it it has uh, been reaccredited for two years by the American College, the College of American Pathologists as well, and something they're very proud of. And then we go to the next slide. El Paso Health, uh, as a member of the district, has also uh, initiated these programs. One is Food from the Heart, and that is really designed to, uh, during the 2020 lockdowns, to help many of the members uh, that belong to El Paso Health as clients who lost jobs and income 
and provided them the ability to buy enough food to feed their families. Under the El Paso Health Stay Safe pandemic, they also assembled kits with essentials such as masks, hand sanitizers, wipes, gloves, a thermometer, and more, and these are being provided to all new members. And then they also do the Virtual Connect program, which allows for uh, some form of telehealth that allows case managers to connect uh, with the family virtually and to assess their mental and physical well-being. If we go to the next slide, something they did that they were very proud of, as we are, is they also uh, held a health, uh, El Paso Health December holiday dinner distribution, where they delivered 120 complete holiday dinner baskets to members and families that were in need. If we go to the next slide. This uh, briefly just outlines the many contributions UMC and El Paso Children's received from the uh, UMC El Paso Children's Foundation through uh, the period from October to December. As you can see, uh, they continue to work hard despite this pandemic and being able to help us provide needs for our, our community and our children's hospital in UMC. Next slide will be covered, uh, next few slides by Ruben Vogt, our Government Relations uh, Director. Good morning, Judging Commissioners, and happy belated birthday to Commissioner Stout. We wanted to provide you all a very brief overview of some of the government relations items as mentioned by Mr. Cintron. On the federal side, the administration will more than likely continue the public health emergency through 2021, and we mention this because it's important to the district as it helps with our Medicaid funding. In terms of the next COVID-19 relief package, we are working closely with Congresswoman Escobar and ensuring that it addresses the district's needs. Chief among them is ensuring that we uh, have additional funding for the Provider Relief Fund, which supports healthcare entities like ours. Michael Nunez will go ahead and speak to this a little bit more, but we're projecting that the funds that we have received thus far will be exhausted by March or April. That's at least what we're estimating. Uh, hence, it's important for us to replenish that fund now um, to ensure that hospitals like ours continue to get the support that they need, especially given the fact that we continue with our vaccination program and seeing the pretty significant numbers of COVID patients in the hospital. On the state side, as you are aware, the 87th legislative session is well underway. The district is tracking 580 bills, and here are a few items that we wanted to bring to your attention. First, Senator Blanco will be filing legislation that will allow the district to use a broker to sell district property as is already allowed for counties and the Dallas County Hospital District. Our bill, bill mirrors what the Dallas County Hospital District passed during the 85th legislative session. Through the bill, a broker is required to list the track of real property for at least 30 days on multiple listing services, after which we can sell that to the most advantageous offer. By working directly with a broker, we're not only maintaining transparency in the process, but also making it more efficient. Next, our Medicaid Managed Care Organization, El Paso Health, which Jacob just spoke about, along with community health plans across the state, are being targeted by a private insurance company that has been pushing to remove the state statute that awards state contracts to community health plans, as well as placing arbitrary requirements that would limit how community health plans operate. They are doing this through riders in the appropriations bills that are moving forward, and this would be incredibly harmful to all their community health plans. We're working closely with our delegation and our associations on this specific issue. In terms of taxpayer-funded lobbying, we're currently monitoring legislation that would limit the use of taxpayer funds for lobbying purposes. This is not the first time that legislation has been proposed around this issue, and we're working very closely with the county to ensure that we, along with you, can continue to advocate for the needs that are important for our community. Aside from that, we're also working with the county to monitor any legislation that would reduce the percentage of appraised values and the rollback tax rates for political subdivisions like hospital districts. We know that the county had an issue with that last session, and uh, we are working to ensure the hospital district is an impact of this session. Lastly, we're also working to preserve funding for critical health care programs, add-on payments, and Medicaid funding that are critical to the hospital by watching what is occurring in Article 2, which is the Health and Human Services part of the budget. Uh, if, I'm happy to answer any questions now or at the end of the presentation. But with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Mr. Nunez to discuss some upcoming changes to the state health care funding mechanism. Thank you, Ruben. Good morning, uh, County Judge, and also uh, uh, all the commissioners. On next slide here on slide 10, an update on the Medicaid 1115 waiver. 
Uh, this was initially approved back in 2011 and was set to expire September 30 of 2022. Uh, recently, CMS and, and, and the State of Texas Health and Human Services Commission did extend and uh, did get an extension approval through September 30th of 2030. Uh, right now, uh, what it is targeted is to preserve, you know, potential annual Medicaid expenditures of about 11.4 billion. Some of the key elements of the of the extension are is that one, it, it maintains the uncompensated care program that we know today, the UC program statewide. It is about 3.9 billion. It will have the ability to be resized twice, one in 20 federal fiscal year 2023 and then also federal fiscal year 2028. Next slide. One of the new programs, uh, the, it's called Directed Payment Program, uh, known as a Comprehensive Hospital Increase Reimbursement Program, uh, and the state is calling it this CHIRP. Uh, this is about $5 billion annually. Uh, this will be replacing the current Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment Program, otherwise known as DISRIP, that, extent, uh, that expires September 30 of 2021, and that's currently about $2.5 billion annually. It will also replace what's known as the Network Access Improvement Program, otherwise known as NAEP. Uh, this will end September 30 of 2027 for public hospitals, and this is about $493 million annually. Next slide. The next couple of slides, we just wanted just to quickly illustrate uh, the, uh, the operation uh, particularly since October, as, uh, when the when the COVID uh, uh, surge hit us both both for UMC and also El Paso Children's. Now the slides here, the the red is for a federal fiscal year 20, uh, R21, and the yellow or the orange is is, a, is fiscal year 2020. You'll see that the emergency room visits for both UMC and El Paso Children's, when when the epidemic hit back in April, fell up you know fell sharply. In UMC side, we were able to recover. And yes, we did have a spike in October where we hit 6,369, largely due to the COVID patients, but you'll see them in the, in the months thereafter, November, December, uh, that, those, uh, that those ER visits uh, 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 fell off. Next slide. Now, because a lot of uh, UMC hospitals admissions do come through our, uh, through our ER, you'll see that even though that the that the emergency rubits did drop off, you'll see that the uh, case mix index, and this is a measure of how sick our patients are for both UMC and El Paso children, that has grown historically high on both sides. You'll see at UMC in October, we went, we went up to 1.76, in December still 1.85, and children's as well, 1.95. So what this is telling us is that the patients that are in the hospital currently right now are more sick. And you'll see that on the next slide, which talks about our average length of stay. Normally, UMC, we've been between four to four and a half to five days average length of stay, but since October, we've been at 6.08, went up to 7.3, and currently 6.77. And you'll also see on the children's side uh, that they are currently between 6.6 .6 and about 7.4. Those are a couple of, of slides that we wanted to illustrate the operations as to what has happened. Uh, both at UMC and El Paso Children over the past uh, past several months. I'll, I will now turn it over back to, oh, one more slide. Next slide. Ruben uh, talked about the, the CARES Act funding that we did receive, and I wanted to update uh, uh, as to where both uh, UMC and El Paso Children are currently. UMC did receive $42 million in CARES Act funding last year. We have currently recognized about $30 million uh, primarily through COVID-19 expenditures, meaning that we have a deferred revenue of, of $12 million as of December 31st. El Paso Children's, they received $21 million. They have recognized $9 million of it, primarily through lost revenues and a little bit in COVID-19 expenditures, and they too have deferred revenue of about $12 million. Our current projections for both hospitals do indicate that the current deferred revenue uh, will probably be exhausted by about the March or April timeframe if there's no additional CARES Act funding, uh, uh, you know, that is provided to, to hospitals and also to UFC and to El Paso Children's. With that, I will turn it over back to Jacob. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, now we're going to talk about our COVID-19 response. Sorry. Nessie, go ahead, Jacob. 
Okay. <clears throat> so, in terms of our uh, community patient care at the campus, uh, we began to see really a strong surge in October, uh, November, and December. As you can see, in October, we had, uh, you know, 3,627 patients uh, that had COVID, or an average of 117 a day. November, that jumped to 6,088, or an average of 203 a day. And then in December, it dropped to 3,207, yet still an average daily uh, census of 103. Currently, we have 75 COVID patients in the hospital. So while that is good news, uh, it is still much higher than what we would like to see. We have worked internally and externally as we opened up a critical uh, capacity. We were able to increase our bed count to about over 400 beds. We did this in terms of not only the IT buildup in terms of our Cerner system, we also worked really hard in terms of our teletracking and telehealth programs, getting the physical beds, oxygen regulators, suction regulators, uh, uh, nursing staff, and resuscitative equipment. Our human resources were successful in onboarding 185 FEMA healthcare staff in one week. And uh, we built, uh, as you know, temporary locations for tents deployed by the state in record time and also expanded and converted other areas within the hospital to increase bed capacity. We'll go to the next slide. This talks about our testing and, you know, our UMC regional laboratory began testing for COVID in April of 2020. And from April of 2020 to January of 2021, UMC has tested or, and or sent out 34,540 COVID-19 tests. We also uh, have a clean cube, which was assigned out to the Isleta Clinic to aid in terms of COVID testing. And from June 1st, when we first got it, to uh, February 11th of this year, we've done about 2,784 COVID tests. We also purchased COVID testing analyzers and we began testing for COVID uh, in areas such as the emergency department uh, within the hospital, our clinics, and the uh, corrections facilities, as well as uh, our employees. And we did it through three uh, pieces of equipment. One is the BioFire that can do 126 tests a day, the Hologic Panther that can do 500 a day, and the Abbott Rapid Toucher that can do 96 a day. We go to the next slide. This sort of gives you a, a graphical representation of the number of tests we've done <clears throat> with uh, the, the uh, different months, October, November, December. And in terms of the, the graph on the right, it breaks it down by the particular testing uh, equipment that we use, the uh, BioFire, Panther, and Quest, as well as the Abbott system. We go to the next slide. This is the clean cube numbers that we've seen, and as we mentioned before, uh, we've been using this for uh, COVID testing, and it's been a big help. Given that our Slater Clinic is uh, a very busy clinic and space is limited, this allowed us a, a temperature-controlled environment that can do drive-up or walk-up testing for COVID. We'll go to the next slide. You'll see here, both in the county as, as well as within the district, uh, the <clears throat> number of cases that we received, and you can see that in April, uh, the county had 802 cases, and then you see the big jump in July to 12,750, but then note in November, 76,000 cases, and then February 1st, 114, so it's been a cumulative growth, and you can see the number that have been hospitalized and how it began to peak uh, in October, November, and December. And this continues uh, even uh, at the district as we reflect a, a portion of that kind of growth. If we go to the next slide. We want to talk about our vaccine initiative. So this provides you a, a timeline of when the state first began its vaccine effort uh, all the way through the current operation UMC has at the Coliseum. So when we did this plan to become a hub, the state gave us three hours to, to provide that to commit to being a hub, which we did. And we uh, had the plan in place and were op uh, operational on January 11th. And then we expanded our efforts to move the vaccine to the 
uh, from the hospital tents over to the Coliseum. And that was really a, a big game changer for us. We'll go to the next slide. This is a, a slide that the state provides that shows where we are. Currently, the state, as well as El Paso, is in an area of limited supply. We're currently doing phase 1A and 1B uh, population groups, uh, healthcare workers, and individuals that are uh, 65 and older without an underlying condition, or those that are 16 to 64 with an underlying condition. Uh, we are still short, as you know, in terms of supply, and certainly the, the weather that occurred in uh, Texas this last week didn't help with a lot of uh, uh, supply deliveries interrupted. Additionally, we know that Moderna had a, a manufacturing issue that they had to work on. They, they, they feel that they've gotten that resolved. Nonetheless, many, uh, many of the uh, hospitals and hubs were still waiting for their second dose vaccine as well as first dose vaccine supplies such that a couple of weeks ago the state asked that no second doses be scheduled until we physically have the second dose vaccine in hand, given that there were supply and logistical issues where they could not guarantee what day we would get our second dose in. We'll go to the next slide. This is also a slide provided by the state, and it gives you the location of uh, all the hubs. There are 85 hubs across the state. They are currently not opening any new hubs. But if you look at the hubs, uh, you'll see a lot of hubs on the eastern half of the state compared to the western half. But to Judge Samaniego's point, on a per capita basis, El Paso has received uh, its fair share, if not more, in terms of vaccine allocation for our population. And for that, we're very thankful. We'll go to the next slide. This will show you how the states, uh, in recognition of trying to get more of the 75 and older population vaccinated, they're pushing and asking that we pull some of our vaccine to focus in that area. You see that El Paso in the, in the green shade is very consistent with the majority of uh, the large metropolitan areas in the state of Texas. We'll go to the next slide. We're gonna talk about our super senior priorities. As you know, the state has asked recently that all hub sites uh, set aside 20% of their vaccines for anyone that's 75 and older. We had already done this ahead of the guidance and we're all, have already been setting aside vaccines for those that are 75 and older and uh, have been increasing that percentage above the 20%. We also set aside hundreds of additional doses of vaccine for outlying communities in the far east and far west, El Paso to cover areas such as Vincent, Canotillo, Westway, Tornillo and Fagans and we are using our existing databases to focus only on those that are 75 and older. Going forward, we'll hear about uh, more of our successful partnerships with our community partners. Uh, Judge Samaniego mentioned one that uh, he brought to the table with uh, Desert Imaging last week that are interesting, interested in letting us use their vehicles and their drivers to be able to get more mobile uh, activity out into the areas uh, certainly that we're looking at, such as, uh, you know, northeast, uh, far west, far east locations. And so we're currently working with their leadership in looking at the logistics of being able to do that to include, you know, uh, not only just doing regular flu vaccines, but also, uh, and, and regular COVID testing, but also COVID vaccine. And as you know, we're getting the Pfizer vaccine, which has very specific temperature control that's sensitive to sunlight. So we're validating not only how do we transport the vaccine in these mobile units, but how many can we do at a particular site in a particular day. But clearly it will help us get out to some of the more uh, rural uh, areas that need this uh, as, as well. We continue to ask for larger allotments uh, of the vaccine, not only for super seniors, but our whole community. I think every community in the state and in the country has complained that there hasn't been enough supply. And so we're hoping that uh, with manufacturing, as it continues to improve, that we'll be able to get more of the vaccine supply to our community. If we can then move on to the next slide. This shows you uh, some of the uh, state allotments of the district on a weekly basis, and it shows how uh, for weeks one through 10, how many 
uh, allocations were received in the city as well as how many to the district. We'll go to the, and you'll see in the upper uh, right-hand photo the uh, Coliseum that was set up as a mass vaccination site. And it has a clean layout that uh, really makes our, our vaccine distribution so much more efficient. The next few slides are provided, actually, we took them from the uh, city of El Paso. Go to the next slide, please. Thank you. This shows how El Paso rates to other Texas border cities. And so as you can see in the green bar, uh, with at least one dose, El Paso is tied with uh, Cameron County in terms of uh, vaccine allocation. For those that are fully vaccinated, both first and second dose, we are at 7.5%, which is higher than the other counties listed. And uh, if you look at the total doses administered of the all the allocation, uh, we are at 95.4%, with Cameron County at 98.1%. We'll go to the next slide. This compares us to, uh, let me see, let me go back one, hang on, hang on a second. This compares us to the uh, Texas uh, overall vaccine allocation. And as you can see with at least one dose, uh, the state of Texas is at 13.1%, El Paso is at 16.7%. Fully vaccinated with the first and second dose, El Paso is at 7.5%, the state is at 5.2%. In doses administered, as I mentioned earlier, El Paso is at 95.4%, the rest of the state is at 78.3%. In the next slide, we'll see how we rank with other large Texas cities. And again, in first dose, we're at 16.7%, the highest among the other large Texas counties. We're also higher than in terms of the first and second dose, and we're higher in terms of the doses administered. We'll go to the next slide. This will show a layout of the Coliseum flow diagram. And for this, we're thankful uh, to Brian Kennedy and his his logistical mind, along with our industrial engineers, our clinic staff, and our nursing staff, and pharmacy staff that work on making this conversion a success. Because of this, we were able to decrease uh, uh, our, our wait time by two-thirds from two and a half hours to 45 minutes. We have shared this with uh, our other partners in the city and are very proud of how efficient this is working, not only with the internal flow for pedestrian walk-ins, but also for the drive-up. With this process, we can do 3,000 a day, seven days a week, or 21,000 a week if we had the, the, the supply. With about a two or three week notice uh, of increased vaccines, we could increase this to do 35,000 a week. So we're very uh, happy with this land and the way it works. We'll go to the next slide. Here's where the problem is. It's the vaccine availability versus the demand. So we know that people are anxious to get this. This is a national issue. And the changes that the state now have facilities needing to order their second dose. Before it was just automatically ordered. And uh, because of that, and because of some of the logistical challenges, both due to weather and manufacturing, we have been asked not to even schedule the second dose until we have it physically in hand. So we continue to work with our suppliers, our manufacturers, and the state to try to get these second doses delivered within the required time frame so that those that have gotten the first dose and are due their second dose are able to get it on a timely basis. We go to the next slide. As was mentioned also uh, before by Judge Samaniego, the uh, Johnson & Johnson is the third major vaccine that we're hoping to get soon. It is a single dose. And while its efficiency is listed as 60%, they've stated that it is 100% effective as it relates to avoiding hospitalization and avoiding mortality. So this is a very important, certainly much easier as a single dose. We know that once approved, J&J &J has said that they still need to build up more supply. Quite uh, not there yet, but uh, once approval, they'll, they'll open that stream up. We we'll go to the next slide. In terms of the primary care successes, as we know, uh, in the beginning, uh, we quickly moved to opening up our telehealth uh, process. And from that, we have done uh, in October, November, December, respectively, 
5,600, 7,000, and 6,500 telehealth visits a month. January, we did 5,500, and so uh, this has been a big help for those that either are afraid to come to a clinic or a hospital or lack transportation, uh, and so this affords them an opportunity to be able to get their health care needs done via telehealth. We've also uh, seen, uh, you know, that in terms of the ability to do vaccinations, the Isleta East and West and Fagan Clinic have been uh, enrolled and approved for COVID vaccine uh, distribution. Now, unfortunately, what's happened is that the focus went back to the hubs and only uh, pro providing the volumes through the hubs. But as recently as a couple of weeks ago, the state has allowed us to pull some of our hub volumes of vaccines to move them to the Isleta, uh, I'm sorry, to the East, the, um, the Far West and the Fabens Clinic. We are looking at trying to move some more vaccine to the Isleta and the East Clinic as well. We go on to the next slide. This uh, mobile unit obviously was uh, due with really through the county, our commissioners and judge, and we thank you so much for it. Uh, this uh, vehicle will be used to uh, provide vaccines, uh, regular type A and B flu, COVID vaccines and other services. It is a beautiful unit. Uh, we've already used it in some parts of la the first day we used it at the Socorro Mission and we're able to do regular flu vaccines and hopefully soon we'll be able to do COVID vaccines. But this truly is due to the cooperation and the support from our county and for our leadership at the county. So we really thank you very much for this as this is gonna be an integral part for us to be able to get to the hard to reach areas uh, such as uh, Tordillo, uh, Fabens, and others to be able to provide care uh, either to those areas and in some cases directly to uh, older population centers such as adult daycares or uh, nursing homes. If we can go to the next slide. This basically outlines the potential areas that the mobile health clinic can attend. Uh, we've already had some dates scheduled for Tordillo, Socorro, and Horizon. We have a clinic in, in Fabens, but we'll be looking at doing some things possibly in Fabens and Clint, uh, certainly in Northeast, where we have a lot of uh, older population, veterans, Vinton, Canotillo, and Anthony as well. So as uh, we go to the next slide, that'll be the last slide. Uh, we see that there's a, obviously a lot more still to be done in our community, and we will be working with that. We have worked with the city, and other partners in being able to look and focus on how we can provide uh, uh, expedited use of the vaccine. Uh, much like the city, we have the capacity. We can do 21,000 at the Coliseum. We could do 35,000 at the Coliseum with a few weeks' notice. The challenge really is supply. But we're hoping, uh, with efforts being done at the federal level, with the manufacturers picking up more of their production, with a J and J vaccine possibly available soon, that as that increase uh, increases supply, that we'll get our fair share of it, so that that'll allow us to uh, start vaccinating our community to a much higher number than what we have been. And that concludes uh, our update. Uh, we're open for any questions any of you may have. Well, Jacob, first of all, just want to thank you. Uh, just been a tremendous partnership and. I'm always glad for these presentations because people forget that you're still doing, people still have heart attacks, people still have accidents, people still, you know, you're, it's one of the few that uh, COVID doesn't decrease your, your interactions. It actually increases it and then, you know, brings them to almost a different level. So just very proud of the partnership and the leadership you've taken, not only with us, but I think a great uh, conduit to the uh, private as well. Uh, so I thank you for that. Uh, uh, Ruben, welcome back. I'm glad to have you here back at the, at the commissioner's court. It's quite a, a pleasure and an honor. And Michael, as always, a great partnership and great presentation. So uh, Commissioner uh, Olguin, please. 
Thank you, Judge. Um, and thank you, Jacob, for um, the presentation. And um, I'd especially like to thank you for all of UMC's efforts to make sure that our outlying communities have access to vaccines, um, the, uh, that you were able to um, set aside some of your allocation for the Fabens Clinic to serve the communities of Fabens and Tornillo and Sanelli and Clint, and then of course the Westside Clinic as well. So thank you for that. Um, and I also wanna thank you for the mobile unit for sending it out. I saw in the last slide that it's in Tornillo this week um, and was in Socorro previously, but I was hoping you can give us a little bit more information on what the mobile unit is doing. From what I understand, if I'm understanding correctly, right now it's helping to register individuals for the COVID vaccine. Um, um, so I just wanted to make sure I understand exactly um, what, what the mobile unit is doing and how people can take advantage of that because it's a huge, I mean, as we've been talking about, even with the resolution we did on broadband connectivity, um, it's it's been a huge issue for folks out in the outlying parts of the county to be able to register. So I just want to make sure I understand and that everybody understands that the mobile unit right now that's out in Tornillo, um, how it is that people can go about getting uh, registered. Jacob. So, yes, sir. Go ahead. I'm oh, so, oh, sorry. So, uh, okay, I thought you were going to say something, Judge. So, first of all, uh, all the good that we do wouldn't be possible without your support, all of you. You make it possible. You provide us the resources we need to be able to take care of our community. So, uh, it'd be great to take credit, but the credit goes to not only uh, the commissioners, and you know what, uh, you are actively involved, every one of you. You talk to me about issues, you're concerned about your areas and the county as a whole. And so uh, that input is really important for us to make sure that we provide an effective program. I also want to thank our, our team here in terms of all the work they do, working seven days a week. Even when the college team has run out of vaccine, they are still working on getting other things done uh, for that area. As far as the mobile unit, currently when it was done or purchased, it was designed for COVID testing and flu vaccine, regular type A and B flu vaccine. That will continue. What we're trying to see now is how quickly could we set it up, along with the potential desert imaging, imaging vehicles that might be loaned to us to do the actual vaccine. So by being able to do that, the goal would be then, you know, we could do more vaccines clearly at the Coliseum and at the clinics, but there are areas that may be hard to reach, areas that may need transportation help that may not be available to them. So. We have the units, uh, the, the uh, mobile unit provided by the county uh, has the ability of the refrigeration unit for storing the Pfizer vaccine, which is probably of all the vaccines, the more delicate in terms of how cold it has to be, its sensitivity to satellite and so forth. So we're working right now logistically to be able to not only register people for, for the COVID vaccine, but to actually do the vaccine and while it may be in smaller numbers, what we're trying to determine is how many doses can we store in the vehicle, how many doses can we do in a day where we minimize wastage. And once that is done, then we'll be scheduling uh, its visit to some of the hard to reach areas. And probably the more effective ways will be either community centers or specific centers where we have a senior populations already there so that it makes it easy to get them uh, the vaccine at their site. And then we, if it's the two part vaccine, we would then go back for the second dose and apply those to those individuals. So I'm very much looking forward to that day when our mobile unit can start actually um, administering vaccines. But I guess in the meantime, I'm just trying to make sure I understand what the mobile unit is doing right now. So right now that it's in Tornillo, is it, from what I understand, folks can register? And I'm just wondering if you can talk about that. Like, do, do folks just go to where the mobile unit is? Or are you right now just doing that data collection um, for when the mobile unit is eventually going to be able to administer vaccines? That's just what I wanted to kind of clarify. Is it only a specific age group or is it anyone in that first group uh, you know the whether it's the 65 plus or the 75 plus or the folks with the chronic illnesses that can go to the mobile unit right now to register that that's kind of the information I'm asking about so <clears throat> right now the you know the goal is to register those that are in the 75 and older or 65 and older uh, to be able to get them registered and then once we know uh, and hopefully very, very soon that the unit can actually take uh, the, the vaccine to those individuals to schedule their first dose 
and then go back and then schedule the second dose. And the registration is important because it'll let us know how many people will we need to take vaccines for in that particular site. So we're getting their listing down to be able to determine if we get, say, 200 people at one particular location that can be vaccinated and the mobile unit can do 100 a day, for example, then we would know we would have to schedule two days at that site to cover the 200 people for the first dose and then set up an appointment system when we receive the second dose to go out there and do the second dose. But Jacob, according to Maria, they, they've actually have uh, provided the flu shot, right, in the mobile unit uh, last week, uh, starting, I think starting Thursday, they, they did do the flu shots, right? I thought Maria had mentioned uh, in our meeting that they had used a mobile unit for uh, flu shots. Uh, I believe that was for type A and B flu. Now, if I'm wrong, I think he is on the line. No, well, that's what I mean. Yeah. Well, that's what I meant. The uh, the regular flu shots were already being distributed through the mobile as sort of a testing ground kind of situation. I think that happened last week, right? Yes, this is, right. This is Maria. It has been oh, hi, out yeah. there and it is uh, doing flu shots. So right now, just like Jacob said, we're out there collecting information on the residents, how many, um, so that we can prepare for it. But right now it's giving education and providing flu shots. Yes. And can people just walk up to the mobile clinic? Is that, I'm assuming it's parked there at the community center in Pornillo, yeah. which is kind of the center of the community. So can people just walk up to the mobile unit yeah. if they see it? Yes, they can. Yes, Commissioner, yes. Wonderful, wonderful. And then I saw that y'all are still working on putting in the dates for some of the other areas like Clint and Montana Vista. Would you be able to share that information uh, with us, with all of the commissioner's court, just so that we know when the mobile unit is going to be going into the different areas? I know my office, like everybody else's, gets a, um, you know, a lot of inquiries and, and folks wanting to know, especially folks from the outlying areas, about when the unit might be available in their communities. Is there a way that you all could send us that schedule once you have it? Yes, we will. Thank We're you. I would appreciate that. that. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. As some of you might know, <clears throat> Commissioner Aguino is on the uh, board, so I'm sure you guys miss her a lot, but we get to keep her up here in Commissioner's Court, but I know you guys miss uh, uh, Commissioner Olguin on the board. Uh, I know she was very active, so I just want to point that out. I think, Commissioner Leon, you're, are you, uh, you're muted, but... No, it's I, Commissioner I, Stout that has... Oh, yes, okay, right. Commissioner Stout, please, thank you. Go ahead, Commissioner Stout. Thanks, Judge. Thank you, um, Jacob, Michael, and, and, and Ruben and Maria uh, for the presentation. Thank you, uh, Ruben, for the for the belated birthday wishes. Um, I, I have a, I have a couple of questions um, clarifying. So when you're talking about um, registering, because right now you're not registering in the, in the in the typical sense of registering, right? Right now it's basically either it's when you open when when you receive the vaccine. Typically, what you've done is announced to or, or through through certain medium uh, media uh, that the vaccine is going to be. Uh, you, you have a certain amount of vaccines, and you're opening. You're going to be opening up up, up uh, either the web portal or getting uh, you know taking phone calls uh, calls into the call center. And so, is that going to is that going to change now? Because when I hear you saying you're registering people, does that mean that uh, the people that you're registering are going to be, um, you're, you're going to be setting aside a certain amount of vaccine that's not going to be uh, distributed through the portal or through the phone calls. Uh, is it uh, the vaccine that you've set aside um, for the, the clinics that you've been kind of, that you've been peeling off and, and sending to the clinics? Um, can, you, can you clarify that for me, please? So what we're doing is, uh, for example, the vaccine that goes to the clinics, uh, both the Phaedon Clinic and the Northwest Clinic, are designed to take care of those patients that are in our database that are 75 and older, and then uh, also to focus on those that are 75 and older that want to register at the clinic, for example, that may, may want to get follow-up care at the, the clinic, and if they meet the criteria, and obviously age is the only criteria if you're 75 and older, to see when we get vaccine allocations to get you scheduled. In terms of the mobile unit, what's really going on there is that we're trying to determine 
if what is the capacity of the mobile unit to be able to handle uh, vaccines? How many can it handle in a day? And when it's going out to these far outreach areas to try to get a gauge of how many people would be interested that are the uh, that are older that we could then schedule whether it be one day, two days, three days at that location so that we have appointments set up because all the uh, all the vaccines that are being done are primarily through appointment to avoid uh, minimizing any any loss or wastage of, of the vaccine. As far as the, the regular scheduling system, you'll be able to, when we get vaccine confirmed in our hands, uh, we will then open the portal up for online registration. And I think the goal for this one, because recall, uh, you know, we, we didn't, we didn't, uh, we had a problem in getting our second doses last week. The state allowed us to use some first dose vaccine for second doses. So this week, the second dose comes in, we can use them for first doses. So what we're going to do is open uh, vaccines through the regular affordable registration. Uh, we continue to make improvements on that. We're also going to do the super senior portal registration uh, by telephone and online, and we've increased the number there for super seniors. And then for those that have no access to a computer, we've set that aside. So if you try to register online, uh, there's only so much allocated for that that's registered online. That does not take uh, into those that are that are set aside for those that are calling in. So for example, uh, week before last, we did the Super Senior Tuesday. We allocated 1,000 vaccines. We actually got 1,200 uh, registrants, 700 uh, uh, through the phone call, I'm sorry, through the online registration, 500 through the phone calls. So we did 1,200. So as we get more vaccine, we have more ways of being able to focus on super seniors that are 75 and older, those that are 65 to 74, and those that are younger than that with underlying conditions. So. Uh, I guess the, in a long-winded way to answer your question, uh, we will continue to use the portal both online and at call-in, as well as the clinics. Uh, this registering that's being done with a mobile unit is strictly only for the mobile unit when it gets the ability to do vaccines to go out in, in, in those areas with a set number of individuals that are interested in the vaccine to be able to take care of them. Okay. Um, I'm still, I'm still a little bit confused. I, I guess I'm, I guess, so today, if, 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 if somebody is in, is, if, if the mobile unit's in Tornillo today and you register somebody for the vaccine in the, tor in, in the mobile unit in Tornillo today, is that vaccine going to be taken from the allocation that you sent to the clinics or is, or is that vaccine going to be allocated from uh, the the larger group that you would be, um, I, I guess, uh, w would you be taking it from 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 the 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 vaccine that you're allocating for the for the hub? I, I I'm 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 still a little bit confused. I'm sorry. And right now, if I can just, uh, we're not so people are not being registered because we don't have vaccine right now as a first dose. So we're taking information of all the. The, the residents in that area so that when we do get an allocation either through the main hub and then we'll 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 sit down and say okay we can move this many over to the mobile medical unit this much to the okay. clinic so the state allowed us to do that um, but at this point okay. we're just getting information from the people that are coming in so that once we have that first dose available we can call them and set up appointments and then register them at that point um, but at this point okay. there is no Dose available. Okay, that's that 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 helps clarify my, my my question. And um, so when it when it comes to the, the the doses that are being sent to the clinics, um, how how soon do we anticipate having all of our our, our patients vaccinated with the, that are at the clinics? I mean, are, are, is that kind of is that just a long a long line? That's well. If you think about the number of patients, and we have, we see over 165,000 visits a year. Um, we'd have to look to see what the what number the patient panel is. But typically, a patient goes to the physician 
two or three times a year, right? So it's a, it's a large number. We could get that number of, of how many we've done already and the number of patients and registered patients with our clinics. Okay, I mean, I was just curious because I've, I know we've heard and talked about possibly, you know, after you have the patients vaccinated who are, who are you know, over 75 or who fall into the category of people that are being vaccinated now that you can use uh, the clinics for, um, for distribution of, of to, to just the public in general. And so I'm just kind of um, trying to get a picture of, <laughs> you know, what, what we're looking at in, in the way of uh, timeline on that. But I, I understand that it's, that it could be, I guess it could be a while because we're, um, uh, we need more vaccine. So um, one other, uh, one other, one other thing that I wanted to, to just suggest when it comes to um, the outreach to, to the public, uh, let them know where your mobile unit is going to be. And if you have the other ones come online that, that with the partnership with Desert Imaging is um, working, working with the, um, sharing that information with the Paso del Norte Health Foundation and the University of uh, Texas Houston, uh, El Paso, because they're out there working with promotoras. I think they have over 100 promotoras that, that may be able to provide that uh, information to folks too. So um, if you haven't thought of that, I'm sure you have, but I just wanted to bring it up. Um, and then and then I also just wanted to, to, to make sure that um, that we continue to uh, to emphasize, you know, the use of the use of data when it comes to um, looking looking at where we're targeting. I mean, I I, I, I understand we saw that there's a list of of, uh, of places where you're going to go. Is that is that based on on data that you all are looking at? For example, the 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 um, zip codes that that, uh, that may be the most in need, or um, or or how how are you deciding where to go first and where where actually to be? So first of all, you know, going back a little bit to a couple of comments made earlier. So the clinics are listed as as uh, authorized vaccine distribution sites. We have asked the state to allow us to do that. With the clinics, we could do 5,000 a week, just at the clinics. Uh, because of the vaccine limitation and because of the hub concept, we haven't gotten those. We're still hoping that one day, separate from the hub, it'll be able to get its allocated uh, doses. And with that, clearly we would have enough vaccine to not only do our patients, but to do others in that area as well. So that's our hope. And, and you're right, it is a, a function of, of supply. As far as uh, you know, the locations that we're looking at, you know, clearly, you know, we feel that the outlying areas are probably at risk because of the distance to many of the hubs. So going out uh, to those locations is important. And more than anything, that's driven by all of you in, in pointing out areas, uh, Commissioner Robinson talking about Northeast and uh, Super Senior Centers, or, uh, you know, uh, Commissioner Olguin talking about the Far East, uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Robinson also mentioned, you know, Benton and other areas. And so we know that those areas may not be getting enough uh, access to the vaccine. And that's how we're setting that up. Additionally, you know, we're looking at, you know, what is the, the proper distribution, uh, waiting to see data that shows, you know, by zip code on a per capita basis, you know, are we, what are the zip codes that may not be getting uh, enough representation and how do we get out there too? Clearly, is it a matter of then maybe moving those mobile units uh, to those locations to help set that up and, and, and get more uh, volume in there? The challenge is still not enough supply. I mean, it goes so fast. We had, uh, I think it was uh, 1,000 doses, and we had, uh, I think it was 12,000 uh, individuals that tried to log in for them. So it goes very fast. Truly, the issue is we need more volume. If we get more vaccine. It'll take us a little bit of time, but we'll be able to get it, you know, slowly try to catch up and then eventually get ahead of what we need. I, I appreciate that. And I, I mean, yeah, I, I just want to emphasize the use of the data um, so that we're not doing things um, that seem to be arbitrary, um, you know, because there there may be uh, a large group of people that, for example, are within the district that are within the precinct that I represent in Central El Paso that don't have a clinic near them that, that uh, don't have access to healthcare, 
and 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 are you know should be put on the same playing field as as, as everybody else. And so I mean I, uh, I I think day is the way to to, to go. And I, I know that y'all are, are are talking about using that data. Um, I just wanted the the uh, the public to be aware of, of of how things are working. Um, and then just one last thing, Judge. Sorry for for taking so long, but I, I just want to continue to advocate for. Um, just doing as much, just doing as as much as we can to to get access access to vaccinations for people that that don't have access to broadband or internet. We just had a a, a great resolution today talking about the the effects of uh, not having access to the internet and broadband, and so I think it's even more uh, you know important to highlight uh, that that uh, you know not everybody can can get into an internet portal, um, and and also I think uh, you know. There may be work to be done when it comes to the system, but through which we are using, by which we're using, or, or by which we are announcing uh, that we have the vaccine available, right? Uh, because I've seen it on social media, and I've seen it on on, on portals, and I and I I have seen the media, um, uh, you know, cover it, but not everybody has access to the to the internet. Not everybody even has not everybody has access to 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 the media to watch it. You know, they don't they may not be able to watch. Uh, the newscast, they, they maybe out working or, or or something like that. So we want to make sure that that we we're we're doing as much as we possibly can to give everybody an equal opportunity to to access the vaccine. And so if that means more, uh, you know, people being able to call in by phone, I think that's a good idea. Uh, you know, if, if that means more outreach, I think we can we can also. Try to try to work on that again. Working with the Paso de Norte Health Foundation, with the promotoras, uh, getting that information to them so that they know when we're going to have uh, the vaccine available, and then you know working with our media partners. And, and uh, you know I've I've uh, talked a lot about um, uh, transparency, and and you know they they can be helpful as well when it comes to uh, getting, of course, getting the 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 word out. But also we need to make sure that um, you know, a lot of them do good good work when it comes to looking at uh, the data and, and crunching the numbers and things like that. And so, uh, I feel like when we when we have um, requests for information from the media, that uh, we need to do our best to be as transparent as possible. Obviously, without you know, we don't want to get into uh, giving people's uh, personal information out or things like that. But um, you know, data about race and ethnicity and age and and also zip codes, I think, um, are important aspects for the public to be able to understand so that they can see, you know, so that this is a transparent process and that they can see where and what we're doing. Um, so the more transparency, the better. Uh, I, think that's, I, I think that's all uh, that I have, Judge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Leon, were you... Any comments or anything? No, no, just uh, in, in listening to all the comments that... Uh, Sometimes, uh, I'm sure you're well aware of it, uh, Jacob, that it doesn't take the mobile unit to go register people. So a lot of times uh, I know that you all are showing up in different locations, not necessarily in the big uh, mobile unit. And as uh, Commissioner Olguin mentioned, uh, we really need it in the Montana Vista Square Dance area. Uh, mm -hmm. Tremendous need, but you've all uh, discussed it already. Well, thank you. Well, Jacob and team, uh, thank you very much. Uh, amazing presentation, great uh, discussions, uh, uh, new things coming up. I also heard that uh, there was a, they were trying to test to see if uh, Pfizer didn't need as much refrigeration, and that'll come out uh, later, which is a logistic problem that we have because of the refrigeration. Uh, they're trying to see if there's uh, they're going to do further testing and if it could be brought out without that uh, the amount of refrigeration. Uh, because they hadn't tested that out. So a lot of the new things, you know, a lot of things that are out there that uh, hopefully when they all come together, we'll be in, in a much better situation. So uh, once again, uh, Jacob, uh, Ruben, and, and Michael, thank you very much. Uh, great job, and thank you for your partnership. Uh, I'm going to be reaching out to you on this proposal that was, uh, uh, that was asked by the commissioner uh, for us to be able to show that we can do certain capacity that we have the the healthcare workers and we have the mobile units and the clinics and so forth um, and it, she would push really hard to get additional 
uh, over and above whatever we get here in El Paso. As, as part of Biden's uh, focus on, on on the rural areas, President Biden's focus on the rural areas. So uh, I'll be reaching out to you and, and, and Maria and, and uh, Ruben uh, very quick. This afternoon, <laughs> Thank you, Judge. One, yeah, Commissioner uh, Stout. One more thing, I just wanted to see if if, if it's possible um, for UMC to to be part of our, our updates on a weekly basis, since they're you know doing a lot with the vaccinations, so that we have we don't have the city kind of speaking on behalf of the of UMC when it comes to providing information on on how things are going. I'd like. Good. I don't know if anybody else would like to see that, but Absolutely. if that's possible, I, I think that would be great. I take it for granted because we're you and I are in so many other places where he, they present that I forgot that they're not presenting here with us on on a weekly basis. But uh, if you could accommodate that, uh, Jacob, uh, being part of our our COVID, just like Dr. Caranza and and Chief uh, uh, Rodriguez, and then you'd be able to present, you know, what's happening in uh, UMC, and, and we get it directly from you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll want to thank you, all of you, and have a great uh, afternoon. And as for us, we're going to take a, a lunch break, and then we're going to go right into executive session uh, right after the lunch break. So it is um, 12.43, so I'm going to shoot for, uh, two, uh, I guess, uh, 1 o'clock. No, I'm sorry. Would that be, what time is it running? 12.44, so that will be one thirty. At, at 1.30, we'll get back, Caesar. Okay. At this time, Commissioner's Court will recess until 1.30 p.m.
Zahir. Go ahead. Thank you. Commissioners, court has reconvened into regular open session. Judge, uh, we had a we have a housekeeping item just to take care of before we move on to executive session. Uh, item number eight sure. for the regular agenda uh, was for the hospital district. It was receive a quarterly report from R. Jacob Sintron. President and Chief Executive Officer of the El Paso County Hospital District and take appropriate action. Could I please have a motion to accept the quarterly report? So moved. Second. Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Leon. Aye. Commissioner Stout. Aye. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. At this time, Judge, would you like to move into executive session to discuss yes, uh, UMC? Would you like to move into executive, sir? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Commissioners, court will now recess into executive session to discuss items 21A, 21B, and 21D, pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551.072 and 551.071. Commissioners, court will reconvene to take official action.
El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce, with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities. The region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities the region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The county of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities the region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The county of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities the region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The county of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities the region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options it's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities. The region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelor's, 74 master's, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The county of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce, with 72% of our population being by... Okay, go ahead. Commissioner's Court has reconvened into regular open session. Item number 22 from regular session, approve and authorize the El Paso County Hospital District to enter into a lease with the Housing Authority of the City of El Paso for the property located at 5300 East Paisano Drive, El Paso. This item was approved by the District Board of Managers at a regular meeting held on February 12th, 2021. Do we still have UMC individuals to present or? Yes, sir. Okay, thank yes. you. Yeah, let me check. Yeah, let me check. Michael? Maria's okay. It does show that Maria's here, Michael. I don't know if she just stepped away. Okay. If you'd like, I could discuss the item for the court. So, okay, that'd be fine. And then, okay, she's yeah, logged in. Ahead. Okay. Thank you. Betsy Maria is, is on now. It's been showing she's on, but I think I think she's having to re-log she's, in. She's on camera. No, she's Maria, on. Maria, are you there? I can yeah. see you. Yeah. Okay. Can you see me? Yes. I yes. can't see you right yes, yet. Yes, okay. Hang on. Go ahead, Maria. Yes. They've read the item in, Maria. If you just want to give a quick overview of what the request is. Okay, this is a request. A request for a lease. Sorry, let me pull my notes. <sighs> this is a request for a lease of a facility on 5300 Faisano. Uh, for 1,009,267 uh, square feet a University Medical Center to be used as administrative and warehouse space. Judge, so you are post, Judge Christina Sanchez, Assistant County Attorney. Judge, you are posted for action on this item. So if you'd like to proceed, the request is to prove and authorize the El Paso County Hospital District to enter into a lease with the Housing Authority to the City of El Paso for the property located at 5300 East Paisano, El Paso. That would be so your motion, moved. Judge. Yeah, so moved. Second. <clears throat> Commissioner Olguin? Aye. Commissioner Leon? 
Aye. Commissioner Stout. Aye. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Caesar. Thank you, Michael Thank and you, Maria. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 23, discuss and take appropriate action regarding Certificates of Obligation Series 2012 bonds. No action on this item, Judge. Thank you. Go ahead, Caesar. Item number two. Item 23, no action. And moving back to our regular order. Uh, item number nine from board appointments. Pursuant to Texas Local Government Code Section 318.003, discuss and take appropriate action to appoint members to the El Paso County Historical Commission for a two-year term ending on December 31st, 2022. Good afternoon, Judge, Commissioners. Um, last month, you conducted interviews of candidates for the County Historical Commission. And today, I do believe um, we're prepared for you to take action to select any candidates that you may be interested in. And if it's the pleasure of the court, I'd be glad to read the names that I believe the court may be interested in appointing. Go ahead, Betsy. Yes, sir. It would be Woodrow, Woody, Bear, Emil Shaparo, Peter Condon, George Cordova, John Hamilton, Mark Howe, Patricia Kidney, Janine Young, Brian Canoff, Prince McKenzie, DJ Savigny, Shelley Sutherland, Morris Brown, and Barbara Ann Welch. Thank you, Betsy. And we had said that uh, those that uh, had applied that uh, we would be uh, reaching out to them to see we would love to have them in, in subcommittees. And so uh, I hope they, they do participate uh, uh, from that standpoint. Yes, sir. Uh, commissioners? Discussion. Make a motion to approve. Second. Second. Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Leon. Aye. Commissioner Stout. Aye. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, Judge. Thank you, Commissioners. We'll take care of notification. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Caesar, we do have three items that members of the court have requested to pull from consent. Mm-hmm. We'll start with uh, yours, uh, Commissioner Leon, which was item... Uh, actually, uh, that'll be item G. Item G for we, Commissioner we Leon and E and F for um, Commissioner Olgi. Okay, go They're ahead, the Commissioner Leon. Uh, do you need to They're read it to the... the yeah, sorry. Caesar needs to read it, and then if you could address it. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Would you like me to read them all in? They're all with the Community Services Department. Please, uh -huh. Okay. Item number 4E from the consent agenda. This one is pulled by Commissioner Olguin. Approve and authorize the county judge to sign contract amendment 2, extending the contract period under the Texas Department of Agriculture Community Development Block Grant Emergency Services Help for Colonias Program for a term beginning January 15, 2021 and now ending April 15, 2022. Contract number 2021-0085. Item 4F, also pulled by Commissioner Olguin. 
approve and authorize the county judge to sign the Texas Department of Agriculture grant award agreement in the amount of $84,843.96 for home delivered meals for elderly, for elderly individuals and persons with disabilities for a term beginning February 1st, 2021 through January 31st, 2022. Funds will be deposited in Special Grant Nutrition Meals 21 State Agency, contract number 2021-0094. And item number 4G uh, for Commissioner Leon, approve and authorize the county judge to sign the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Continuum of Care Grant Closeout certific Certification Grant Coordinated Assessment Entry Project, contract number 2021-0087. Okay, thank you. Well, we'll uh, and apologize. Let's take them in order. Uh, if we could do, um, let's go, uh, Commissioner Olguin, if you could do yours first, and then we'll go to Commissioner uh, Leon. Go thank ahead, you. Commissioner. Thank you, Judge. Um, hi, Irene. I just had questions about the self help grant. So we're needing an extension, or we're requesting an extension. And I was just wondering what the reason for that was, if the funds hadn't been spent. And then I also noticed in the backup, there was no information about the amount of funding, how much had already been used, how much we still needed to use, how many families. Um, so can you give us a report on, on this these particular funds? Certainly, ma'am. Thank you, Irene. Good afternoon. Uh, Irene Valenzuela with the Community Services Department. For the record, uh, we received a total of $269,732 from the Texas Department of Agriculture. This was specific to counties who received Colonia Self-Help Center grant funds already. These funds were actually redistributed from within the agency. These were unspent funds from other programs that they redistributed to counties for the purpose of, of COVID relief for Colonia area. So counties who receive self-help center grant programs, and El Paso was one of them, received uh, this appropriation. Uh, the funds were specific for rental or utility or groceries only. And so because the Community Services Department through our general assistance uh, program uh, administered uh, our own general fund and CARES Act dollars for rent and utilities, we opted to program these funds to provide uh, grocery supplements to Colonia residents. And this fund allowed us to provide up to $2,000 per household. And this uh, eligibility was based on the family's SNAP eligibility. So depending on what uh, the household size is and how much their SNAP benefits were for that household, that's how much we uh, are allowed to provide that household in these direct uh, grocery card funds. We partnered and collaborated with a local grocer here in El Paso. Vista Markets provided the gift cards uh, for us to distribute. So far, we've spent $120,000 approximately. We've benefited 70 households with 70 grocery cards, averaging about $1,700 each. Uh, and uh, a total 257 persons were provided with these uh, benefits. The reason we're asking for an extension is uh, because, well, it was originally scheduled to expire on January 15th. They provided us these funds really late into the year, only gave us about a month to two months to distribute these funds. Uh, but we had to put together the program. We had to uh, collaborate and form partnerships with our community. We had to outreach. And so the state offered every county the opportunity to extend this, this program so that we can finish these funds and continue to provide the relief. So we're taking advantage of this offer from the state and we're seeking the court's approval to allow us to expand it until April 15th. I believe these are at 2022, but it's it's April 15, 2021. So it looks, it sounds like we've got about 149,000 left, right? Because the original award was 269, and we've spent 120 so far. So that leaves about 149,000. How confident are we that we're going to be able to spend that down in the next two months? Uh, I'm, do we need to just um, make much more robust efforts to get the word out, to get more people to apply? I, I just don't want this money to go unused. I mean, it's it's for the colonias, and we know that the colonias have, there's so much need out in the colonia. So what, what can we do to make sure that we don't run out of time and that we have as many people applying for these funds as possible for this assistance? 
We continue to hold uh, outreach clinics at our self-help center, uh, Commissioner Olguin, at, that's at the Agua Dulce Self-Help Center in the Agua Dulce community. We've also been to other areas in the county. Uh, at first, uh, TDA only allowed us to use these funds for registered colonias under the uh, Secretary of State's office eligible colonias. And so, uh, they didn't allow us to expand it to other areas that have colonia-like conditions but are not registered colonias. But since then, they've reversed their decision and have allowed us to expand to all our county rural areas that are experiencing any COVID-affected issues that have colonia-like conditions like uh, distressed uh, 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 substandard housing. They lack the... the uh, the road infrastructure and other type of infrastructure uh, issues. And so we've expanded that to, for example, Fabens does not have a registered uh, colonia in the Secretary of State, so we couldn't outreach to them, but now we're allowed to do that. So we, we are expanding with this time frame. we're expanding our outreach to those areas as well. And so we're pretty confident we're gonna get uh, this money expended, if not uh, completely close to it now. Okay, great. I'm glad to hear that. And I know your office works on so many important um, projects, but I just, I'm really afraid that this money isn't going to get used and we have such little amount of time. Um, so if we could just keep that in, in the forefront. Absolutely. Great yeah. catch. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. That, those were all my questions for item E, um, Judge. I don't know if you want me to go on to item F or if any of the other commissioners had questions. Yeah. I, I just want to recommend, Irene, if you think it's something, because, I mean, it could have missed it, and we learned so much right now, but if, if you ever feel not only us to pull it out of consent, but yourself to, if you feel it's something you want to express to us that that has these kind of delicacies in them, uh, you know, just make sure you, you know, don't put them on consent so that we could, I didn't catch it, but you caught it, but uh, I think it's a great explanation that we need to understand. So thank you, Commissioner. Uh, go ahead to the next one. Um, and then for item F, Irene, I was just hoping you can give us a little bit more information about this program. I know that the El Pasoans Fighting Hunger Food Bank also have a senior meals delivery program. And so I just didn't know if we coordinated with them, um, how we worked with them as far as making sure, you know, we're not duplicating services or, 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 or if we are coordinating with them um, completely. So if you could just give us a little bit of an overview of this particular program. Absolutely, ma'am. So the, the county has offered a home delivered meal program for over 40 years and we've, uh, pursued grant funds for this effort. The county also provides a uh, general fund in operating expenses. So the staffing and operational expenses for the senior nutrition program within my department is funded 100% by the county. Outside of that, 100% of the meals provided, we pursue grant funds for that. And so we have uh, a large uh, grant pool where we provide uh, cooked home delivered meals to about 1300 participants. They receive uh, five meals per week. Uh, uh, out of this program, this TDA program is a small grant that we pursue and it provides about 74 seniors with a home delivered meal all year. And so additional to that, we receive funds from the city's CDBG entitlement program, a small appropriation every year that, that we apply for and receive that provides about 35 uh, home delivered senior uh, meals to seniors, but the majority of our funding for the, our program comes from the Health and Human Services Commission and the Area Agency on Aging, which provides the almost the entirety of the fund to provide home delivered meals. And so uh, we do that as part of the Senior Nutrition Meal Program out of the department. The county has supported it, like I said, for over 40 years. Um, and so the the program that the El Paso and Fighting Hunger Food Bank has is a meal meal box of uh, either fresh produce or uh, shelf stable meal or uh, uh, shelf stable uh, stable staple meals that they provide uh, during this COVID era relief effort. And so we have worked with them on this. We actually send them referrals from some of our clients that call us that uh, need more than what the one meal that we provide for them. And so we've sent some refer referrals to the El Pasoans Fighting Hunger to, to provide an additional supplemental food box for them. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. 
Thank you. I, I, re I know you guys do so much. Uh, just incredible, your involvement. Uh, and I, I don't know if you mentioned it or I get so much information from what we're doing, what other people are doing. But one of the things that they've seen is that if you tap into the meal distribution, you're, you're leading right into some of the most vulnerable and people that aren't able to move. So, so they're trying to connect the vaccine distribution to make sure that, you know, if we align it with what you're doing, we already have a certain, you know, system going in that direction. So I don't know if it's something we're doing or something I've heard with all my, the, the amount of information I have to process, but uh, Irene, can you comment on that, please? Yes, sir. We are working with our, our local area agency on aging. So what we did is we polled our senior meal participants because they are within the age group of the 1A age and the 1B for the vaccine distribution. And so we called our clients uh, that are in our registered uh, participant roles for the congregate meal that we distribute every Tuesday and Thursday and for our homebound delivery clients. And so we're getting a list of all the eligible seniors in the in our rosters and uh, the ones that want to and have not gotten the vaccine and we're working with the area agency on aging providing them a list because I, they are working with umc to connect them to somehow help them register and uh, also get uh, appointments for the vaccine and there's other uh, other programs we're working with them to possibly do some phone backing registration on behalf of those seniors and so uh, we're, we're providing a, a list of our roster and working with them along with the city as well who is working to open up all their uh, city-run uh, senior centers where we also deliver our meals to uh, to to try to work with the city's vaccination effort to uh, res register and vaccinate all those eligible seniors who want to receive the vaccine as well that's excellent what, what a great platform right i mean you're already involved you have the communication system you have the I mean, I figured when I when I thought about it, I, well, they're always ahead of me anyway, but I'll, I'll ask anyway. But I, I want to thank you because that's a great platform that other communities are finding that uh, that's how we get to reach those that are more vulnerable because the chances if you're delivering to them, we already know they're probably not mobile. We know that they're elderly. I mean, right. so it's quite a, a great platform. So th thank you, Irene, for Absolutely. staying close to that. Okay. Yes, and sir. now we'll go to... Thank you. Now we'll go to Commissioner Leon. Yes, uh, thank you, Judge. I, hi, Irene. And, uh, you know, I know over these last several months, you all have been slammed with so many things that you had to take care of, and you've done a great job. Uh, this item cut my eye, caught my eye because I saw that we returned almost, uh, almost $90,000. And I know that the date of the award was in 2018. I don't know if that's when the approval came in or we actually received the award, but uh, uh, I, I just hate to see us return money that we could have used uh, in the area of homelessness. And I know this happened some years back, uh, I, I think uh, at the Fabens Airport, and uh, it was a shame that we had to return money. But can you give me some background on how this happened? I know that you were short of personnel also. Yes. Yes, sir. So yeah, the, the award for this particular grant is a from 20, it's a two year award. So it's from 2018 to 20, end of 2020. Uh, we were awarded $160,000 to fund three coordinated entry assessors and it is for the, uh, the homeless and uh, homeless effort in this community as we're the operator of the coordinated entry system. And so we got the award late in 2018. We didn't begin our recruitment efforts until 2019. We did hire assessors as, as uh, required, but we had significant turnover throughout 2019 that didn't allow us to expend all the salary funds that were given for this particular grant. And so we're fully staffed now. We've had three assessors very consistently for one year. We have not had any turnover this time around. And while this balance did um, technically uh, go back to HUD, they repurposed it and we received an, a, the same amount of money for this grant year. We received 160,000 again 
to uh, deploy this program again with three assessors. And like I said, we've had uh, not, we have not had turnover this time around. And so we we are confident that uh, by the end of this grant year, the 2022, we'll be close to or almost 100% expended on this grant as well. And Irene, thank you for the explanation. Uh, that's what I thought it was in that arena. But maybe uh, you can have some conversations with uh, Betsy in having something at the ready uh, because you've got to expect that we will have turnover and I'd hate to return money uh, next year. So maybe you can keep that in the back of your mind that uh, uh, we know you need help and somehow we need to get your help. Yeah, and get that money. Right. Thank you. Absolutely. I know yes, there's, sir. there's two things uh, Commissioner Leon loves to hear is no matching and then he hates to hear <laughs> we, we return money. So thank you for for those two items. Uh, thank you. Irene, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, Caesar. So judge, commissioners, we need a motion yes, on those three items. Oh, that's right. Yes. Okay. I, I, I... Do you want to do so, them individually I'll make a or as a group? To, I'll, make, yeah, I'll make a motion to accept those three items that we left out of the uh, consent agenda. Second. Yes, sir. Would be a motion to approve E, F, and G. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Olguin? Aye. Commissioner Leon. Commissioner Leon. You made it, Commissioner. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Stout. I. Commissioner Robinson. I. Judge Samaniego. I. Motion carries. Thank you all. Thank you, Irene. Have a good afternoon. Well, I think we're seeing you later, right? Or did we get everything? Uh, Betsy, does does Irene have any items? Uh, I'd hate for her to be have her here. And are there any items later? <laughs> No, I, I think those three items are it, uh, Judge. Okay. Were my consent items. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, you though for considering that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this brings us back to item number ten from County Administration. Judge, Caesar, yes. I apologize. Before we do item number ten, Judge, would you consider doing item number twenty? We've had people on from the emergency service districts and their auditors throughout the meeting today. Oh my goodness, okay. Yeah, we're very valuable partners and shouldn't be held back. So yeah, I, thank you for that. Uh, go ahead, uh, Caesar. Yes, sir. Item number 20 from budget and finance. Discuss and take appropriate action to accept the audits for emergency services districts one and two for the year ended September 30th, 2020, and further discuss any related policies, procedures, or financial matters. Thank you. Wally. Good afternoon, Judge and Commissioners. Wally Hargrove from the Office of Budget and Fiscal Policy. Um, as a, when I think upon the completion of the audits by our, the external audit firm for ESD 1 and 2, we do have them presented to the court for acceptance and presentations are included with today's report from the. Uh, we have a gentleman from the external audit firm, uh, Mr. Telo, one moment, Tavera Cabrera, and he has presentations to make to the court uh, on ESD1 and ESD2 audits. Telo, are you on? Mr. Cabrera? I think it's pronounced Teyo. I don't think yeah. he's on. Commissioner. 
Miguel says he's not on the uh, Wally. You want to see if you could... Dale, are you online? We don't see him online, Wally. No? All right, my apologies. I thought we had the group in here. I saw the chief join in. Um, you could bring the presentations up, and if Mr. Cabrera What's joins in, in um, I could review those. I could begin the review of those doing quickly. The ESD one first, I take it. Yes, sir. So this is the audit report for ESD one for the fiscal year most recently ended. Uh, Chief, I know you're online as well. If you do see uh, Mr. Gaudera join, uh, we'll go ahead and recognize him. Next slide. Uh, the, auditor, the audit highlights the auditor's report did express an unmodified clean opinion. Uh, they found no instances of fraud, waste, or abuse, and no material weaknesses in the internal controls. Next slide. Uh, and there is Mr. Cabrera. Hello, Teo. Hello there. How's it going? Hi. Good. Oh, we, Mr. Just, Cabrera. we just started the presentation, and we are on slide number three. With that, Judge Commissioners, I'll turn it over to Mr. Cabrera. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, sir. Yes, sir. Well, thanks for the introduction, uh, Mr. Hargrove. Um, really quick, this is for ESZ number one, right? Correct. correct. That's correct. Okay, so I'm not sure how, how much you've covered so far, or do you want me to kind of just pick it up from here? Did you guys already talk about the results of the audit? So we can go back one slide, if you would, Miguel. We had just started with the first slide on the clean audit opinion, if you go ahead and okay. continue from there. Okay. Thank you. Got it, got it. All right. So really quick, let me just introduce myself. My name is Tejo Cabrera. I'm a CPA here in El Paso. I work for the firm SBNG. Uh, I've been working for ESZ1 uh, really for the last uh, eight years, uh, first in a consulting capacity and then as an auditor for the last two years. And for ESZ2, I've been working on their audit also for the last two years, and we've also done a little bit of consulting work for them here and there. Um, so I'm really happy to be here today with you guys and presenting the results of our, our two audits. Uh, I will be very brief. Uh, both of the audits have already been accepted by the respective uh, commissioners uh, for the two ESZs. And uh, Mr. Hargrove has also been involved in, in looking at the audits and he's seen this presentation before. Uh, but nonetheless, I want to make sure that uh, the commissioners get an opportunity to ask questions and uh, just get a brief report on the audit results. So the audit that we conducted for both uh, ESZs, um, it's actually an audit under governmental auditing standards. Uh, so what that means is that we are we are not only looking at presenting uh, an opinion on the financial statements themselves, but we're also evaluating internal controls and we're also required to re report any instances of fraud uh, or anything that the auditor could consider waste or, or abuse, right? So it's highly subjective and it's highly subjective on purpose because basically the standards are designed for us to present anything that doesn't pass the smell test, right? Uh, so I'm happy to report to you guys that uh, on both of these instances, we have no fraud, waste or abuse noted for none of the ESDs, right? Uh, both ESDs are getting uh, a clean, unmodified audit opinion, and I'm not, I'm not sure if uh, Mr. Hargrove explained this to you, but basically that is the, the best opinion that you can get in your audit. I mean, the major financial statements are meeting all the requirements uh, for accounting principles and that there's no material errors, right? And that's the opinion that you want to get. Uh, in the case of ESZ1, there is no uh, weaknesses in internal controls, so we are not presenting any findings. Uh, in the case of ESD number two, there is one finding, which we will get into that briefly, okay? Uh, so that's the summary for the presentations. And if we can move to the next slide, uh, I'll start by giving you a really brief overview of, uh, for, let's start with ESD number one first. These numbers right here are for ESD number one. So uh, to put it in, in, in a simple sentence, what's going on with ESD number one is that ESD number one is growing, right? ESD number one is, is going uh, through an expansion. Um, so as we can see, we have three years being presented, and this is a very rough uh, high-level summary of the balance sheet or the assets for ESZ number one. Uh, and, and we see that ESZ number one was basically building up their cash reserves. And in 2020 now, we see that approximately half of the cash reserves have been spent, right? So we see a decline of 50% in the ba balance of cash. 
Now, this is because he is the number two, one of uh, finished a, a new fire station, right? They're in fire station number two, and this has essentially been built to meet the anticipated and current demands of the growing population in their jurisdiction, right? And remember, ESD1 is is providing uh, services for basically the Horizon area and the area that's close to the new Amazon building, right? So there's an increasing population and there's expected to be even more in the near future. So that is the basically what's the justification for station number two. And even though we have a decrease in cash, you can see the corresponding increase in property plan and equipment, right? We went from having $7 million to $11 million in in buildings and fixed assets and whatnot, right? So that's, in a, in, you know, in, in a few sentences, that's what's going on with, uh, with ESZ1. Uh, if we see the following slide, we'll see, again, the liabilities, and you can see how the amount of long-term debt has increased uh, over the last three years. And really what's happening is that we are uh, getting additional borrowings, right, to finance these uh, expansions, to finance the new fire station. And the majority of the borrowing actually occurred in 2018. Uh, and as you can see that the balance didn't really change that much in long-term debt. Uh, and then there was some additional borrowings in 2020 to finance uh, a new fire truck, which those are about $800,000 each. And also we have uh, some other expenses, right, that are needed to staff the, the new station. So we do see a bit of an increase in debt still uh, in 2020. Uh, in the next slide, we'll see a summary of the revenues, the sources of revenues. Uh, I don't know if you can zoom back a little bit because the, the screen there, you, you're not, we're not seeing the whole slide. Uh, but in any regard, uh, the, the main source of revenue for ESZ number one is going to be property taxes. And that rate has remained unchanged basically for the last, as long as I can remember, right? We've been at 10 cents, uh, a point, point 10 cents per $100 of valuation. Uh, however, we do see a very significant increase in the amount of property taxes collected, right? And that change, that, that change is coming from the increase in property tax values. Um, so that is the, the main factor that's driving uh, the, the growth and the, the additional budget capacity for, for ESG number one. Um, there's also a very important increase noted in, in revenues generated from fire marshal fees. Uh, a majority of that is coming from a single really large construction project uh, that is happening within the jurisdiction. So not all of that change is expected for future years. But as you can see, even from 2018 to 2019, there's a very important jump on um, on on fees. The main thing here for ESG one is that as of the end of September 2020, ESG one is not collecting sales taxes, right? So. The majority of, 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 of the expenses that burden is basically all on property taxes, as you can see, right? I mean, it's a very significant portion uh, of their budget, more than three fourths, more than 75%. So ESG1 is undergoing uh, an election, right? To try to get uh, sales taxes uh, in the near future. So that should help with uh, covering some of the other expenses and the changes that are going on with the ESG1. Um, if we go to the next slide, and I'm going to jump uh, another slide really quick uh, so I can show you a, 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 the detail of not only the revenue, which we already talked about, but also the expenses for ESG1 uh, and the expenses are being presented here in, in operating expenses, which is basically what the cost to run the fire department and the stations. Uh, and then we have debt service interest and capital expenditures, right? Uh, so big year in terms of capital expenditures, right? Because we did complete uh, the, f the second fire station and that is what you see $4.2 million. And then there's also that a fire truck and some other large ticket capital expenditures that are needed to staff this second station. So a lot of that is non-recurrent. But the important thing to get out of here is we have also an increase in operating expenditures, right? So we can see that in the previous two years, our, our, our common expenses, to say it in that way, are at $1.8 million, and then we have a jump of $2.5 million, right? So again, we're seeing that we have two stations now versus one, uh, and we're seeing that our operating expenditures are, are tending to increase in a faster rate than what we've seen in the growth in revenues, right? So that is hence 
the importance of, of, of getting this sales tax uh, revenue in the near future uh, to be able to keep the property tax that are, are at the same level that has, as it has been in the past. So anyways, I mean, that really is uh, the story uh, with, uh, with the Easy one uh, really, really didn't have any adjustments. Uh, we are comfortable with all the internal controls, everything that we've seen, and and we have uh, nothing to report in terms of of fraud, waste, or abuse. Um, at this point, uh, not sure if anybody has any question in particular to ESG one. Uh, we can also go over the Q ratios really quick. Um, again, because we spent uh, a lot of money that was reserved for the fire station, you can see that our committed and assigned funds decreased, right? From $4.8 million, we were left with $1.1 million. And these funds, the, that $1.1 million, that's that's part of the fund balance and it's being set aside for future improvements, right? So as you can see, there's still a cushion there uh, to continue with improvements and any other large equipment needed for station number two. Um, the general fund balance is the most important one because that's what's showing us how much in cash reserves is available for expenditures, right? So a good rule of thumb is to have approximately six months, right? It's sort of a conservative rule, but that's kind of the standard, sort of six months worth of expenditures uh, in our general fund. And as you can see, uh, the district is at 63%. That's the last uh, ratio there. Uh, so we are exceeding that that uh, that sort of benchmark, right? As far as the number of our uh, or the amount of our cash reserves. So basically, even though we had a big year in expenditures, uh, ESU one still has a, a relatively stable um, cash position at the end of the year in relation to the amount of expenditures that are needed uh, every year. So again, now this is basically the the end of ESG one's presentation. Uh, and uh, Mr. Hartgrove, would you want me to jump into ESG two, or do you want to allow a few minutes for any questions on ESG one? Yeah, I think we should, we, we should take them to, well, one at a time. That way we don't confuse the two. But uh, could you go back? Um, I, I just want to make sure, and, and thank you, great presentation. And obviously this helps us tremendously as we look at their budget, but we also should understand, you know, uh, how they use their money and so forth. So because we, you know, we're it's our governance component. But when you went back to to their going out for you know increasing the tax rate and all that uh, do, do you have any comments about that is this uh, you know we want it to be justified based on growth and based on what's going to happen and not based on maybe not the handling of money properly or anything like that or that they uh, they could have you know maybe saved more some in different places or uh, so, so it caught me. You know, it was new to me. Uh, you know, having this discussion on them going out for uh, increasing the their tax rate, and so I uh, just wanted any comments from you, Theo, that would help us understand what it means to do that, and then if there's any further impact or anything that we should understand uh, when they go out to uh, to increase their their tax. Right. So what I've seen is that ESG one has been. Uh, fairly conservative over the years in, in, in not increasing their tax rate too much. So as far as I can remember, the, their, their tax rate has remained the same or more or less the same year over year, right? Uh, however, what I'm mm -hmm. seeing now is that there is two fire stations, right? Before we used to have one, and now there, there are two fire stations that are servicing uh, their jurisdiction. Uh, so I I believe that that's going to put some pressure in balancing their budget. Uh, and in order to balance their budget in the long run, if they don't increase their taxes, they're going to have to keep incurring more debt, right? So mm -hmm. a strategy for them that's very important is to be able to collect sales taxes, right? If they are able to collect sales taxes, that is going to bring, and I don't have the numbers as to how much additional revenue the sales taxes would bring, but that would certainly take a lot of pressure from having to increase their their property tax rate, right? Which is ultimately passed down to uh, property owners. Uh, so sales taxes is something that has been in their plans uh, at least for a year or maybe more than that. 
And my understanding is that they were going to go into an election to try to collect these sales taxes mm -hmm. and, cool. and help That's prevent cool. that, that pressure in, in, their, in their budget. Now, as far as reserves, they, they have what I believe is a healthy cash reserve. Um, I do want to point out that a lot of the equipment that is needed for these fire stations is very expensive. And that's the same thing for ESD number two. Right. I mean, fire trucks can be more than half a million dollars and they have a, a finite amount of useful life. Uh, so even though you might see that the cash reserve, you know, it's three million dollars at their first glance, it might seem like it's a lot. But I mean, it, it's easy to spend uh, close to a million dollars in one year in which you have to replace a new truck uh, in which you have to replace certain fire equipment, which tends to be really expensive. So it's really balancing the need uh, to have new equipment, to have top of the line equipment and to manage their growth. And, and that is what I believe the sales tax election is the way to go for them. And, and, and I mean, that's as far as I am. I mean, I'm not an expert in any of these things. Uh, but what I can tell you is from from a financial position, they're in good standing. Mm -hmm. Well, good. And, um, and while well, you want to comment on that, because you were in the meeting together and uh, but I, I think it's, um, you know, it actually, it, it saves, they do increase the sales tax, but they actually save an insurance for their constituents because of the proximity and, you know, because they, they have these new, they're closer to, in case of a fire, all these other elements that, that make it better for our residents. And, and obviously, they're growing tremendously, and you mentioned Amazon and all of these. Uh, so it, it really justifies. I just wanted to see from an auditing perspective if it uh, you could add anything that would give us a, a better sense of of going in that direction. But Wally, you want to comment on that or anything that I might have missed here? Or, or... Absolutely, Judge. So you're correct. By the addition of a second fire station and the resident's proximity to that fire station, it lowers their ISO rating, which will have, which will impact the fire portion of their insurance. Um, as far mm -hmm. as future cost, by adding the second station, one of the big operating components that the court needs to recall is ESD1 is currently at the statutory limit of the 10 cent tax rate. So the need to generate additional revenues uh, from property taxes is somewhat limited. They'll only be able to generate new revenues off of new property value that comes into the district. So their consideration for um, taking the sales tax to a ballot is, uh, is to help um, offset future operations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dave. You can, we can proceed to ESD2 now. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Really quick, um, as I had mentioned, ESD number two is also uh, receiving an unmodified opinion. Uh, we also did not become aware of any fraud, waste, or abuse. We're following the same governmental auditing standards as we did for ESD one. Uh, we do have one finding in internal control. Uh, essentially, what this means is that not only are we supposed to make sure that numbers look reasonable and fairly presented in the audit, but we are also supposed to evaluate uh, checks and balances, right? Segregation of duties, uh, policies and procedures, and um, essentially the business practices, right? To make sure that there's no weaknesses or, or holes that could lead to potential misstatements. Uh, so we did have one finding on an area that we believe needs uh, some improvement. And the finding is on improving the policies for tracking equipment and especially heavy equipment and, and fire equipment that is used on, on the different fire stations that ESD number two oversees. And uh, the difference between, well, one of, there's many differences, right? But one of the differences between the two districts is that ESD2 is, is, is spread over a, over a more um, <laughs> scattered area, right? And we're going to have a, a lot of different fire stations uh, that are under the umbrella of ESD number two, and each one of them has its own equipment. Um, some of the equipment is shared or somewhat administered by the, the district itself, but some of the other equipment is, is, you could say it's in care of the fire stations, right? But it still belongs to ESD number two. Uh, so we are um, 
reporting here that we believe that controls need to be tightened up a little bit on on monitoring these uh, equipment. And what we're suggesting is that the district comes up with some kind of um, monthly or or annual um, inventory count, right, for all this equipment. Uh, we've had this finding last year, and the improvement that was done is that there's an additional person that was hired uh, to try to sort out this role. And there were also some changes made to the policies and procedures, and, and now there's actually a written policy that is requiring, um, you know, that all of these equipment is tracked um, in, in the ESZ number two's database, right? They have a database for equipment. So the portion that is missing is that as auditors, we wanna be able to have some kind of audit evidence that we can ask and we can examine when we do our audit to make sure that, that, that this inventory is actually being monitored, right? So we're asking the fire chief and his personnel to come up with a monthly routine and, and basically every month do some kind of cycle count or surprise visit or something like that that would ensure that, you know, provide some kind of documentation that this equipment is being tracked. Uh, and really, we haven't found anything that's missing or anything like that, but what we see is that equipment is being moved from one station or another, uh, or, or we might have things on the list that are, uh, you know, not correctly labeled when we go into the stations and we try to identify all these things, right? Uh, some of the things are radios and laptops and computers. Other things are more like uh, heavy equipment, like, uh, I don't know, like those jaws of lives or, or pumps or, or, or even stuff like uniforms, right? Which uh, at some point it can be a little uh, hard and tedious to track. Um, so basically what we've seen is that the, the items are there but there's not a, a defined formal process to monitor it. And that's basically what we're pushing here with this finding. Um, so in any regard, that is the only recommendation that we have. Uh, and, and we think that that they're very close in, in actually putting these things um, in place. Now, to talk about the actual results, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Now, for ESD number two, to try to put it in a few sentences, uh, what I've seen with ESD number two is that they are trying to restructure somehow uh, the way how they're managed their budget and their operations, right? So it started in, in even before last year, but the main thing occurred in 2019 when ESD number two purchased and, and, and placed in service a new central district building, right? Um, so that's why we see that big increase there in, in property and equipment from $15 million to almost $17 million in 2019, right? So with the new central facility, essentially a lot of the administrative functions have been, little by little, they have been centralized and brought back into the ES number two. Uh, the big change that occurred in fiscal year 2020 is that there is less purchases being made by each individual fire department and, or fire chief, and, and essentially the ESD2 is, it has more control, right, over everything that is being spent to, uh, to manage and staff these stations. Uh, so we believe that this is, uh, has actually been positive, and as you will see in, in a few slides in a little bit, uh, you'll see how the expenses for fiscal year 2020 actually were less than the previous year. Uh, part of it is because of COVID, right? I mean, it was an unusual year, it impacted everybody differently. Uh, and overall, there was less less expenses for ESD2. But I also think that it has to do with the fact that the budget is being uh, centralized. And especially starting in March of 2020, when the pandemic really hit, uh, a lot of the, the purchasing decisions really were migrated back to ESD number two. Um, and really, that that really is the biggest story uh, that, I, that, that is influencing the financial statements. Um, as you can see here, ESZ2 ended the year with $7 million in cash. A lot of that, however, is being already set aside. The reason why we had such a big increase is because there was a loan for $3 million taken right at the end of the fiscal year, right? So out of those $7 million that you see in cash, $3 million are already reserved and set aside or encumbered, if you want to put it in that way, to, uh, to purchase a, a new vehicle fleet. Right. So there's there's going to be um, over 20 new trucks. Uh, I can't remember the exact number, but there's there's going to be a very large uh, procurement happening uh, in fiscal year 2021. So a lot of that money is set aside. 
Uh, and that's basically the, the biggest change that we see on the balance sheet. On the next page or the next slide, you can see um, the amount of debt uh, that's outstanding at the end of the year. So if I can have somebody go to the next slide, please. There we are. Okay, yeah. So again, we saw an increase of 26% in long-term debt, and that's why we have that big increase in cash, basically. And like I said, most of that has been set aside. Uh, and, and really for, for ESZ um, number two, I mean, a good thing to mention about them is also is that they did not use debt uh, to buy their previous station. Um, so as you can see, even though, even though in 2019 there was a big increase in fixed assets, right, in a new building, really there was not a big increase in debt. However, we are seeing it now because they're, they're, they're going to start to, you know, renovate their fleet and buy other things. Uh, so nonetheless, the, the amount of debt, it's, it's actually very comparable to the amount that you saw with easy number one. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, we'll see, uh, we'll see the breakdown of revenues. And look at the impact that sales taxes has uh, for ESZ2, right? So that's that's one of the main differences when we compare it to ESZ1, that ESZ1 right now is not, not collecting sales taxes and ESZ2 is. So essentially, ESZ2 gets about 40% of their, their revenues from sales taxes. Uh, property taxes is, if I remember correctly, and, and Mr. Hargrove, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the property tax rate is the same. Uh, for both ESZs, right? So they're both at ten cents. Uh, 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 ESD two is just a, a tad off of ten cents, but they they are subject to the same ten cent limitation. Right. Okay. So yeah, we're we're essentially in the same amount, um, and you can see the the change in property tax revenue collected is almost the same percentage as the the jump that we had in in ESZ number one. So basically both. Uh, both ESDs uh, increase their property tax base, right? The amount of uh, property values in, in their jurisdictions. Uh, if we jump two more slides, we'll see uh, the breakdown of the expenses. And if you can see here on their operating expenditures, that is what I was mentioning at the beginning. So the previous two years, we were at $3.9 million and just about a 3% decrease in 2020, right? Uh, so again, Part of it is COVID, but part of it is also um, centralizing some procurement decisions and uh, trying to be a little more efficient with costs. Capital expenditures, you see that the big year was 2019 with $2.7 million. And 2020 was sort of a lighter year in terms of capital expenditures, but nonetheless, there were still some very important um, purchases and additions. And then you can see there the new debt that was borrowed. Uh, near the bottom of the slide, um, they, they borrowed $3.3 million, and that is adding to their bottom line, right? It's adding to the amount of funds available uh, to spend. And then in terms of ratios, in the last slide, um, we have, um, we can see, um, I think, let's go another slide, I'm sorry. The last slide is the one that has the ratio. No, you're, you're going the, the wrong way. There you go, okay. Uh, another thing is that we saw uh, an increase in the number of calls, um, and that's um, it's, it's pretty good, right? Because it's being reflected on the ratio of expenditures per call, right? So uh, it's 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 looking like their efficiency is improving and it's trending in the right direction. Um, and, and again, the amount of cash on hand um, is is uh, close to the benchmark of uh, about fifty percent of their um, their expenses, right? So we have a good cash reserve um, and, and we have improving efficiency, right? In terms of the cost that is taking to run the entire district. Um, now, if we can look at the recommendations, we have a few recommendations. Uh, we have the finding, which we already discussed, uh, what has to do with uh, improving controls over their inventory. And then we had a few recommendations uh, in the last slide. And essentially, we, we want them to revisit their investment policy and consider uh, maybe going into some other kinds of uh, investments like um, uh, governmental uh, investment pools. Right now, everything is is sitting on, on bank accounts, right? Uh, and we also want a little bit more formality in documenting uh, 
changes that are being made to policies and procedures. Some of the changes are a little bit ad hoc sometimes, and we just want to make sure that everything is documented and it's easier for us auditors to know that uh, all, the, all the policies and procedures have been pro properly implemented as they are changed and updated. Um, so again, that's, that's basically it for ESG number two. And I think, again, at this point, I want to open up any questions or any comments or anything on ESG2. I know. Excellent presentation, Tim. Very, you made something that could be very complex for us. Uh, uh, you did a great job of putting it out there. And, and uh, you know, we're real proud of our two uh, ESD1 and 2, very proud and you know, our relationship with them. And so uh, I'm glad to hear that there's nothing you know, out of the ordinary that cannot be uh, taken care of. I think just to help out with the process, Wally, and we probably do it, but when, when we come to budget, when they come into budget, that if you could bring in these recommendations and, and we'd be able to address whether or not they've, uh, you know, they've taken care of them or they're working towards them. And so we could uh, help with that uh, when uh, during budget, if we could see these uh, recommendations that uh, have been given by Dale. Great, great recommendation, Judge. And one of the other things that we do in this instance where they're recommending they adopt an investment policy, the first thing we'll do is provide them with a copy of the county investment policy as a draft so that they we can Excellent. sort of fast track that policy for their purpose. Well, that, that's the idea. We help each other and uh, we want them to be successful. And, and, and I'm sure they're, you know, that, that'll help during the budget process. So thank you. Uh, who, who do we have? Thank you, uh, I think we have a spot, sir. Do we have Chief? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Judge and Commissioners. Hi, how are you? Just any any comments or anything, Chief? Uh, thank you for being no, here with us. Judge, most of the uh, the issues that were addressed already have been uh, uh, outlined already, have been taken care of already. We have a new central Excellent. purchasing, of course. ESD number two is a lot bigger than ESD number one. We have 13 fire stations. And we have mm -hmm. a lot more equipment to maintain. So we do have a, a, a purchasing and inventory people that are trying to gather their arms around all their equipment and making uh, sure that chiefs, when they make changes, they, we can track it. But we've, we've already addressed a lot of those changes. Thank you, Chief. And, again, thank you for your partnership and everything else uh, over and above what you need to do. And with the COVID and all the other things you help us with and the testing. And so thank you. Appreciate that. No problem. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions? Thank you, Chief. Uh, commissioners, any comments, questions? If not, we want to thank you, Teo, for joining us today. And like I said, a great presentation, very succinct and, and understandable. So thank you. And Judge, if I may, we just need a motion to accept both audits. Okay, a uh, motion to accept both items. Second. Commissioner Olim. Aye. Commissioner Leon. Aye. Commissioner Stout. Aye. Commissioner Robinson? Aye. Judge Samaniego? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. You guys have a good Thank afternoon. You. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Wally. Thank, no you. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Thank, Thank you, you Commissioners. Is there another item that we want to go to, or do you want to go back to the regular order? Uh, Betsy, back to regular, I, I believe. Yes, sir, item that would 10? be great. Thank We're you. Go back to item 10. Thank you. Item number 10, Betsy. County Administration. Receive a report and discuss the CARES Act grant and the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act 2021. Thank you, Betsy. Good afternoon, Judge Commissioners. Good afternoon, Judge Commissioners. Well, Wally Hargrove, Executive Wally. Director of Budget and Fiscal Policy. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
Uh, my office has been working closely with auditors and purchasing, as well as departments since late 2020 to analyze any outstanding and eligible expenses and projected future expenses under the Coronavirus Relief Funding or CARES Act, as we often refer to it. As you know, we've received $27 million under this funding. Expenses and purchases to date currently total, uh, and purchase orders, excuse me, currently total $15.5 million, while commitments total $7.66 million. We've accounted for recognition of the portion of allowable payroll charges totaling uh, $5.4 million, which now brings the overall remaining funds to approximately $4.3 million. Some of the current remaining balances, uh, which are just over $900,000, will still be used to cover ongoing PPE and other operating costs through the end of the fiscal year. Uh, the uh, have been moved to the reserve account for the court's uh, consideration, uh, further consideration. The current balance available for consideration for allocation by the court is approximately $3.4 million. Of late, community services has presented approximately $3 million of additional needs to you uh, as, er, as early as recently as last Tuesday, and they will be bringing more details on those requests to you in the near future. Some of the areas of need are in the areas of mortgage and cash assistance, migrant services that relate to COVID mitigation, food security, additional funeral services, um, as well as pop possible acquisition of a facility to assist in homelessness uh, transition. Uh, we have heard recently that Congress could consider another round of funding for local governments as early as this week, as they conclude budget reconciliation, and we will monitor that closely and keep you updated. Um, that concludes today's uh, presentation. I want to thank you, and I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Wally. Questions from anyone? I have a question, Judge. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Elgin. Um, Wally, the amount that's there for the decedent holding facility, that's what we've already spent, or that's what we're forecasting to continue to spend? So that, I'm just not sure uh, why that's not question. included within Holding, that the is, other calculation. That, that is what we, yes, ma'am. That is what we have allocated towards the decedent holding facility. That was our projected cost of January through June. As we've had additional extensions uh, from the Army Reserve, that will give us the ability to potentially operate that facility a little bit beyond June if necessary. Right, right now, another six or seven weeks. But that is our anticipated cost this year for our decedent holding facility. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any questions, yes, comments? Okay, Caesar. Thank you. Item number 11, discuss and take appropriate action regarding El Paso County's preparation and response for COVID-19. Thank you, Betsy. Yes, sir. I didn't know if any other members of the court wanted to give any updates on this item. Commissioner Leon, Commissioner did you Stout? have any updates? No? Commissioner Stout? Um, yeah, just real, real quickly. Let me uh, get to my notes here. Um, okay, so just, just, just real quickly. Um, we aren't having that regular that uh, uh, homeless uh, task force uh, meeting anymore, as I advise you all of. But we do have, we're still having the, the food security task force meetings, and so um, there was uh, some discussion about uh, bills that are that have been filed in the House and Senate that that aim to make it easier for seniors and people with disabilities to access uh, SNAP or food stamps. Uh, it was stated that uh, by the by the food uh, food bank that um, about 50 percent or, or more of, of uh, eligible seniors are not enrolled in SNAP, and so uh, we talked about uh, we talked about SNAP. We talked about uh, we've heard from from folks at the Heart Association that they're working in Socorro to get vendors certified for SNAP. Um, and then we talked about some of the some of the advocacy that we've done uh, here. Uh, and in my office and at the county when it comes to to, to snap and and also there there was a uh, and, and in the over at uh, UTEP there was a 
interest uh, indicated that in, in studying the cost and benefit of putting resources into into the registration. So um, glad to see that those uh, conversations uh, regarding SNAP continue to take place. And then uh, I was not able to attend the uh, COVID United Task Force, but my staff was was able to go and took some notes for me. Uh, obviously, the conversation uh, centered around the vaccines, and um, there was a little bit of talk about uh, the, the, these FEMA mega sites that that uh, are are being set up in different parts of Texas and. Whether or not we would we would get uh, we would get one, but it it, it uh, seems that we will not. And so, um, uh, I believe that they also talked a little bit about uh, they were they were curious about the the um, migrants that will be coming in, as we've of course heard about the end of the MPP, and and so uh, they were given some information uh, about that. I believe from the city and uh, just talked about the importance of making sure that, that uh, uh, folks are, are, are taken care of. So um, I, think that's, I think that's all I had. And, and I, I just want to say thank you to you, Judge, for um, earlier in your, in your update, um, you know, taking, taking uh, you know, the, the, the things and putting them in context of a, of a SWOT analysis and uh, you know, I really think that um, that that um, gave us a pretty concise, I guess, picture of of of, of where we stand on um, on a lot of these a lot of these issues. And I would I would just say that um, I I think that an additional threat is also. I mean, it kind of played into uh, or, or or was mentioned with one of the weaknesses that you that you brought up. But I, I think an additional threat is uh, and and I brought this up earlier with UMC is not having um, the data or, or utilizing the, the data um, mm -hmm. to be able to target where vaccines uh, are needed. So that's all I have, and, and thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Okay, anyone else? Commissioner uh, Robinson? Commissioner? Nothing at this time. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ogin? Um, no, Judge. Actually, I was going to ask to see if there was any way possible we could move to item 15. We've had several speakers who've been waiting to speak on this particular item, and I just, if, if it's any way possible to maybe move that item up a little bit. Well, we always try to accommodate, so we'll accommodate this one as well. So uh, go ahead, uh, Caesar, item 15. Okay, are, are we done with item 11 now? Or do you need to come back to the Kelly? I think we're uh, I can done, give right? any other updates I have to the court via um, email. Okay. Thank you, Betsy. That'll then we'll help us we'll be efficient today. Thank you. We'll take no further action on item eleven. Item number fifteen: grant applications. Approve the submission of county grant applications as listed and described. If awarded, all grant award agreements will be brought back to the Commissioner's Court for final acceptance and approval. Item number 15, approve and authorize El Paso County to apply for the W.K. Kellogg Foundation Racial Equity 2030 grant in the amount of, two, uh, in the amount of $20 million over a 10-year period for the creation of the Racial Equity Learning Innovation Center, a centralized archival space which, be, which will be a resource for students, historians, educators, and the community. No county match is required. Contract number 2021-0111. Thank you. Thank you, um, Judge. Uh, so this is um, a, a very exciting project that was brought to my attention by a longtime uh, community organizer, uh, Corrine Chacon. Um, we started discussing this potential grant application in January, and it was certainly something that we, it was an opportunity that we did not want to uh, let pass by, even though we knew the turnaround time for preparation of the grant application was going to be very short. And so um, because of her efforts and the efforts of so many others, we were able to complete the grant application because so many people contributed. Um, we had just, I, I do want to thank them all um, for helping us. We had, of course, Karine Chacon, 
Dr. Ana Perez from the Isleta del Sur Pueblo, former city representative uh, Lily Limon, Dr. Oscar Martinez from the University of Arizona and a very well-known historian here in El Paso, Dr. Yolanda Leva from UTEP, Dr. David Romo from UTEP, Claudia Ramirez from the Border Heritage Center of the El Paso Library Archives, and Judge Patricia Macias from the San Elisario Genealogy uh, uh, and Historic Association. Um, and, and because of their contributions, we will be able to submit this grant application. And of course, with the help of our wonderful staff um, in the grants department, Erica Ortega and uh, Isabel Hernandez, and of course, Wally, who helped with all of the financial um, aspect of the gra uh, grant. Um, so we do have a couple of um, speakers on this topic, but before I turn it over, just very briefly, uh, what this grant would seek to do is to establish the Racial Equity Learning Innovation Center, which we're calling RELIC, um, which would basically seek to improve racial equity through cataloging historical documents and artifacts for a digital archive that will educate students, researchers, and the community at large. And basically the idea is you can't ever achieve racial equity if we don't know our history, if we don't know where we're coming from. So that's the goal of this grant. Um, I believe we have Kareen Chacon on the line, as well as Dr. Ana Perez and Judge Patricia uh, Macias. Uh, so far, I think we only have uh, Ana Perez on the line. Oh, okay. Dr. Perez, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate your, your time uh, and, thank and you having you here. Good Welcome. afternoon, Judge and Commissioners. Uh, I was Welcome. hoping that, yes, that Ms. Chacon would speak first. I simply, <laughs> as a member of the Isleta del Sur Pueblo, uh, want to represent uh, the Pueblo and our governor, uh, Michael Silvas. And I, everybody that knows me knows I'm very brief. So I'm simply going to uh, state a few of his words that with our rich history and contrib contributions, we are interested in being a part of the collaboration for Racial Equity Learning Innovation Center, where students, scholars, citizens and tourists can learn about the, str the struggles and achievements of the many communities that are woven into El Paso's rich cultural identity. We support the RELIC proposal and that's on behalf, like I said, of the governor of the Isleta del Sur Pueblo. So thank you. And we do hope that thank you can you, also support. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, back to you. Yes, Judge. Um, I think we lost maybe the, our other two speakers. I'm not sure, Miguel, if you see them on the line. Yes, I was looking for also the judge. I don't. I did not see Judge either. Macias. Uh, Commissioner, I'm, I am on the line. This okay, is Patricia there. Macias. Thank oh, you, Judge. Uh, thank you, Judge. Thank you. Welcome. But and, go ahead. Thank you, and, and, and good afternoon, Judge and Commissioners, and I'm very pleased to address you in support of this grant opportunity. Um, I'm Patricia Macias, and my mother was a founder of the San Elisario Genealogy and Historical Society over 30 years ago. She, along with other descendants of San Eli settlers, believed it was important that we know and appreciate our genealogy, as well as the importance of educating others about the cultural history of San Eli. By way of example, my, mother, my maternal grandmother's genealogy in San Elisario is traced to a 1774 baptismal record for Casimiro Loya, I recently discovered that he may have been born in Louisiana in 1770 to parents who were from Nova Scotia. His father was Antoine Loya, who subsequently settled and later died in San Emi. The ability to trace family history through accessible electronic records and artifacts and stories creates a sense of place and well-being that binds us as a community, whether that history corresponds to indigenous families or of centuries of past migration and settlement or migration in the recent past. All are equally important to our heritage. The Kellogg Grant will provide the needed resources for all El Paso County families to realize their place in our community's history. We're grateful to Commissioner Ogin for her leadership and sponsorship of this agenda item and judge and commissioners, I encourage you to vote in support of this grant application. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Really appreciate your time and, and, and what we just learned tremendously. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. 
Um, and Miguel, were you able to see if Corrine Chacon was able to dial in? I do not see them on here. Okay. Well, um, I'm happy to answer any questions um, that any of the commissioners may have on the grant application. It's actually due on the 25th, so I believe Erica and Isabel are doing the last minute kind of tweaking um, to the application. Well, that's excellent. Uh, uh, and, and you know, talk about serendipity, when we were, we got to meet Dr. Carrasco, and uh, when we we're working on this uh, healing month, a month before August the 3rd, uh, we found out that the Mellon Foundation also, the, the things that you're doing, that they have quite a bit, $250 million available for any education or history that allows us to, to you know, that we show, you know, who we are, uh, you know, work on anything having to do with racial differences. Uh, so I don't know, maybe that could be another opportunity uh, to look at that because it, it really is interested in today's world uh, that we do something about racial differences and hatred and anything like that. And I know you guys are going to be working on that. So maybe it sort of dovetails into, uh, and, and I'll put you in contact with Dr. Carrasco, who knows about, he's, uh, he's with the, uh, he's at the Harvard uh, School of Divinity. And uh, so there might be some touch points in what you're doing and, and some of the things you're already doing might be uh, able to move into that Mellon uh, grant. So I'm, I'm hoping that I could get you guys together on that. That would be wonderful, Judge, thank you. You're very welcome. So I, I move to approve. I'll second. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Leon. Uh, good job, Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Stout. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Perez and, and, and Karin, and great job, great job. Mm -hmm. Aye. Commissioner Robinson. Hello, Dr. Perez, and I vote aye. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Commissioner. The, the names that you told me that were uh, Dr. You know Os Os Oscar and and uh, Ms. Limon and uh, Ana Perez and my goodness, we, you had quite a list of incredible individuals. <laughs> yes, we definitely could not have done it without them. They are oh, such goodness. experts in this area, um, and all of them contributed. We've been meeting um, several times a week um, since mid-January when Karine Chacon first um, identified this as a potential grant opportunity for the county, and they've all been extremely dedicated and put in so much hard work. I'm, I'm very, very proud of, of, of the final product. And of course, we couldn't have done it without our own county staff. So I want to make sure that they understand just how important they have been to this process. Oh, that's, that's excellent. That's excellent. And you do recognize them as well. So thank you, Commission. Okay, Cesar, back to you. And, and then good afternoon to Dr. Perez. Have a great afternoon. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Judge, would you like to finish off the remaining items in the grant applications? Uh, we do have a couple uh, couple of people that go, if you're okay with that. Yeah, let's, let's, let's go through the grants. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Yes, sir. Item number 16, approve and authorize the county judge to sign the West Texas HIDA Prosecution Initiative grant application for the district attorney's office in the amount of $727,295 from the Office of National Drug Control Policy from January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2022. No county matches required. Contract number 2021-0074. Good afternoon, uh, Your Honor and uh, commissioners. Thank you very much. It's Travis Kirkenau the executive director of the HIDA program. Uh, this is our 26th year that we've uh, uh, asked the uh, commissioner's court to uh, to be the uh, physical uh, uh, 
office for the uh, the HIDA program. We brought in about $130 million into the community to fight the drugs uh, trafficking through our area. As uh, I'm sure all of you are aware, the, uh, the overdose issue uh, throughout the United States has reached an, an all-time high, and a lot of those drugs come through our area. So drug law enforcement is more important than it's ever been in history. And uh, we have uh, all of the agencies involved in the program. And uh, Commissioner Leon used to be the chairman of our board, and uh, he understands exactly how we operate and, and uh, what we do. We bring, uh, we bring federal funds to the area to offset local costs for the police departments and sheriff's department to participate with the federal agencies to, uh, to combat the trafficking of drugs. And uh, we like to say that uh, law enforcement is the first line of prevention uh, because we believe that if you don't ever uh, get your hands on heroin, you'll never overdose on heroin. So uh, we're asking again uh, for the uh, uh, County of El Paso to be our, our physical agent and uh, to approve this grant. This particular grant uh, and, and the one next to it uh, are uh, for the upcoming year. The uh, district attorney's office has been great uh, in picking up the cases that the federal government could not handle and that have more of a local impact. So what we do with this funds is we fund a prosecution initiative that is uh, run completely by the district attorney's office. And they have been extremely successful in keeping a lot of people from walking that need to need to learn a lesson. And uh, I don't know whether it'd be appropriate for me to go ahead and talk about uh, 17 or if you want me to wait on that. But uh, basically, I'm open to any questions uh, on either one or both of the uh, of the uh, proposals. I'd like to, uh, Commissioner Leon, any comments? I know you're very involved in in what we've just heard. Uh, any comments on the program? Oh, hello, Travis. And, and Mr. Kendall is uh, exactly right. Uh, the amount of drugs that can come in into this, this area and the rest of the U.S. is, uh, it's very dangerous. Now with the introduction of fentanyl, which is so dangerous on top of everything else. Uh, that's why you're seeing, I think, uh, many, many of these overdoses that are resulting in death because it takes just a minute amount of fentanyl to, to stop your heart. So, uh, no, this is a fight we can't stop fighting. And mm -hmm. uh, in saying all that, I, I make a motion to approve. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Leon. Aye. Commissioner Stout. Aye. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Item number 17, approve and authorize the county judge to sign the West Texas HIDA Multiple Initiatives Grant Application for the Sheriff's Office in the amount of $4,159,056 from the Office of National Drug Control Policy from January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2022. No county matches required. Contract number 2021-0075. Thank you, Your Honor. Ed. Commissioners, again, this is uh, the uh, same annual uh, budget that we've had in the past. It goes to the, cover the expenses of the Sheriff's Department for their participation in multiple initiatives, multiple task forces that uh, in conjunction with uh, the, the PD, the Police Department, with uh, Texas DPS, DEA, FBI, Homeland Security, many of the other agencies uh, to interdict and investigate drug trafficking. And uh, as Commissioner Leon said, uh, the horrible fentanyl that is wrecking havoc all over the United States. And we've got a resurgence of methamphetamine that is uh, being manufactured in Mexico uh, and with uh, chemicals that are imported to Mexico from China. So that also is another uh, a terrible thing that is happening. Uh, as uh, when Chief Leon and I started in this business many years ago, marijuana was the big thing. Today it's almost, uh, you know, a, a kid's toy, and the big drugs are, are what's killing all of our citizens. There's over 80,000 
people overdosed on fentanyl and heroin and methamphetamine in the United States last year, and that number just continues to grow up. So again, we we thank the uh, the county for being our fiscal agent in the past, and request that you uh, approve this uh, this motion also. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. And we we got to stop the uh, the stories that you hear from parents and and individuals that have lost people because of that is just uh, it's just endless. So we thank you for for these uh, two initiatives. So uh, I'll let the commissioner make the motion. Uh, thank you, Travis. Uh, move to approve. Thank you. Second. Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Leon. And it also has the phrase that pays, uh, no county match. I. <laughs> That's the key word. <laughs> Commissioner Stout. Aye. Commissioner Robinson. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. There you go. Aye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Your Honor, this, uh, one more thing before I go, if you if if you can indulge Absolutely. me just for a second. Uh, Absolutely. I want to thank the commissioner's court, and I want to thank the uh, the county auditors, the purchasing department, the communications, and the the uh, county attorney's office for all of the help that they've given us over the years with the HIDA program and bringing in the, the funds and the, and the whole program has been extremely uh, successful. This is our 26th year that we've been in business. And then the county, the commissioners, the judges throughout those 20 some odd years have just been fantastic. And I, I hope we can continue that relationship for many years to come. Thank you very much. Well, Travis, thank you. Cause that's, I think sometimes we forget all the different components that have to play a part into this to create a success. And, and I think we forget to recognize uh, these individuals and departments. So I, I wanna thank you for bringing that up. So, and, and thank you for everything that you do, Travis. Uh, we really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, you have a good afternoon. Thank you, thank Caesar. You, Yes, sir. Item number 18. Approve and authorize the Planning and Development Department, Planning and Development Department Transportation Division to apply for the Texas Department of Transportation 2021 Transportation Alternatives Call for Projects Preliminary Application for the Paseo del Norte Share Use Path in the amount of $5,987,581.60. A county match in the amount of $1,496,895.40 is required and will be met through transportation development credits and or county funding. The grant period will be determined at a later date, if awarded. Contract number 2021-0128. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Judge and Commissioner. Sal Lonzo with the Planning and Development Department. Uh, this item is authorizing the submission of a preliminary application to TxDOT's transportation alternative uh, call of projects. The funds are limited to areas outside the urbanized area in the county and is limited to the Fabens and Tornillo communities. Uh, the proposed project is designed and the construction of a, of a 12 foot share use path connecting both communities along the irrigation canal uh, system and uh, portions of Alameda as identified in the Parcel de, Nor uh, de Norte Health Foundation. It is a 68 mile county line to county line trail system. Uh, if the preliminary application is approved by TxDOT, uh, staff will be working on submitting the full application from that point. Uh, the match may be reduced given the county's eligibility uh, to use uh, transportation development credits uh, as well as uh, given the county's economic disadvantage status. Uh, we are asking for the court's favorable consideration, and I am uh, available to answer any questions the court may have. Thank you, commissioners. Any questions, comments? Hearing none, I make a motion to approve. Second. 
Commissioner Olguin? Aye. Commissioner Leon? Aye. Commissioner Stout? Aye. Commissioner Robinson? Aye. Judge Samaniego? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sal. Be careful out there. Thank you for all you do. Item number 12, Auditor. Pursuant to the Texas Local Government Code Section 114.023, 114.024, 114.025, 114.026, 114.027, 114.028, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114.029, 114
Uh, and even during the COVID-19, uh, we've been experiencing positive growth, but we remain cautiously optimistic, uh, and hopefully the trend will continue, but only time will tell. El Paso's location and its border trade uh, and commerce seems to be keeping the local economy resilient. Sales tax, while at the same time, uh, we have um, low mortgage interest rates, which are fueling property sales. So we have new properties uh, uh, com coming onto the tax rolls. And it, and it happened in, in 20 and it's happening again in 21, it appears. And so why are we faring better than some other entities in Texas? Uh, El Paso property uh, valuations are not tied to oil and gas like many other governments in Texas. And this logic applies also to the sales tax uh, in El Paso. And of, of late, you know, during the pandemic, uh, the experience with sales tax is has been growing uh, higher than it ever has. And actually, it seems like right now we're the leader in the state for growth in our sales tax. Uh, this basically is unheard of in the, in the history that I'm aware of, of El Paso County. And the fact that the sales and use tax payments actually uh, received in the month of February hit an all-time new high. We hit $6 million in, in a one-month payment, which... I went back to the records and we have never ever received a six million dollar payment of sales tax in one one month so it, it's it's looking good but we don't want to get too overly optimistic it's the first time ever we're experiencing aberrations in both directions and we didn't anticipate it nor could we have realistically anticipated it or estimated it in, in any event revenue aberrations have thus far remained more positive than negative and thus far you know it's like I said, the future is to be seen. Uh, I'm going to be projecting through the end of the fiscal year. We're going to look at it month by month, and uh, we'll be watching how those variances net and what the bottom line looks like. And for 2022 also, uh, that's going to be a challenge. So the emphasis, especially you know, if everything stays positive, it's going to be on the non-tax revenues. Um, that's where the majority of, of the COVID-19 related impacts are, are, are affecting our, our revenues. Um, Although I'm not just uh, uh, focusing on revenues, I have to say that uh, this news is favorable, but and it's encouraging. Um, but I have to reiterate, like I said some time back, you know, we have to be also looking at the growth and the expenditures going forward. Um, and I know I know the county's taken a hold the line uh, on the budget and to minimize expenses, and that's something that we're going to be working on on a month-to-month -month basis. I'll be working and collaborating with budget and fiscal policy because um, in order for us to project for the end of the year and for the next fiscal year, we realistically need to know how much we're gonna spend and so how much we're gonna have. Uh, so like I said, I'm not trying to bust anybody's bubble to say that you know revenues are, are, are looking good uh, on major revenues and we're looking good overall, but it's still, there's a lot to be considered before we get to the end of the fiscal year and what we do between now and then. Um, and with that, I'll just focus on a couple of the areas of, of the revenues that, that dropped, like charges for services. Um, the tax assessor collector uh, saw a decrease of 209,000 or 25.69%. Um, and in, in charge of the services, you had Coliseum Rental. You had a 99.73% or $182,000 because businesses are just, you know, cl closed. They're not bringing things to the Coliseum. Obviously, it's, it's not open. Uh, interest revenue uh, down by $556,000. Federal Reserve, you know, dropped, uh, dropped the rate. And so... People don't know where to invest their money, so ours is in a depository making the highest interest rate we can make. Fines decreased by 427000 On miscellaneous revenue, the overall decrease was about 395000 mainly due to COVID, uh, and it's specifically tied to the decrease in sports park revenue of $402,000. And with that, I'll move on to the next slide. The uh, general fund revenues by source, this is a budget actual comparison and it just really just shows you that uh, we've how much we've collected uh, compared to the budget because right now in January we're 33.33 percent through the fiscal year, and so far the general fund has collected 62.68 percent of the of budgeted revenues. Uh, the analysis excludes 62.4 million uh, that's been designated to balance the budget in uh, fiscal year 2021. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a depiction of overall revenues as, as a pie. And as you can see, uh, taxes um, are the majority of, of the revenues that are coming in. And so far year to date, 170,000 or 92.29%.
And like you say, uh, taxes comprise 94.61% of total taxes in Avalorm um, being 90, 90, 92.29. So taxes were 94 and of that 92.29 was for Avalorm from our Avalorm taxes. Next slide, please. Um, this is uh, charges for services. Um, you can see that the, the largest component of charges for services was the sheriff, uh, comprised 60.3% of the amount collected, uh, followed by uh, county clerk, 16.08%. Next slide, please. Um, this is revenues of fines and forfeits. You, know, you can see that the fine forfeits was about 810,000 or 0.41% of total revenues collected uh, year to date. Um, JPs represented 59.13% of that and Council of Judges was 28.35%. Next slide, please. Intergovernmental totaled about 1.2 million or 0.63%. Uh, of that, county attorney collected 33.7% of it. Sheriff was 27.64% and general government uh, non-department was about 20.33%. Next slide, please. Um, this is the three-year budget actual revenue comparison, just to give you uh, a historical perspective of as to the collections on major revenues. Um, you can see that uh, all revenues uh, over the last three years are pretty much on track. Uh, we don't see any major deviations uh, as far as collections coming in. Um, we do see on the property taxes in 19, it was 79%, uh, then 84 and 20, uh, and then it's gone down just a tad in, in 2021. We're still cautiously monitoring that just to make sure because even though property assessments went up, valuations went up, our revenues went up, but just to make sure that we're not going to see a, a COVID-related impact because our revenues are collected between December and February for property taxes. So once all that uh, has been collected as it typically has, then we'll find out if, if there truly is uh, a hit at the tail end of collection on, the, on those revenues. And then sales tax uh, is, is 25, 27, and then 28. Next slide, please. Okay, getting into the expenditures. Just a summary of expenditures by fund type shows that the total of all funds was 37.6 million and the year to date was 134 of which the general fund was 25.3 for the month uh, through, uh, month of January and year to date through January was 94 million next slide please okay this is a graphic depiction of uh, of expenditures by type year to date and and you can see salaries and fringe make up the major component uh, followed by, and including fringe benefits, but we treat it separately. And then operating expenses up slightly and then capital, capital at least. Now on personnel and benefits combined, it was 76 million or 80.29% of total expenses. Uh, and that was an increase of 3.7 million uh, compared to 2020. The operating expenses were 16.9 million or 17.9% of total expenses. And the year-to-date increase was 1.8 1.8 million uh, compared to the same time in 20. I think we're off on the slide. I'm sorry. I guess on, I'm on the uh, yeah the the bar expenses here, here today. I can go back Thank over you. that one. Uh, yeah, personnel uh, and and salary benefits 76 million um, or 80.29 percent of total expenses as, as an increase. Uh, it was a 3.7 million. And operating expenses were up by 16.9 million or 17.90 um, of total expenses. And uh, the, the the most uh, most major increase under the operating, um, 2.2 million of that was uh, for the faster program, which was uh, a, re a recent approval. Um, with that, next slide. This is just a comparison of 2020 versus 2021. Um, and it shows the percentage uh, of year-to-date expenses were just slightly higher, 25.37 uh, versus 24.75 percent, and then also the remaining budget is slightly smaller due to the increased expenditure. Next slide, please. This is expenses by function, and uh, this is uh, shows the revised uh, budget. It shows the period actuals uh, and then year-to-date actuals, and then the percentage 
uh, of the budget that's expended so far. And it shows that the period actuals were 25, year to date was 94, and, and it shows the percentage expenditure right now is, is that 25.37 that we uh, mentioned earlier. Um, I'll just make one note that this, this uh, revised budget excludes 35.2 million that was designated for unforeseen uh, emergencies. And that number is going to change because we've reallocated about $10 million for that assistance for the small businesses due to COVID. Next slide, please. These are uh, the general fund expenditures. It's a comparison year to year. The general fund uh, changes by government functions in comparison to the same period, period in the prior year. Next slide, please. Um, this is the comparison by function. The general government that shows an increase of 2.3 million. Uh, and the main increase was on uh, ITU increased by 1.6. Um, public works under that uh, category, uh, uh, 90, 90 Department of Public of Public Works increased by 905,000. County elections went up by 139,000. Um, and then the general government non-department decreased by 438,000. Administration of justice went up uh, just slightly at 88,000. Public safety increased by 2.4 million. Health and welfare up by 139,000. Uh, resource development increased by 2.3 million. Culture and recreation decreased by 149,000. And public works uh, decreased by about 49,000. Next slide, please. The general fund expenses uh, for fiscal year uh, 21 just shows you the amount expended. Uh, year to date was 94 million or 25.37%. And then the components uh, making up the, uh, the those expenditures. It just breaks them down by the, by those sections uh, graphically as I, I represented uh, on the prior slide. Next slide, please. Um, this is uh, the uh, total expenses uh, year to date broken down by function. This is public safety. Shows that the sheriff's amount uh, was 35.7 million of total public safety expenses or 84.59% uh, of that function followed by juvenile probation at 4.3 million or 10.25 percent and then constables uh, at 1.2 million or 2.98 percent and then the other departments was about 920,000 that represents four departments next slide please general government uh, totaled 22.57 million or 24 uh, percent comprised of itd that was 5.6 million or 25 percent then uh, general government non-department uh, 1.5 million or 10.7 percent uh, the county auditor at 4.6 million or 47.46 percent and then district clerk at one and a half million or 8.88 percent and the small uh, the other departments represented 20 uh, other departments next slide please administration of justice uh, total 22.4 million or 23.9 percent Included the district attorney, which comprised 5.8 million of that number, or 25.9%, followed by county attorney at 3.3 million, or 14.87%, uh, public defender at 2.6 million, district courts at 2.5 million, and then other departments at 8 million, which contained 35 departments. And then we have other, next slide, other functions. Other functions were 6.9 million, uh, a 7. 38% included economic development of 2.4 million, medical examiner um, as, as 80, 888,000. And then we have Ascada de Park at 790,000 and then golf course at 600,000. And then all other departments at 2.4 million, 2.24 million or 16 departments contained in that, that category. Okay, fund balance. Next slide, please. Okay, this is, uh, this is the graph I show you every month. Um, right now, the CAFR is in progress for auditing FY 2020. Um, I have collaborated with budget and fiscal policy. Uh, we're not aware of any major significant expenses that we have not captured that are pending and outstanding. So the fund balance at this point has gone up to about $95 million for FY 2020. Now, going forward, um, I'm collaborating with budget and fiscal policy. My, my concern has always been that the budget grew quite a bit in 2020. 
Um, there was a lot left on the table that didn't get expended and a lot of it carried forward. There was an increase in the 21 budget. And like I say, I, I said it earlier in my discussion, uh, the county it, is serious. We're, we're under COVID. We want to make sure that uh, we don't miss the boat and, and have, have an issue. We're going to hold the line on expenses, hold the line on major projects, make sure we pay them out of the right category. So we're, I'm projecting about $83 million as of September 30. Uh, that's going to be refined over the next few months as I do my revenue projections, which are in progress. And especially when we, we collaborate on what's in the budget and what's not going to be expended. Uh, and as soon as I can validate on a month to month basis and refine that, that that's going to really tweak that fund balance where we can all be on the same page. Like I say, uh, we don't have a crystal ball and we're not sure exactly where we're going to end up. But I think we we're really in control by controlling the expenses and knowing that revenues are declining, but we have some positive sides on it um, that we can still end up in good shape. So the 83 right now is is to me a conservative number of where we're going to end up and it's all all contingent on how much we actually spend down on on the, on the current general fund budget so with that next slide if anybody has any questions great job ed uh, i was going to ask you. Edward, if uh is is wally i'm sorry is, is wally on the call yes sir yes sir well, you know, when you present, I ask uh, Ed to give comments to have that checks and balance. So I was wondering if you have any additional comments, Wally, on on uh, Dion's presentation, on Ed Dion's presentation. So, Judge, on the on the presentation he makes uh, and and some of the difference you see over mine, I'm looking more at what it takes to manage that growth into the future and looking at the sustainable revenue sources we've had in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly, I do um, agree with him that the uncertainties created by COVID-19 are the biggest challenge um, yes. and, and managing our budget into the future, you know, to try and still meet our strategic needs, but also manage and, and with the long-term goal of aligning those revenues and expenses is absolutely a priority of the county. And uh, so I'm in agreement with some of his comments, but also um, looking at what we've accomplished historically and then managing that into the future is, is of, of, of utmost importance if we're going to align those over the long run. Yeah, yeah. and, and the, the one, one of my goals is, uh, Wally, you've talked about it. We need that five-year strategic plan. We need that five-year ongoing budget, revenues, expenses, and, and I'm committed to, committed to us doing that because that is going to really get – our projected fund balance graph that we keep I keep bringing on a monthly basis to where it's more stable because we have a commitment on both sides as to here's what we've agreed to and until we have any major deviations we'll at least have a stable look into the future okay so mm -hmm. yes sir and and with the budget kickoff we did last week judge and the message delivered by your county administrator Ms. Keller and the oversight that we gave both from human resources and budget was looking and doing that needs assessment into the next five years. So there's a little more predictability over the upcoming. Of course, we appropriate our budget on a year to year basis, uh, but knowing what the five year outlook uh, is and the needs assessment certainly helps uh, Mr. Dion uh, get a little more insight as to what the future holds. You know, we, we always have so much uncertainty and that makes it so difficult. But uh, with a COVID factor and everything else, well, the uncertainty is is so difficult, but so I thank both of you to try to figure out within those constraints. We have a little bit of history. I mean, it's uh, not a lot. We have one year and we've seen what's happened and the things that we were challenged with and the things that might happen. And I think we have a little bit of understanding and, and that's always important that you include, you know, what, what are some of the um, challenges that we're gonna have uh, and you can't do much about that if you don't understand it, which happened to us uh, last year was, you know, early March that we started getting this uh, challenge with COVID uh, and then trying to figure out how to move forward was really difficult. So I'm, I'm hoping that as we begin to understand what our challenges are and, and what are the things that we've accomplished and, and, and some of the things that really, you know, took a toll on us, uh, we will do much better on that budget. Yes, sir. So thank you very much. Um, 
Yeah, I really appreciate uh, any questions or anything from commissioners. If not, uh, thank you. We just need a motion to accept. Yes. Motion, motion to accept. To accept. I thank you. Thank Second. You. Sir. Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Leon. Aye. Commissioner Stout. Aye. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Take care. You. Stay safe. Okay. You'll be safe. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Item number 13, Public Works. Approve and authorize the county judge to sign the First Amendment to the Interlocal Agreement for procurement and placement of bus shelters for El Paso County Transit with the Camino Real Regional Mobility Authority. Funding is available in CIP 21, Public Works Administration Improvement ADA, contract number 2021-0083. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Judge. <laughs> Sorry. Good afternoon, uh, Judge Thanks. Commissioner Sal Alonzo with the uh, Planning and Development Department. Uh, this item before you is a contract amendment to our existing uh, interlocal agreement with the uh, CRRMA uh, or the Camino Real Mobility. Uh, the amendment is to allow us to add the uh, fiscal 2021 CIP applications of uh, uh, 500,000 uh, onto the existing master agreement with the CRRMA. Uh, for the ultimate uh, design and the construction of the bus shelters throughout the county transit service. Um, we are asking for the court's favorable consideration and I am available to answer any questions the court may have. Thank you, long awaited, good, great initiative. So thank you, uh, move to approve. Thank you. Second. Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Leon. Aye. Commissioner Stout. All right. Commissioner Robinson. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Sal. Appreciate it. Thank you. Item number 14, approve and authorize the county judge to sign the contract addendum with PC Automated Controls Incorporated for the replacement of two chillers at the downtown detention facility in the amount of $226,476.40. Funds are available in CIP 20, Public Works, uh, Sheriff's Office, Detention, Maintenance, Renovations, and Repairs. Contract number 2020-1115. Good afternoon, Judge. Good afternoon, County Commissioners. Robin Sully, Facility Maintenance Director. The downtown detention yep. facility has a total of four chillers to sustain the heating and cooling of the buildings. The current chillers are over 20 years old and have surprised surpass their life cycle and parts are hard to find. The project, uh, this is the phase one of uh, four projects to replace the chillers uh, at the amount of $226,476.40. We are asking for your approval to work with the contractors to replace two of these chillers. Subject to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Sully. Uh, move to approve. Second. Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Leon. Aye. Commissioner Stout. Aye. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Sully, thank you for all you do behind the scenes during this COVID situation really appreciate uh, 
every effort that you make. Thank you. It, it goes on. It doesn't go unnoticed. I, I can tell you, but thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Item number 19, budget and finance. Approve an authorized reallocation of capital funds. Good evening, Judge Commissioners. Wally Hargrove from the Office of Budget and Fiscal Policy. This is your quarterly uh, review and sweep of capital funds that are available for reallocation. Majority of the funds today will be swept to an available account for future consideration. About $27,000 of a reallocation uh, in today's amendment will also allow us to complete the improvements at the Escarate toll booth at Escarate Park. With that, I'm available for any questions and would ask for your favorable consideration. Thank you, Wally. Move to approve. Judge, I've got a quick question. Oh, okay. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Leon. Well, and, and you, you, you touched on the, the, the toll booth at 27000 I, I think, is the amount. Are we going to redo it or is it going to be replaced or moved? There are some additional um, needs there with that project for um, accommodating the, the uh, touch-free and the uh, debit card system. And that will wrap that up and, and allow us to take payments uh, with the uh, little remote machinery. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank yes, sir. You. Okay. Is there a second to the motion? Oh, second. Sorry. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Olguin. Aye. Commissioner Leon. Aye. Commissioner Stout. Aye. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. Judge Samaniego. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. Commissioner's court will now recess into executive session to discuss items 21A, 21C, 21E and 21F, pursuant to Texas Government Code Section 551.072 and 551.071 and 551.087. Commissioner's court will reconvene to take official action. Caesar, let's take. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business. But we also keep true to our southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities. The region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities. The region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities. The region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities the region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The county of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities the region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The county of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce, with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities. The region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities the region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The county of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large U.S. cities. The region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the U.S.-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
El Paso goes by many names. Sun City, 915. We are known for history, culture, food, and art. In the early 1900s, development and commerce in El Paso revolved around mining and trade. The nationally recognized mission trails are just one example of the many historic sites that portray our region's rich indigenous and colonial history. Since then, El Paso has evolved and so has its people. We take great pride in nourishing a skilled and capable workforce with 72% of our population being bilingual. We stay competitive among other large US cities the region's border location boasts a major trade port. It allows competitive local manufacturers to produce at maximum capacity. Fleet systems are capable of worldwide distribution of parts and products. Our state-of-the-art higher education systems are nationally recognized. The Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, El Paso, the nation's first comprehensive health sciences institution on the US-Mexico border, provides students the opportunities to become doctors, nurses, and researchers. The University of Texas at El Paso offers 74 bachelors, 74 masters, and 22 doctoral programs. Local government agencies and other economic development organizations help industries become established and expand in our community. The County of El Paso is great for business, but we also keep true to our Southern hospitality with plenty of outdoor recreation options. It's easy to keep active in El Paso. We are constantly looking for new industries interested in expansion. We want to offer our help and support in the process. No matter the name, El Paso is proud, strong, progressive. We are El Paso. Come see what we can do together.
Go ahead. Commissioner's Court has reconvened into regular open session. Item number 24, discuss and take appropriate action regarding the El Paso County Federal Nomination Package for the Downtown Historic District. There's no action for this item. No action for item number 24. And that completes all of the items on our agenda today, Judge. Oh, well, thank you, Caesar. Thank you, all your staff and everyone else and commissioners. Uh, long meeting, but uh, my goodness, a lot of things were covered, and, and I think we're, you know, a great way to start this week and get ready for March. So uh, thank you for everything you do at each one of your precincts, uh, Betsy and your team and everyone else, uh, Miguel and Alexis. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. So uh, have a good evening, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank good you. Night. Thank you. Have a good evening. Be safe. Thank you. This concludes today's meeting at 7.47 p.m.